But hello and welcome to Harkin Homes OTR. What? Where are you going? Hello and welcome to Harkin Homes OTR Visual Radio. I'm Mr. H. The back. Oh, Where's the bad guy? To the top. At the top? Whoa. Well, hello and welcome to Harkin Homes OTR Visual Radio. I'm Mr. H. I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight's compilation is Tales of the Texas Rangers, Volume 3. This classic old-time radio crime procedural aired on NBC from 1950 until 1952. Joel McRae starred as Texas Ranger Jace Pearson. He and his faithful horse, Charky, would track down the villains. And Pearson would also use the latest in scientific technology to solve the case. The show was produced by Stacy Keach Sr., father of TV's Mike Hammer, the supporting cast is many names you're familiar with, like Parley Bear, Wilms Herbert, All Freeze, and many others. Personally, this is one of my favorite shows, and so I'm very excited to share it with you this evening. With great acting, great writing, great production values, we're sure to be in for an enjoyable evening. Now, just before we get into the show, do you want to take a minute to tell you about a couple ways you can help support the channel? First up, we've got the Johnny Dollar Club. Starting at just a dollar a month, you can help keep these great shows coming. You've got three ways to join. Coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com, and patreon.com. The links for those are in the description below. And many of you have asked about using PayPal. So if you prefer PayPal, the first option, coffee.com, is a great one for you. And the second way you can help support the channel and get a little something for yourself is to check out our Hearth and Home Shop on Etsy. We've got a great assortment of old-time radio-related merchandise, including the Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Collection. We've got the Old-Time Radio Detective Mug Series. And our newest collection, starting right now, is, is the Harold Apple Knocker Collection. The link for the Etsy shop is in the description below. Head on over and check that out. So now, without any further ado, time to sit back, relax, and enjoy Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. And as always, thanks for tuning in. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, The Trap. It is 1.10 a.m., May 17th, 1948. The highway across a barren and thinly populated portion of West Texas is deserted, except for a truck and trailer pushing steadily westward toward El Paso. Oh. Oh. Boy, that nap felt good. You sure were snoring. I could barely hear the motor. How long was I asleep? Since 8 o'clock last night. Almost 1 a.m. now. <laughs> How are you doing? Man? We'll be in El Paso by 6. We're right on schedule. You want me to take the wheel? No. No, wait till we gas up at Frito Junction. It's only another 50 miles. Okay. Yeah, I sure will be glad to get home and see my wife. <laughs> you called a long distance when we stopped for supper. Yeah. But I'm not an old-timer like you. This is our first baby we're expecting. You already got four. Ah, don't let me kid you, Sam. You feel the same way about all of them, no matter how many you have. What are you hoping for? Oh, just a healthy kid, I guess. That's all. Although, I I'd kind of like a little girl. If you get one, you'll have a real picnic. Girls are born smarter than we are. My youngest one. She can work me over for anything she wants faster than a quarter horse can get moving. <laughs> you don't look like you're feeling any pain from it, Grover. <laughs> I ain't. I ain't. It's a big kick, getting them things they want. Yeah, but don't get me wrong. I'm just as fond of the three boys, too. Yeah. But, well, a girl does get under your skin a little more. They are more affectionate, like. Boy grows up and you want to kiss him. <laughs> he kicks up his heels. 
They get to be eight, nine years old. The closest you get to them is shaking hands. You know what I mean? Sure, sure, do. <laughs> I guess we were the same with our folks. I wouldn't trade them for anything, though, boys or girls. And they're your own blood, you... Well, you'll find out, Sims. You got a lot of fun and living ahead of you. They'll worry you when they get sick, and they'll break your heart when they get kid troubles that you can't help them with, but... Nothing you'll ever have will mean as much to you as your young'uns. <laughs> I've been worrying about mine already, and she... He? <laughs> well, whatever it is, ain't even <laughs> here yet. I keep wondering if I'll be able to make it. You know, bring them up, educate them, help them to be somebody. Yeah, that's something else you'll worry about with each new one. Man, I'm so scared now, I think I'll just settle for one kid and leave it at that. <laughs> that's what I said 12 years ago when I first, but you'll change your mind. Yeah, I guess so. Mary said that she yeah, wanted... Hey, hey. Huh? What's that ahead? Where? Oh, somebody waving a red lantern. We must be coming to that narrow bridge over Lannan's Creek. You suppose it's been washed out again by a flash flood? Yeah, it could be, although it don't look like there's been any rain here since we started the haul east four days ago. Just the same, they got it blocked. Yeah. Look, Grover, they put up a detour sign. Yeah, it probably wants us to go the left end of the old road. No, sign points to the right, and the fellow with the lantern is waving us that way. Yeah, I... I guess he knows what he's doing. Don't look like much of a road this way, does it? Oh, it's going to be mighty rough going. I hope this don't last too long. Hey, this ain't even a road. Oh, it's just a little dead-end turnoff. That guy must have been crazy sending us in here. Backing this rig out is sure going to be a job. Ah, what a dumb trick. I'm going to walk back and ask him what in the name of blazes made him turn us off this way. I'll come with you. You'd think they'd have a highway patrol car station there to... Wait a minute. What's the matter? Look by the road. The guy with the lamp is moving that detour sign. Get back in the truck, quick. What is it, Grover? What's wrong? It's like a hijack. Get it rolling backwards and don't mind what you hit. Just keep... Grover! Grover! Hey, don't shoot anymore! Don't shoot! He's hurt! You can take him! I... I said you could take everything! You didn't have... Mary... At 9 p.m. the following night, the bodies of Warren Grover and Luther Sims were discovered, and the sheriff notified. He called for help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Here are the bodies, Jace. Must have been dragged into the brush when the truck was stolen. Lucky thing Mr. Archer here found them. Mighty lucky. Could have been here for days. How'd you happen to come across them, Mr. Archer? Well, it weren't me. One of my kids found them. We uh, pulled off the highway fixing to make camp for the night. Boy was gathering wood for the fire. Then out of yelp and come legging out of here like a scared jackrabbit. You make a habit of camping out at night with your family? Ain't nothing much a man can do about it when he ain't working. Them motels and places cost money. Where do you come from? I park in Sawway. We're heading for California. Migratory workers, huh? Mm. You can talk to his family later if you want, Jace. I let Archer pull his car into a clearing up the highway about 200 yards the other side of the bridge. I didn't want to keep the kids around here. Eh, if you ain't got nothing else to ask me, I'd like to get back to my wife, plumb shaky. All right, go ahead. But when you get to the car, stay put. I ain't got no place better to go. Thank you. You got a flashlight, Jace? Mine's about to peter out. Yeah. There, you can give your batteries a rest. You say they were due in El Paso at 6 this morning, huh? Eh? Yep, was on schedule, too, until they got here, I reckon. Made their supper stop on time last night. The company checked back. When'd you get the request to look for the truck? Got the description and license number early this afternoon when they was overdue and nobody had heard from them. The company figured if they'd had a breakdown, they'd have called in. According to their schedule, they should have reached this spot a little after midnight last night. And whoever took that truck had plenty of time to get a long ways from here with it before sunup. Not much chance of anybody spotting them. That's right. We'd better take a look around. I've been all over the ground between here and the highway, but I guess it won't hurt to look again. Condition my light was in, I might have missed something. I can show you where they were when they dropped. Blood stains on the ground out here. Yeah, I saw them. Right where the truck was. 
Stains aren't far from the tire marks. They're funny tires, Jace. Different pattern right smack down the center of them. Well, no, those inside tracks were made by Archer's car when he drove in. Covered part of the truck marks. The way this place is rutted, he'd fall right into the same track. Hm. I didn't think of that. Ah, here's something. What is it? Cartridge shell. Look at it. Forty-five caliber army automatic. Oh, and here's another one. Well, we won't have to wait for an autopsy to tell us what the murder weapon was. Hey, I just thought of something. What? That forty-five army automatic. There's an army camp about 40 miles further on, j- just 10 miles this side of Frito Junction. I'm afraid that won't help us, Sheriff. Number marking on these shells is a 17. That's the old 1917 ammunition series, World War I. No camp would be using ammo that old. Mm, too bad. I thought for a minute we might have a fast lead. You arranged to have the bodies moved? Yep, sent my deputy to town for an undertaker. Good. Let's walk out to Archer's car, talk to his wife and kids. There's one thing I don't understand, Jace. Why did they pull their truck off the road? A trucker riding alone might do it to grab some sleep, but not a scheduled rig with two drivers. I can't figure that either. Archer's car's up this way, other side of the bridge. Might as well leave your car right where it is, not much of a walk. Sure. Hold it, Sheriff. What is it? This mark just off the road shoulder here. Hmm. Sort of a circle in the dirt. Yeah. Whatever made the circle was wet and kind of oily. What do you suppose made it? What would make an oily, round impression that size? Oh, I don't know. Unless maybe it was a lantern. That's what it was, all right. And here's something else. Four small rectangular marks in the earth. Base of each mark, about two by four. Well, I can't figure that. Unless somebody had a table out here. I don't think it was a table. Another thing that would make four mark space like that's a wooden sawhorse. Say, did this bridge ever wash out? Sometimes, when there's a flash flood. Hey, I see what you're aiming at. When there is a flood, highway patrol sets up a detour sign. Sends traffic through that road over across the highway. When that happened last? Oh, not in a couple of months. Now, these marks aren't that old. Somebody detoured that truck into the dead-end road on this side. Lantern and sawhorse were set in here until they were moved onto the road to set up a block. They must have had that particular truck pegged then. Came through at a time when there isn't much traffic between the last town to the east and Frito Junction. Come on, let's talk to Archer. You got a list of the cargo the truck was carrying? Told my deputy to wire a request for it after we found the truck had been stolen. It'll come through to my office. Good, because we'll have to track this down through cargo. I got a hunch that the truck has been emptied and ditched by now. Archer didn't know any more than he'd already told us, and his wife and three pale, undernourished kids couldn't add anything. We waited until the bodies were picked up, then headed back for town. The next morning, there was a wire from the trucking company waiting at the sheriff's office, a list of the missing truck's cargo. Here's a report on the cargo, Jace, valued at $39,000. Let's see. A shipment of automobile radios, huh? Well, that's a break. Why? Because they all have serial numbers. It'd be a lot of work if they try and change the numbers, and if they don't, one of the sets will turn up sooner or later. Yeah, but they didn't send the numbers through to us, Jace. Just the set make and model. I'm radioing my headquarters to get them. Come on. Austin can contact the manufacturer and have him send a complete list of the serials through. Then they can distribute the list to all law enforcement agencies on a statewide bulletin. We don't stand much chance of cracking this if we have to wait for a hot car radio to turn up. Don't worry. We're not going to wait. We've got plenty of other things to do. How many deputies you got handy? Three. How about send them back along the highway? We know where Grover and Sims made their supper stop. I'd like to find out if they made any stops after that, before they were killed. Good idea. As a matter of fact, whoever stole the truck may have turned it around and headed back that way. Killers may have been spotted. It's a chance. On the other hand, maybe I ought to send one man toward Frito Junction in El Paso, just in case the truck kept heading west. Never mind. I'll handle that part of it myself. I'm heading for Frito Junction as soon as I can make that radio call. I put through a request for the serial numbers, then headed for Frito Junction. On the way, I got a radio call from KTXA. The missing truck had always made a regular stop at the mobile gas station in Frito Junction. When I got to the station, I sent for the man who'd been on duty the night the truck was hijacked. Yep, I was on duty night before last, Ranger, but Grover and Sims didn't stop here. I know they didn't. They never got this far. What I want to know is, did you see their truck? The station's right at the crossroads. If the truck came through with somebody else driving it, there's a chance you might have seen it. 
Ranger, I'd like to help you, but, well, there ain't much business during the night, even though the boss does keep the place open as an accommodation of truckers. I usually stretch out on a cot in the office. If a truck stops, I get up. If it don't, I just hear it go past. Any other stations around here open at night? Nope. The truck Grover and Sims were driving always stopped here, didn't it? Yep. Company they drove for has a credit account here. They haul between El Paso and Houston. Well, the tanks are always just about dry when they hit here on the return haul from Houston. I see. You mean the truck would be too low on gas to go much further than this without filling up, providing it came this way? That's right. Thanks. That's a big help. You're welcome, Ranger. Wish I could help more. Grover and Sims were pretty nice guys. That's the trouble with a killing. The wrong people usually get killed. And it sounds like you've got an impatient customer out there. Yep, one of the soldiers from Camp Boulder. Boys are busy on the pumps. I might as well help him. Hey, he's got the drive blocked. I'll ask him to back up so that you can get your car and trailer out. It's all right. He doesn't seem to want gas. May want directions to someplace. Hey, you got a shop here? Yeah, but you have to pull around the back. You're blocking the ranger's car. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Just want to make sure you can help me. Doesn't seem to be much wrong with that motor. There isn't anything wrong with it. It's in top shape. Then what do you want to put it in the shop for? Got a new radio. Thought you might be able to install it for me. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, The Trap, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. A soldier with a new car radio. It didn't have to mean anything, but it might. The make and model of the set he had matched what I was looking for. I got the serial number from the carton that came in and phoned it through to the sheriff for a fast check against the manufacturer's list. Then I went into the shop to ask a few questions. You'll have to drill holes for the antenna, I guess. Unless you want to wear it in your hat, I will. <laughs> it's like a good set. Yeah, yeah. pretty expensive. Well, it told me it sells for about 85 bucks. What'd you pay for it? Well, I, uh, I didn't buy it. I made a deal for it, sort of. What kind of a deal? What are you asking me that for, Ranger? Something wrong? I didn't say that. I was just wondering what kind of a deal a fella could get on a car radio. The man you got this from have any others he wanted to get rid of? Well, I, I, I don't think so. He just gave me this for a trade. You know. On what? Something I had that he needed. Uh, look, my pass is only good for a couple hours. I didn't think it would be this long. Maybe I better let it go, and I'll, I'll come back in next time I'm in town. Okay. I think you better stay around. But my pass... Maybe I... I can get you a little extension of time. What's the camp number? I'll call your commanding officer. Well, what do you want to do that for? Yeah, what's the matter, Ranger? What is it? It's that radio. Grover and Sims were hauling a truckload of auto radios when they were hijacked and killed. What? You telling me that radio is stolen? No, I'm not. Not yet. But I'm waiting for a check on the serial number, and you're not leaving here until I get it. Well, look, you got to believe me. That guy gave me that set. Yeah. You've been pretty evasive about telling me why he gave it to I you. I told you it was a trade. For what? Come on, talk up. Well, I... I can't tell you that. Get me in trouble. If this is one of the sets taken from two murdered truck drivers, you'll be in plenty of trouble unless I know where and how you got it. Sounds like you better tell him, soldier. I... Got the set in exchange for some gasoline. Gasoline, huh? All right, go ahead. Well, it was night before last. Just after 2 o'clock, I, I just started guard duty at camp. My post was along the fence by the motor pool from 2 to 4. Hey, Ranger, that's not long after the time you said Grover was... Never mind, Milligan. Go ahead. Well, I... I heard this car stop near the fence. You sure it wasn't a truck? No, no, it was a car. I... So I, I walked over to the fence where it was parked. I, I sort of gave the challenge, you know, asked who it was, and a man walked up, said he needed some gas. And you gave it to him, just like that? No, huh? no, no. He he said he'd pay me for it. I told him it was against regulations. Then he, he said it wasn't for him. He said a couple of women were stranded down the highway in their car. And then he, he said he'd give me a car radio. Oh, well, it seemed like a good deal, so I opened a pump and... Filled some cheap cans for him. How many gallons? Twenty-five. And you didn't think there was anything wrong with a trade like that? An eighty-five dollar radio for twenty-five gallons of gas? Well, the guy was stuck and that... How could he be stuck? He was only ten miles from the station and it's open all night. Well, maybe he didn't know that. He knew it all right. 
But he didn't want to bring a stolen truck into this station, and he didn't want to get that much gas in cans from a place that might be checked. Look, Ranger, please, I, I'm up for discharge in a couple of months. Our camp is being deactivated. I don't want to get in bad. You should have thought of that before you started to ladle out government gasoline. What kind of sidearms do you carry at the camp when you do a guard trick? Uh, regulation Army 45. Any 1917 series ammo? None that I ever saw. Are you going to give me a break? I'm not a judge. I can't give breaks. You're the only key I've got to two dead men. I'll call your post and have the MPs pick you up. The gasoline's the Army's business, but this radio is mine if it's stolen property. How could I know it was stolen? Can you describe the man you got it from? No, it was too dark. Besides, besides, there were two men. One of them stayed in the car. It'd help your case a lot if you could tell us what they looked like, even what kind of a car they were driving. Well, it was dark, I tell you. They talked to each other, call each other by name? Well, yeah, yeah. The, the fellow I gave the gas to, he called the other one in the car, and he said, drive up closer, will you, sonny boy? Sonny boy? Well, that's not a name. Probably just a wisecracker nickname. I'm just telling you what I heard. I'm trying to do everything I can to help you. Yeah. Just a minute. Ranger's for you, the Sheriff. Thanks. Hello, Sheriff. Howdy, Jase. That soldier's radio is on the stolen list, all right. But I got some one of my deputies dug up. Grover and Sims did make another stop after they had their supper. At 11.30 the night they were killed. Where? Roadside diner. Just stopped for coffee. At least Sims had coffee there. Told the proprietor that Grover was asleep in the cab of the truck. You talked to the proprietor yourself? Sure did. Drove out seam as soon as the deputy gave me the report. It's Watson's Diner. A lot of truckers eat there or stop the coffee up when they're riding late. Watson know if they had a hitchhiker with them? Any rider they might have picked up? He says no, but he didn't go out to the truck, of course. From what he says, Sims was the only one in the place except for some traveling salesman who was playing the pinball machine. A fellow named Sonny Boy Jensen. Sonny Boy? That's right, Jase. What you getting excited about? Talk to Watson again. Find out what he knows about Sonny Boy Jensen, who he is and where he comes from. Then meet me back at your office. I'll get there as fast as I can roll. <laughs> the army camp was on my way, so I took the soldier with me and turned him over to the camp authorities to be held. I kept a lead foot on the gas pedal as I drove past the bridge in the side road where the truckers had been hijacked and slain. It took me almost two hours to reach the county seat. The sheriff was standing in front of his office as I drove up. Inform KTX, say you have any change in location, we'll keep in touch. Howdy, Jase. Howdy. What'd you get? Something that might fit. That Jensen's been traveling up and down this highway for years, selling electrical appliances to farmers and ranchers, mostly. Men like that would have good market for car radios once that shipment cooled off. He could be our boy, all right. You get any line on where he comes from? Works out of El Paso, mostly. But his home's a small ranch about 150 miles southwest of Frito. Sonny Boy Jensen can't be his real name. No, it's Bertram Jensen. They just call him Sonny Boy. Watson said he left the diner about five minutes after Sims and Grover pulled out. Probably passed him on the highway. Had them all staked out and set up that roadblock. You better climb in. Going to El Paso? No, I'll turn south out of Frito and head for Jensen's Ranch. I don't think he'd take that hot merchandise into El Paso. Even if he got there before daylight, he'd run into some traffic, and that's the trucking company's home base. He'd be taking a chance on loading any place in the city. Now, I see what you mean. You better check on him while we're rolling. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA. Go ahead, Unit 10. This unit en route to Jensen Ranch near County Line, 150 miles southwest of Frito Junction. 10 4. Request check on subject Bertram Jensen, alias Sonny Boy Jensen, El Paso appliance dealer and owner of ranch this unit is headed toward. 10 4. Unit 10, clear. KTXA Austin. I've been thinking, Jace. This couldn't have been a one-man job. Jensen couldn't drive the truck and his car after the hijack. It wasn't a one-man job. The soldier who gave him the gas they needed for the truck said there were two men in the car. Two men with a bad murder rap hanging over them are liable to fight, Jace. They sure are, Sheriff. Better take the safety off your gun right now. There mightn't be time later. Unit 10, go ahead, KTXA. I have a report for you on Bertram Jensen. No record of Sonny Boy, alias 
served three years in federal penitentiary Leavenworth, 1919-1921, for theft of army material from the government army. Had accomplice named Dolph Muni, convicted on same charge. No record on either since then. 10-4, Unit 10, clear. KDXA Austin. That may answer a couple of our questions, Sheriff. Yep. Where Jensen got that Army 45 in the 1917 ammo series, and who his partner was, if you think he might have kept in touch with Dolph Mooney for almost 20 years. There's an old saying, Sheriff, about birds of a feather. It was after dark when we reached the Jensen Ranch. When the door opened, I knew it was Jensen. There were little wrinkles under his eyes, and his temples were gray, but his face held a youthful softness, as some faces do, whether 16 or 60. It wasn't hard to understand why they called him Sonny Boy. Well, it's been a long time since I've seen a ranger around here. You, uh, looking for somebody? The sheriff and I heard you might be able to get us a bargain on a few things. Uh, sure. What are you interested in? Automobile radios. Uh... I got a few in my warehouse in El Paso. Thought you might have something around here. No, I'm, I'm afraid not. Uh, and maybe you know somebody who has. Yeah. No, I, I I don't know many people. I live alone here. Don't see much of anybody. Had any company this evening? No. Two ashtrays in this room don't agree with you. There are smoldering butts in both of them. So unless you smoke two cigarettes at a time and walk back and forth across the room to put them out, you haven't been alone. Oh, all right. A neighbor's visited me. Is that a crime? No. Where is he? In the kitchen. Call him. Don't go for him. Just call him from here. Uh, Doc? Hey, Doc! What's this Doc business, Janet? Oh. Well, I didn't hear anybody come in. Jensen tells us you've been visiting him. Where are you from? From Borderville. Well, that's about 50 miles from here. Yeah, and Jensen said you were a neighbor. Well, that's right, ain't it? Distance don't mean much in Texas. <laughs> I I just dropped in on Jensen unexpected. Matter of fact, I, I was just washing up fixing the start for home. Yeah, he he's just leaving. Oh, well, go right ahead. Uh, I'll get your coat as soon as closet. Oh, uh, before you open that, I'd like to ask your friend a couple of questions. Fifty miles is kind of a long walk, isn't it? Only way to leave this ranch would be in a car, and if you've got one parked outside, we didn't notice it. Uh, I was going to lend him mine. Oh, I see. You said you dropped in unexpectedly. How'd you get here without a car? Why, uh, it's to ride. Somebody dropped me off the gate. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, if you got nothing else to ask me, I, I'd like to be going. Yeah. Imagine you would, but I'm not quite finished. Maybe you know where I could get a bargain in an automobile radio. Why, well, I don't know nothing about radios. It's too bad. I thought you might. All right, Jensen. Give him his coat. By the way, either you heard from Dolph Muni lately? Oh, get out of here. You got no right asking questions. You got no warrant. You let us in, Jensen. My story is you broke in, and you ain't going to be able to deny it. Get him on that closet shelf, Gage. <laughs> don't try that, Jensen. Quick, Sheriff. Kick that gun out of his reach. Got it, Jake. Muni! He drove through the window. Stay with Jensen. I'll get him. Come on, get him. Get him. I can see you, Muni. You better stop running before I fire. No sense trying to get in that car. It's locked. That was in the air, Muni. The next one won't be. How about it? All right. All right, don't shoot. Just walk this way with your hands high. I, I had to steal the radio, but I didn't do the killer. I didn't. I was on the highway with a detour sign when Jensen shot him. Don't tell me, Muni. Save that for the court. Where are the radios? In the barn. Hidden in bales of powder. We ditched the truck in Amber Lake. All right, Muni. Let's go in and get Sonny Boy. You can make your statement at the sheriff's office. Bertram, Sonny Boy Jensen, and Dolph Muni were found guilty of the hijacked murder of truck drivers Warren Grover and Luther Sims. Both were sentenced to death in the electric chair at Huntsville Penitentiary. Each of the convicted men made an appeal for clemency, 
And in January of 1949, the sentence of Dolph Muni was commuted to life imprisonment. But the petition of Sonny Boy Jensen was denied. And on the morning of February 19th, 1949, he was executed. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Folks, we want to thank you for the wonderful letters you've been sending to us and the warm and friendly interest you've always shown toward our show. A lot of you have asked the question, what's the title of the theme music heard on Tales of the Texas Rangers? The music you hear at the opening and closing of our show is the Texas Rangers song, written by Sam Coslow and Harry Bain, and is arranged by Robert Armbruster, the conductor of the NBC Orchestra. We're glad to know that so many of you like it. We do, too. And so, Mr. Armbruster, the Texas Ranger song, if you please. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Whitfield Connor, Herb Ellis, Parley Bear, Wilms Herbert, Paul Daubaugh, and Bill Conrad. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcutt. And the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents... Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Blind Justice. It is 5.45 a.m., March 6, 1940. Pete Salverson, owner of a roadside cafe in West Texas, is opening for business. As he sweeps up in the kitchen, he hears a sound outside the back door. Somebody out back there! That's you, Charlie! Well, what's the matter, boy? Where'd you come from? Come on, feller. Come on, I ain't gonna hurt you. Had <laughs> a boy. Looks like you got here too early to root for anything on that garbage can, though. Man, them ribs of yours look like you could use some grub fast. Hey, 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 now, 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 none of that face licking. You just come on inside and I'll fix you up. Come on. Come on. Let's see. How about this? That is bone and a couple of hunks of stew meat, huh? <laughs> All right, fella. Here you are. Dig into that. <laughs> oh, boy, you sure are beat up and hungry. What's this contraption you got strapped on you? Uh, Pete, you open yet? Oh, oh, howdy, Sheriff. How's the coffee situation? Well, ain't brewed yet, but I can fix you some up in a minute. Had an early customer here. <laughs> yeah, but he hasn't got any money. I'm a cash customer. <laughs> Where'd you get him? Oh, he's rooting in the garbage cans out back. What you doing up around so early? Oh, I just came back from Huntsville. Delivered a prisoner up there yesterday. Huh? Hey, that'd be a pretty good-looking dog if he was taken care of. Who owns him? I don't know. Never seen him before. Never did see a leash like the one he's wearing, neither. Kind of funny contraption. Look at it. Hey, well, let's see that. What's the matter, Sheriff? Why, this ain't a leash. It's a harness. Huh? This here dog's a C&I dog. One of them dogs is trained to lead blind people? Sure is. He must have run off from his master, then. Well, these dogs don't run off, Pete. I had a missing person's bulletin on a blind man three days ago. 
This might be his dog. Or a guy that's missing must be around here then, huh? Well, if he is, something must have happened to him. This dog never would have left him. Say, you got change for a dollar in the register? Oh, sure thing. I'm going to hit that phone get a ranger down here to help. Wherever that dog's master is, i got a hunch we'd better find him quick. Less than one hour after the sheriff's appeal for help, Texas Ranger Jace Pearson joined him at Pete Salveson's roadside cafe. Well, there he is, Ranger. No mistake in that harness if you've ever seen one before. It's a C&I dog, all right. You say you found him outside this morning, Salverson? Yeah, half starved, like you can see. Been a good three or four days since he's eaten from the looks of him. Easy, boy. Come here. Nobody's going to hurt you. Oh, I'm sorry, fella. It's really sore, isn't it? He's had a bad time, Sheriff. Got a pretty hard clip on the head. Must have been knocked out. Since then, he's traveled through some rough country. And late, your gear's got him all sliced up. Foot pads are sore from walking. Yeah, but ever since Pete fed him, he's been yelling to get out of here. Reckon he'll be able to lead us back to his master? He'll try if he can make it. We'll have a better chance if a veterinarian works him over first. Where's the nearest one? Uh, foreman at the Wolverine Ranch is a vet. Want to take him out there? Yeah. Meanwhile, you better get yourself a horse. I'll leave my horse trailer here until I get back. You can load your mount in with my horse, Charcoal. It's a double trailer. What makes you think we'll need horses? In a country this dog came through isn't the kind we'll be able to get through in a car. And he came too far for us to follow on foot. Lost dogs sometimes head for home, Jace. Missing persons bulletin came from Ozona in Crockett County. Dog may be headed for there. Only way we'll find out is to follow him. If he heads any other way, it'll be back toward the man he's been trained to take care of. I'm figuring that'll be in a southerly direction from here. Well, how do you know that? All barren country that way, full of lechuguilla. If he came such a long way from any other direction, he'd have run into a town or a ranch and been found before this. I reckon I'll buy that. That makes sense. Get your horse. I'll meet you back here and we'll drive as far south as we can cross country and then turn this dog loose and follow him. I got the dog patched up at the Wolverine Ranch, picked up the sheriff and his horse, and headed south into the Badlands. We switched from car to our horses and turned the dog loose. He circled around for a moment, got his bearings, and then, despite the soreness of his body, started into a limping run. He's heading south, all right, Jace. Must be going to his master. Beats me why he went all the way to Peach Place, though. He had to go someplace for help. But the only thought he gave to himself was just stopping long enough to be fed before he headed back here. How far do you reckon we'll have to go? Well, we came 14 miles by car before the dirt road petered out. He came a lot farther than that. Might have taken him a couple of days. Well, we'll have to stop him at night. If he keeps going that long and tie him off. We better make sure we can catch him poor dark so he don't get away from us altogether. Uh, chances are he'll wait for us. After all, we're the help he came after. If he doesn't, we'll be able to follow him anyhow. In the dark? Yeah. I treated his collar with some phosphorus paint. Hey, whatever made you think of that? Uh, trick my father taught me a long time ago. He had an old hound dog, great hunter. Got a throat injury and couldn't sound off. Blowing collar made up for it. Well, like they say, we live and learn. <laughs> Hey, look. Look where the dog's cutting, up in the foothills. Yeah. That's Ambush Canyon that way, isn't it? Well, sure is. See, no wonder that dog's so beat up. I wouldn't tackle this country in an army tank if I didn't have to. I wonder if that blind fellow would be alive when we find him. I don't think so, Sheriff. If he was alive, I don't think the dog would ever have left him. Come on, Charlie. Come on. What kept that dog going, I'll never know. We hit stretches where we had to lead the horses on foot. It was toward sundown of the second day when the dog caved in. He made a feeble attempt to inch along on his stomach and then just rolled over on his side, panting. He's done for, Jace. Can't even take water. I better... No, Sheriff. Put your gun away. But, Jace, he couldn't move another inch if he wanted to. I'll carry him with me on charcoal. Man would be mighty lucky if he could find a human being that'd go this far for him. Uh, he'd never have led us this far back if you hadn't had the vet work on him. Well, what do we do now? Keep on going, I guess. If his master is in here, he must have left some trail. We'll keep cutting through till we find marks. Jace, now how would a blind man get into this country and why? I don't know. But if he wasn't here, the dog wouldn't have been here either. We better move on till we find a good spot to make camp. These horses need some attention on the night of rest, too. 
Meantime, maybe I can do a little doctrine on the dog. Won't do any good, Jace. All you need's a pack shovel. He just stopped breathing. He's dead. The next morning, we started trail cutting, working steadily to the south, toward the international border, the Rio Grande. Yeah, the country's getting a mite better now, Jace, but we're only about a half a mile from the river. If anybody else had been in here recently, we'd have seen some sign of a trail. Nobody could come through here without leaving some kind of tracks. That dog didn't head this way for nothing, Sheriff. He must have... Hey, hold it a second. Huh? What is it? Look at this. Dog hair caught in this thorn brush. Yeah. Must have been a few days ago when the dog headed out. Look at the color. German Shepherd, all right. We're still on the right trail, then. But why no human tracks? Well, the dog came out of here on foot. But this may not be the way he and his master got in here originally. What other way is there? On the river, in a raft, or a flat-bottom boat? Well, how could a blind man navigate the river? He didn't have to be alone, Sheriff. That dog was beaten on the head, remember? It isn't likely his master did that, is it? No, I see what you mean, but how... Now, wait a minute. Look up ahead there, along the side of the ridge, about a quarter of a mile. Yeah, looks like part of the rock and the earth have been scooped out. Mm. Must have been a little landslide. Not on a rock facing as solid as that looks. What do you suppose it is, then? Let's find out. It took us more than an hour to reach the base of the ridge and find the answer. It wasn't a landslide. There were a couple of dynamite caps on the ground. The fresh earth had been blown out. Uh, two men, all right, Jace. Signs of tracks held tight in this fresh earth. Dog tracks go right along with the one set. That was the blind man. Yeah, another mark running in with those tracks, though. Little round hole in the ground every few steps. Mm, blind man must have had a cane, too. Move around the wide circle and cut back to this spot. Until... Oh, wait, Jace. Hmm? What's that thing over there by the brush? Long white piece or something. A white cane. Come on. Ahead of its stain, Jace. Looks like blood. Mm, it is. Dog must have been clubbed with that. Uh, blood stains didn't come from the dog, Sheriff. Lump he had on his head didn't bleed. <laughs> Let's beat through this brush. Blood trail on the ground through here, Jason. Yeah. That path just ahead seems to be pressed down in one spot. Let's make for it. A man's body, all right. Face down. Better roll him over and see if it's a blind man. It's him, all right. You can tell by his right hand. Callus ridge there from holding on to that dog harness. I took the white cane and the dynamite caps and rode along the shore of the river to the nearest town. Called Austin to fly a lab man down and arrange for a boat to pick up the sheriff and the body. I was in the local constable's office 24 hours later when the body was brought into town. Well... Body's over at the undertaker, Jace. Good. Constable told me you were in here looking over a report from your lab man. Yeah. No lead on the dynamite caps, but we learned plenty from the cane. Two sets of prints, one unidentified. Must have been the blind man's. Now what about the other set? Man who left the other set had a criminal record. Name was James Waterman. Got out of Huntsville six years ago. Waterman? Say, I, I remember that name. You ought to remember it. He pulled ten years for armed robbery. Forty thousand dollar payroll stick up back in twenty four. Money never was recovered. I wonder why he killed that blind man. And why was he blasting in the face of that rock ridge? Something we'll ask him when we get him. Oh, was the lab man at the funeral home when you brought the body in? Yeah, he's going over it now. Want to get some grub while you're waiting for him to finish? Yeah. You take prints off the body to compare with the ones he lifted from the cane. He'll have identification established by the time we get through. Good. Let's go. I'll be glad to eat something I haven't had to cook myself. <laughs> You know, funny thing, we started off so fast after that dog turned up the other day, I never did check that missing persons bulletin for the blind man's name. His name was Joseph Wilson. Lived in a rooming house in Ozona, operated a newsstand. Landlady reported him missing when she didn't see him or the dog for two days. Now, there's a cafe across the street. Good. Yeah. We took our time. A statewide pickup was out for James Waterman, and it seemed just a matter of pinning him down. But when we got finished and walked over to the funeral home, the case wasn't so simple. Our lab man, Marty Ferris, was just finishing a phone conversation. No, I said there's no doubt about it. Yeah, check on it. Pearson just walked in. I'll tell him. Right. Bye. Howdy, Jace. Howdy, Marty. Marty Ferris, Sheriff Ritchie. Sure. Now, we met uh, when the sheriff came in with the body. 
In case we got trouble, this thing is blown wide open. All right, what's the matter? That's the prints. And take a look at them. Now, here's a copy of the unidentified set I sent on to Austin. The man who made them has no record. Well, why should he have a record? Aren't they the blind man's prints? Uh, no, they aren't, Jace. The prints on the body match the known prints pulled from the cane. The dead man is James Waterman. What? That's it, Sheriff. Here, look at the prints. See for yourself. Marty, could you have made a mistake? No, Jace. I just checked with Austin on the phone by classification number. Waterman must have been blinded sometime after he left Huntsville. He took the name of Wilson as an alias. Uh, now all we've got is a set of unidentified prints that might match anybody in the state. Sheriff, our killer isn't going to be easy to find. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Blind Justice. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. Whoever the blind man's companion had been, there had to be a starting point for their journey along the river. A place where they'd picked up a boat or a raft. The sheriff and I worked our way along the river above the town, questioning the occasional Mexicans who managed somehow to make a living where no living was to be made. And in one spot, less than a mile from the road, we found something can see it clearly now, Jace. Yeah. Impression of a flat-bottom boat on that mud flat. Had to be dragged quite a ways to the water. Not many days ago, either. Oh, oh, boy. <sighs> mud around where the boat was is caked dry. Spot where the boat was setting still looks damp. Uh-huh. Boat must have been there without being used for quite some time. River's been way down for more than a year. Yeah, a little smoke coming up from behind those trees. Must be a Mexican hut. Whoever's there might own the boat. Let's ask him. Get up, Charlie. Oh, Come boy. Mmm, tacos cooking. Smell them? Yeah. Smell something else, too. Chicken frying. There's a place. I can see it now. Yeah, pretty high class for River Hut. Looking back, chicken coop. Kind of new, too. Coop wire, I mean. Hasn't been up very long. Yeah, a woman out in front of the place. Well, she sees us. Buenos dias, senor. Oh, buenos dias, senor. Whoa, whoa, Charlie. Oh, boy. Maybe you can help us out, senora. We'd like some information about a boat that was out on that mud flat until a few days ago. I never see a boat there, senor. You never saw one there? What made that impression in the mud, then? I, I called my husband. He speaks better English. Hmm. Daniel? Venga? Yes. What the matter? You don't let me sleep. They know something about that boat, all right, Jace. Yeah. yeah. My husband... Here come. Hey, you want something, senor? They want to know. There's a mark left by a boat down in that mud flat. When was the boat there last? And what happened to it? Hey, it was maybe a week ago. The boat disappeared in the night. One morning, she's gone. That's all I know. Who took it? We don't know. Mm, just like that, huh? Si, si. Just gone. Don't try to feed us a story like that. You... Now, just a second, Sheriff. Where do you work, Danielle? What do you do for a living? Well, uh, I do anything for whoever give me the work. But for a long time, nobody give me any. You must have saved a lot of money to be eating fried chicken and tacos. Where'd you get those chickens? I, I raised them, senor. Yeah, without hens and a rooster? There isn't anything in that coop old enough to sit a nest. And that coop wire is new. Well, what I mean to say, I, I was just starting to raise them. Where'd you get the money to buy that coop wire and the chicks? You better talk up. This is part of a murder investigation. Murder? Blind man was murdered downriver. He got there by boat. Oh, you... Senor, I, I got nothing to do with murder. I just sell the boat. Why didn't you say so before? Well, because the boat was not mine. But you sold it just the same. Say, si, say, si. look, I tell you the truth. The boat is there for two years. Ever since we come here, I never know who owns it. And then one day, the... The men come. The two men? Si, si. The one of them blind? Si, si. He got a dog and a white stick. He, the other man with him, he said to me, I give you $50 for the boat. Well, uh, I don't say that the boat is mine. I, I just let him give me $50. What the man look like? The one who could see? Oh, he's big, just like you, with the light hair, very wavy, eyes uh, uh, blue. 
He said that when they come back, I can have the boat back for nada, uh, nothing. And he gave me more money if I don't tell nobody. I say, uh, you give me more now, huh? But he said he don't have no more until he come back. That's the whole truth, senor, just like Daniel tell you. All right. If it isn't the truth, we'll find out. Come on, Sheriff. Let's go. All right. Oh, you two stay right around here in case we want to see you again. Oh, we'll see, we, we be here. We don't run away. Up, boy. Hey. Uh, heading back to the town? Yeah. Marty may have some more information. And I think we just got a lead from Danielle on why Waterman and the other man went downriver. Well, if you did, you got something I missed. I promised Danielle more money when they came back. The money Waterman got in that stick-up 16 years ago never was recovered, remember? Oh, oh, I get it. That's why they dynamited into that rock ridge. Waterman must have hidden that money until it cooled off. That's right. But before he ever got back to it, he was caught and sent to Huntsville for ten years. Why didn't he go for it as soon as he got out six years ago? That's one of the things we still don't know. Maybe Marty will have the answers when we get back to town. Marty had the answers, all right. Reports from Austin that had come in while we were on the river. I made notes on everything, Jace, if you can read my writing. Oh, thanks. A check back shows that Waterman lost his sight three days after he left Huntsville six years ago. Now, it's hard to run down because he didn't have to report to anybody. He'd served his full term, no parole. I see. Happened in a highway accident, huh? Yeah, caught a lift on a gasoline truck, went over an embankment and caught fire. The driver was killed, Waterman blinded. Near Sonora. That means Waterman was headed this way from the pen. He was going straight for that money, Sheriff. Losing his sight stopped him. But why did it take him six years to move for it again? He had to find somebody to help him. A man with a load of stolen money hidden away doesn't trust many people. He finally trusted somebody. Mm. And got killed for it. I'm going to take a ride to Ozona. It's out of your county, Sheriff, but it's your case. You want to come along? You bet I want to come along. Let's go. <laughs> In Ozona, we went to the rooming house where Waterman had lived under the name of Joseph Wilson. The landlady showed us to his room. It hadn't been rented to anybody else, and his things were still there. A few books in Braille, clothing, an extra harness for the dog. Everything is just like he left it, just like it was when the police come after I called them. I haven't touched a thing. No money, nothing valuable was left here, only what you see. It's all right, ma'am. Don't be upset. Nobody accused you of taking anything. I just want you to know there wasn't nothing to take. He never had nothing. Always a couple of weeks behind in his rent. Not that I minded. I had nothing but sympathy for the poor man. Even fed his dog for him or never would have been fed. Look, something you just said is important to me. Now, if he owes you money, there's nobody to pay it, so you're you're just going to lose it. The truth can't hurt you one way or the other. Did he really owe you rent money? Yes. Why else would I say it? Every once in a while, he'd catch up. He got some kind of benefit checks from someplace once in a while. What's your angle there, Jake? I'm just figuring, Sheriff. Daniel got $50 for that boat he sold. There must have been more expenses getting from here down there. Somebody had to finance it. His traveling companion, whoever it was. Yeah. It's a cinch it was somebody Waterman met and got to know right here in Ozona. Ma'am, did Mr. Waterman, uh, Mr. Wilson have any visitors here? Any friends? I never saw a soul. There was some fellow called him a few times, though, when he was home sick and couldn't work at the newsstand. You know who it was? No, he never gave me his name. Mr. Wilson just said it was somebody he knew from the stand. The same fellow each time? As far as I could tell from the voice. I see. Thanks. Come on, Sheriff. Was that all you want here? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> We located the place where Waterman had had his newsstand, a main intersection near a bank, a restaurant, an office building, and a medical and professional building. Somebody else was running the stand now. We staked out in my car across the street. Looking for somebody fitting the description Danielle gave us? That's right. Man who called whenever Waterman was sick might have been a regular customer. It could be quite a few customers fitting that description, Jase. We'll tag the ones who come close. See if the newsie or anybody around has any information on him. Somebody might have noticed the man we're looking for hanging around the stand from time to time. If he knew Waterman well enough to call his room and house, he knew him well enough to stop for a talk. You're right, of course, but this kind of waiting wears me out. It's the dullest part of the job, Sheriff, but sometimes it's the part that pays off. For 
two days, we watched the corner. Occasionally, we followed a man who fitted the description supplied by Danielle. But each time we checked, the subject turned out to be somebody who hadn't been out of town. Then, just before the end of our second day of watching, I nudged the sheriff. What is it, Jase? Over there. No, past the newsstand. Just going into the medical and professional building. Oh, yeah. He looks like he might be the boy, all right. His hair is really light and curly, which most of the others haven't been. Let's see where he went. Oh, wait a minute. He's still in the lobby. There by the elevator. Let's wait until he's picked up. There's the elevator now. Well, there it goes. He's the only passenger. Come on. Watch the floor marker. See where the elevator stops. Third floor, Jace. Yeah, let's take a look at the building directory on the wall. Third floor, two doctors, a dentist, an attorney, and a chiropodist. Go up to that floor. Try them all. You want me to grab him? No. If you spot him in a waiting room, just sit down like you're waiting too. After he leaves, find out anything you can about him. I'll wait back in the car and tag him after he comes out. How do we get together again? After I find out where he lives, I'll come back and pick you up on the corner. I waited for the man with the light curly hair. He came out of the building in 20 minutes. I started my car away from the curb slowly, keeping him in sight. He turned the corner and got into a car of his own, drove to an apartment building. I noted the address and then went back and met the sheriff. I hope you didn't lose him, Jace. I think he's the one we want. Why? What'd you get? He was in to see a doctor. Had a dressing on his arm changed. Doc said he's a regular patient who's been away on vacation. Mm, Been out of town, huh? Yeah, but that isn't all. It's what he's being treated for that ought to make you sit up. Dog bite. Dog bite? I thought that shepherd might have gotten to the killer just once before he was knocked out. Let's go visit him. I know the apartment building he lives in. You get his name from the doc? The J.B. Rowland works on the local newspaper. Reporter? No, has charge of distribution and circulation. Also takes care of the morgue. Uh, back issue files. Oh, that'd put him in touch with Waterman on the circulation end. And his taking care of the back issues might fit, too. That might have told him who Waterman really was. Hey, that's right. Fishing through some old back issues, he might have read about the robbery and Waterman's conviction. Maybe seen a picture of Waterman and recognized it. That'd make him get friendly. He'd know the money was never recovered and that Waterman didn't have it on hand or he wouldn't be running a newsstand and living like he did. You think he told Waterman what he knew and finally talked him into a deal? Or do you think maybe you forced him into it? When we see him, we'll ask him. There's the door, Jace. Apartment 2B. You gonna knock? Yeah. Yeah? Who is it? Special delivery. Well, I'm not dressed. You better slip it under the door. You got a sign for it. Oh. Okay, Oh, have you got a pencil? All right, Roland. Open it all the way. I'll open it. I'll open your skull. Watch him, Jay. Stay away from that desk. You're not taking me. Give me that gun. Oops. Oh, oh. oh my, my arm. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Same arm Waterman's dog chewed on, huh? I, I don't know what you're talking about. No. Just the same you went right for a gun. Brand new gun at that. Like you were expecting you might have trouble. Come on, get up. Oh. Why'd you kill him? You want all the money instead of a split? Money. <laughs> money. Yeah, where's the money? What'd you do with it? What did I do with it? I worked on him for months until he trusted me. Then we went down to the river, but we couldn't find the place. Couldn't remember all the landmarks. He couldn't see, and after 16 years, he couldn't remember. He couldn't remember. I went crazy. I planned on it so much, I went crazy. That's so all. If I had the money, I, I could have gotten away. Without the money, I had to come back here so they wouldn't be looking for me. All right, Roland. Go get some clothes on. <laughs> Looks like that 40000 is really gone for keeps, Chase. Yeah. Buried in a rock ridge somewhere near the Rio Grande. That's money that never bought anybody anything. I feel sorry for that dog, Chase, breaking his heart and dying like he did. Funny thing about a dog, a dog never passes judgment. He just sticks right to the finish, whether you're good or bad, worth it or not. I'll help Roland get a jacket on, then we can take him in. (laughs) 
For the murder of James Waterman, alias Joseph Wilson, J.B. Rowland was convicted and sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for a period of 99 years. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Peggy Weber, Herb Vigran, Ed Begley, Earl Keane, Tom Holland, and Tom McKee. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, death by adoption. It is 9.45 p.m. on a Saturday night, September 1937. The business district of Central City, Texas is dark, except for the office of Harry Cashman's used car lot. Cashman is pacing the small office in agitation. A man in a leather windbreaker crosses the lot, slipping between the cars for sale and knocks at the door. Well, how day, Mr. Cashman? Uh. Glad to see you waited for me. All right, spit it out. What do you want this time? I'm kind of short on folding money. Thought you might be a pal and help me out again. You know what this is, don't you, Striker? The Lord called it a shakedown. I gave you $100 two weeks ago and another 100 the month before. So I need more. Well, you're not getting more, not from me. Why, well, that's too bad. I'm sorry you feel that way, Mr. Cashman. I kind of thought you were a nice guy. Oh. kind of guy I'd like to see raise my baby long as I can't raise her myself. Now, you leave the baby out of this. Now, you can't expect me to forget about her, Mr. Cashman. After all, she's my own flesh and blood. She belongs to me and my wife, legally, by adoption. Yeah, but you keep forgetting one important thing. I never signed no papers letting you adopt her. Your wife said you were dead. She thought I was dead. But my being here proves I ain't. And if we ever have to take this into court, Mr. Cashman, I'm baby Ann's natural father. I got my rights, you know. All right, how much? Reckon a hundred will see me through again. I'll give you five hundred. Why, that's better. Now, just a minute. I'll give you five hundred if you sign a paper waiving all rights to baby Ann. I ain't signing nothing. I like our arrangement just the way it is. It's working out fine. If you think... Well, go ahead, Mr. Cashman. Answer. May be business, and I'd like to see you do a good business. For the baby's sake, you understand? <sighs> Hello. Harry, why aren't you home? It's almost 10 o'clock. Oh, I'll be home in a little while, Hazel. Uh, something came up. You sound worried. Is anything wrong? No, 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 no. Of course not. The baby wanted to wait up for you. I let her stay up till 8.30, but by then she just kept rubbing her eyes and her nose and saying, where's my daddy? Till she couldn't hold her little head up. Well, I, I'm sorry, Hazel. Uh, give her a kiss for me. I, I'll be home in a little while. Harry, are you sure there's nothing wrong? You sound like you're upset about something. Oh, it's it's nothing. I'm just tired. I'll see you in half an hour. Well, all right, dear. Goodbye. Goodbye, honey. That's your wife? Yes. Never did meet her. Maybe we ought to all get together, have a little talk. Huh? Striker, 
If you try that, it's the last talk you will ever have. What are you trying to do? Your baby's got a home, a good home, and we love her. We've been married 15 years, never had a child of our own. And now we've got her, and she's ours. Why, if we ever lost her, we'd have nothing to live for. Haven't you got a heart? Well, uh, I can see I made a big mistake, Mr. Cashman. I should have started seeing you a lot sooner and a lot often. Oh, what do you mean by that? That from now on, I'll be around every Saturday night to pick up my hundred dollars. And I'll take tonight's payment right now. Why, don't you... be a fool, Mr. Cashman. I'm younger and a lot stronger than you. Now, don't get yourself hurt. Now, how about my money? All right, Striker. There's your hundred. And it's the last you're getting. Now, get out of my sight and don't ever come back. Because if you do, I'll go to the police. I'll spend every dollar I've got fighting you. I'll prove what you are. I'll prove you're not fit to have custody of Anne. Mr. Cashman, I do believe you mean that. I swear before heaven I mean it. So this is your parting gift to me, eh? Not much considering the size of the role you peeled it off, huh? All right. All right, I'll leave you alone. I'll take my payment in full right now. Dig that roll out again. Toss it on the desk. I see. Now it's a gun, huh? You see it and I know how to use it. How could Anne have a father like you? She couldn't have, not you. You've never proved you are her father. <laughs> You're getting real bright tonight, Mr. Cashman. I get the money up on the desk. I'm not going to give you another dime, Striker. All I'm going to give you is what you deserve. Get away from that phone. I'm going to call the police. You ain't calling any police. Maybe I'm stronger than you think. Haven't you ain't stronger than Yeah. Give me that money. Maybe you should have been fighting your wife. You see, you're still the only one who knows about me, and you ain't never going to tell anyone else. Thanks for the final payment. At 11 o'clock, after three more calls to her husband's used car lot, Hazel Cashman was disturbed by the busy signal and her husband's failure to come home. A phone company check showed the line was not in use. Hazel Cashman called the police. They found Harry Cashman's body and requested aid in the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. He arrived at the lot shortly after 2 a.m. Alfred, there's all the information I can give you, men. Oh, uh, howdy, Ranger. You must be Jace Pearson. That's right. You in charge here? Yeah. The Dan Simmons, chief of police. Uh, fellas, I'll talk to you later. All right. Oh. I see you've already lifted some fingerprints. Huh? How'd you know? Oh, dusting powder on the glass top here. Uh, yeah, the crew just left. Ah, prints aren't going to be much good, though, I'm afraid. Too many people coming in and out of a place like this, signing papers on that desk. What's that over there, chief? What? Oh, that yellow spot on the carpet? Yeah. I noticed that before. Seems to be a piece of chalk that was stepped on. A few little pieces not quite ground in. I don't see a blackboard or anything around here. Any of the for sale signs on the cars marked with chalk? No, no. They're all marked with cardboard cutouts. Well, the floor is pretty clean otherwise. Waste paper basket's empty. Yeah. This place was swept out after the day's business. That chalk got ground into the rug last night after the place was cleaned. Yeah, I can see that now. And the phone hanging off the hook like that when you got here? Uh -huh. Cashman struggled with whoever killed him. He must have been trying to make a call. Oh, I don't know, Jace. Body's just where we found it. A good eight feet from the phone. Yeah, he might have staggered over there and fell. But the fight started right here by the desk and the phone. Uh, got some reason for being so sure then? The desk was moved a little in the fight, Chief. Look at the carpet. Deep worn spot where the desk usually rested. Carpets bunched up around the base, showing the desk was pushed, not lifted, and moved for any reason. Ah, you're right. I can't see that it helps us any, though. Gives us a little picture of the action, that's all. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get some of this yellow chalk in an envelope. Uh, you're going to send that to your lab at Austin? That's right. They can analyze it. Maybe come up with something. It's worth a shot. Doesn't seem to be much of anything else to help us, though. Robbery motive for murder is usually the toughest one to crack. Did Cashman make a habit of carrying a lot of money? Yeah, had to in this business. People selling cars in a hurry need a fast dollar. He usually had a couple of thousand on them. All we found in his pocket was 86 cents and change. Uh, you finished here? Yeah. I'd like you to put a man to work on that filing cabinet. Get a record of all sales. We've already checked that. 
Every car Cashman has accounted for. Nothing's been stolen from the lot. I wasn't thinking of a stolen car. I just want a list of recent customers. Oh. Somebody might have bought an automobile he wasn't happy with and come back to get even. Uh, could be, but I'm afraid that's a blind alley too, Ranger. Cashman gave a mighty good guarantee on everything he sold, and he stood behind it a hundred percent. Just the same, let's check it. I want to examine every reason he might have been killed a hundred percent. I sent the ground yellow chalk through to Austin. There was nothing that could be done that night, but the next morning, Chief Simmons and I went to see Hazel Cashman, the dead man's wife. <laughs> we don't like to ask you questions at a time like this, Mrs. Cashman, but... I... I understand, and I want to help you if I can. Probably isn't much you can tell us, but any little thing might help. Your husband ever have trouble with anybody? No. Aside from the money he carried, do you know of any reason why anybody might have been out to get him? No, there was never anybody who didn't like Harry. What am I going to tell the baby? How am I ever going to make her understand that her daddy won't ever come home again? Would, would you answer that for me, please? I... I don't want to talk to anybody now. Why, sure, ma'am. Maybe for us, anyhow. Had to leave this number at headquarters. Hello? Yes, yeah, Simmons speaking. Go ahead, I'll write it down. We, we were going on a picnic today. Last night, I made the sandwiches and everything. We were going to leave right after church. I knew something was wrong when he didn't come home. I knew it. Take it easy, ma'am. All week long, Harriet was teaching Ann how to say picnic. She was just learning to pronounce it. No. You've got to get a grip, ma'am, for your baby's sake. Yes. Right. Yes, I know. All right. Thanks. We'll be in soon. I better get back to headquarters, Jace. Uh, unless you have something else to ask Mrs. Cashman. No. You shouldn't be alone, though, ma'am. Especially when your baby wakes up. I called a neighbor just before you came. She'll be here in a few minutes. That's good. Goodbye, ma'am, and thank you. Goodbye, Mrs. Cashman. Goodbye. Find out who killed my husband. He never hurt anybody. Never. We'll do our best, ma'am. That's the rush back to headquarters, Simmons. One of my boys pulled in a suspect, Jason. Oh? Fellow who worked for Cashman, a cleaning man named Moe Smith. What do they got on him? Well, he cleaned the office last night about 8.30 or 9 o'clock. Cashman usually closed before then on Saturday nights, but Smith admits Cashman was still there when he cleaned up. Well, he's not trying to hide anything there. No, no, but there's something else. Moe Smith was on the town last night, threw a big party and threw a lot of money around. Still had a few hundred on him when he was picked up. And uh, my man checked on that, Jace. Smith is usually dirt poor. I see. He's going to be worth talking to. You can say that again. I'd have told you inside the house, but I didn't want to say anything in front of Mrs. Cashman. That was best. How old is the baby? Mm, just two years old, Jace. Why? You look kind of funny. How old are the Cashmans? Well, I'd say Harry was about 55. Yes, Mrs. Cashman must be in her 40s. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, the baby's an adopted child. I thought they were a little bit old to have a child of that age. Yeah, they never had any of their own. A couple of years ago, they took in a poor girl who'd lost her husband. Anne was her child. Cashman's took to the kid right off. Then the mother got sick, and when she knew she was dying, she agreed to let the Cashmans adopt the baby. No kid ever got a better break, believe me. I gathered they were pretty crazy about her. Plenty crazy. Why, if that kid even sneezed, Harry Cashman would be ready to charter a plane and fly at a Mayo Clinic. They wrapped their lives around her, just like she was their own. When you feel that way about a kid, it is your own. Loving them is what makes them belong to you. Yeah, you can say that again. Say, any messages from my headquarters in that phone call you took? Oh, Jace, I forgot. I was too hot about my man picking up Moe Smith. Your lab phoned in a report on that chalk. Any lead? Well, I don't know under the circumstances, but it wasn't an ordinary piece of chalk. Analysis showed that it's a special type that surveyors use for marking. Surveyors, huh? Yeah. Isn't likely that a janitor would be carrying the kind of chalk used by surveyors. Oh, it might have come from any place, Jace. Custer might have dropped it. It was dropped and stepped on after the office had been cleaned. Maybe our case against Moe Smith isn't going to be as strong as it looks. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Death by Adoption, 
an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. At the city jail, Moe Smith was being held in an anteroom. The day was cool, but beads of sweat stood out on his forehead. If he was innocent, he didn't look it. I began to forget about the surveyor's chalk. Come on, Moe's. Where were you last night? I was at a party, Mr. Simmons, at my own house. And where were you before the party? I was working for Mr. Harry Cashman at the used car lot. Everybody knows I work there. What time did the party start, Mose? Uh, after 10 o'clock, sir. And later we left my house and went a few other places. Were you paying all the bills? Well, well, is that right or isn't it? That's right, sir. I don't remember much about it. Next thing I knew it was this morning and a policeman woke me up and brought me down here. What time was it when you left the car lot last night? Oh, I worked almost nine o'clock, sir. Cleaning up like I always do. Was Mr. Cashman all right when you left the lot? No, sir, he wasn't. Mr. Harry was always mighty nice to me. But somebody called him on the telephone. He didn't say much to whoever it was. Then he slammed the phone down real mad and he hollered at me to hurry up and finish. He ain't never done that before, sir. Then when I got done and was ready to leave, he told me he's sorry he yelled at me like that. What'd you do then? I, I did some shopping for the party. Got some food, a couple of jugs of Sweet Lucy. Where'd you get the money? Spill it, Mose. Cashman was robbed, and you had almost $300 on you this morning when you were picked up. It was my own money, so honest. You never got that kind of money working on a used car lot. Three days ago, you were broke. You borrowed $2 from your landlady. You better count for that money, Mose. Where'd you get it? Oh, well, from the numbers. Numbers? You mean you've been gambling on the numbers racket? Yes, sir. And yesterday, my number hit, 424. I got my $500. That, that's how come I got money. You expect us to swallow that? Who paid you off, Mose? I don't know, sir. I don't know who he was. Are you trying to tell us you gambled on numbers without knowing who you gave your bets to? Please, sir. If I tell you who it is, Mr. Simmons is going to arrest him. And everybody will know I told. And if I don't find out, you're going to stand trial for murder. Everybody will know that, too. Oh, no, sir. Please. I never hurt Mr. Harry. Oh, I got the money from Jonas. One of the pen boys at the bowling alley. Jonas been booking numbers on the side? No, sir. He just worked for somebody for a little cut. All right, Mose. We'll check on your story. And it better be true. I told the truth everywhere. Well, he sounded on the level, Jace. And if he is, I'll be able to smash a hole in the numbers racket. Yeah, you can do that, all right. But we'll still be shy of murderer. Simmons staked out the bowling alley where Jonas worked as a pin setter. Moe Smith had told the truth, all right. The pin boy confirmed it when he was arrested for possession of slips made out by betters playing the numbers. We were back to a single clue again, the yellow chalk. We've checked the only surveying crew in the city, Jace. Every man working on it had an alibi. All surveyors aren't in the city. That killer could have come from any place in the county. No road building projects underway, and only other surveying crew we've been able to trace is the mapping crew down in the Big Bend. Not going to be easy to get to. I'll get to them. Wherever this car won't take me, the horse and the trailer I'm towing will. Huh? You leaving right away? As soon as I can drop you at your headquarters. <laughs> I drove to the big bend to where the roads ran out and I had to cut cross country to reach the mapping crew. I unloaded charcoal from the trailer. The crew was deep in wild country. Almost a full day's ride before I reached them. All right, Charky. Easy, boy, easy. Anybody here? Yo, over this way. Come on, Charky. Well, howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Saw marks of a camp here, but it looked deserted. It is. We moved in another couple of miles. I just come back with the birds to haul the last of our stuff onto the new camp. I was just tying a pack on this last one. You the crew foreman? Yeah. I'll ride on away with you. Keep you from getting lonesome. Glad to have you. I got company, though. One of my men just went on ahead a few minutes ago. We'll catch up to him on the way. Hey, you want me to take one of those lead ropes? No, they're good birds. They won't give me no trouble. All right, let's go. Up, Chuck. Up, boy. Come on, you long-eared scavengers. You've had enough grazing. You must be covering a lot of ground in here. Ah, oh, plenty. In a sprawling country like this, ranchers lose sight of their boundaries when the land ain't fenced off. Hey, you uh, after somebody in here, Ranger? Maybe. 
How long you fellas been working through here? Oh, been almost two months now. You ever pull out to go into town? Well, we got horses, of course, but it's a long ride to a road and transportation any place of any size. <laughs> I just decided to grow me some whiskers and stay here till the job's done. Any of your men ride out? Oh, yeah. You of them go out weekends to Central City or someplace like that for Saturday night. Then they gotta turn around and spend all day Sunday coming back. Family men usually stay and just keep on working, pile up overtime. How many men you got working? Oh, I got 11. Any of them away last weekend? Yeah, four of them. You know where they went? No. Hey, I reckon Bill Stryker can tell you, though. Who's he? A fellow with the other boroughs. Ah, oh, there he is, just topping that rise about a quarter of a mile ahead. He one of the ones who left camp? Yeah, they all went off together. Let's catch up to him. Okay, come on, boy. Get up, bird. Yeah, charcoal. We rode after the man named Bill Stryker. On the way, I saw the surveyor's marks I'd been following for miles. Cloth markers nailed to trees. Yellow chalk marks on rocks. Within a few minutes, we caught up to him. Well, yeah, Ranger. We was away for the weekend, like Tracy told you. Me and three other fellas. Where'd you go? Central City. Only place worth going we'd get to in time. What did you do up there? Well, just fool around. All of us together. Well, you were only there for Saturday night. You must have done something special, something you remember. I thought one of the boys mentioned the dance, Striker. Well, well, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, square dancer, Alamo Ballroom. You spend the whole evening there? Yeah. Like I said, we were all together. All evening. Four stags at a dance drift around. Hard to keep an eye on each other all evening. E, yeah, I reckon we could lose sight of each other for a minute or two. You fellas take time out to do any shopping? Well, what could we buy that we could bring back here? I thought maybe one of you might be saving some money, maybe enough to make a deal on a used car. Uh, we, we rode a bus both ways after our horses got us from here to Lannis Junction. That's too bad. If you'd been shopping around a used car lot, you might have been able to help me. You might have gotten a look at a man who killed a dealer named Cashman in Central City on Saturday night. Killed? Hey, Ranger, you got a reason for being here. Hey, you think one of my crew killed that man? I'll know better when we see the other three who went to town with Stryker here. Let's get on to the camp. <laughs> They all told the same story. There were gaps, times during the evening when they drifted away from each other, but they couldn't pin it down to any specific time on the clock. I didn't have anything to take them in on, singly or together. They knew it, and I knew it. I camped with them overnight, then headed back to Central City Police Headquarters. Oh, how did case? How'd you make out? No good, Chief. Uh, we haven't turned up anything new either. Just a chance armed robbery, Jace. That's what it must have been. My feelings still bucket that, Simmons. Mose told us that Cashman was upset about a phone call. Stayed at the lot long after he should have gone home. There must have been a reason. Like what? Like somebody who wanted to see him, telling him to wait there. Yeah. Mose said the call made Cashman mad. Why'd they wait for somebody he was mad at? Maybe because they had some kind of a club they could use to make him wait, whether he liked it or not. You're still digging for something deeper than an armed robbery motive, then. That's right. Well... Nobody's given us anything to back up any other motive. I know, but a man doesn't make a telephone appointment to be robbed and murdered. He makes it for something else. I'm going out to see Mrs. Cashman again. When you called your husband last Saturday night, it was almost ten, you said. What makes you think he was upset? When you're married to a man for 15 years, you just know that's all. But he said there was nothing wrong. Anything like that ever happened before? His not coming home, I mean, acting upset? Yes, it did. Twice before. Once was almost two months ago, then a couple of weeks ago. Those other times. You remember what day they happened on? I mean, can you remember if it was always on a Saturday? Yes. Always, all three times. But I don't know why. I don't know what was bothering him. Oh, how did he react? He was nervous, irritable. It surprised me the first time. Harry had never been that way with anybody. He snapped at me, the hard girl. Apologized later, but the only one he didn't snap at was the baby. He just seemed to want to hold her in his lap. Just sit there and rock back and forth, holding her. And then during the night, he kept getting up, going to a crib to look at her. I see. Ma'am, did your husband ever say he was worried about somebody trying to take little Anne away from you? Why, well, no. 
Who could take her from us? Both her parents were dead. Her mother agreed to the adoption before she passed on. You ever know the baby's father? Ever see him? No, he died before Anne was born. Killed in an accident. You're sure of that? Well, that's what Anne's mother told her. She couldn't have lied. Have you got a copy of the baby's birth certificate? Yes, right in this drawer. With a copy of the adoption papers we got from the court. Here's the court order. And the paper signed by Anne's mother, Dorothy Stryker. Stryker? Was the father's name Bill or William Stryker? Why, no. Here it is on the birth certificate. His name was Arthur Stryker. Came from Fort Worth. Ranger, what is it? I think I know who killed your husband now. And I'm beginning to figure why. You'll hear from me, ma'am. I headed for the Big Bend, making a radio check with KTXA, asking the station to contact the Fort Worth police on possible relationship between Arthur and William Stryker. The answer fit. They'd been brothers. But William Stryker had a criminal record. It was late afternoon when I mounted charcoal for the ride into the surveying camp. I reached it about 3 a.m., dismounted, and slipped into the office tent. Tracy. What the... Shh, quiet. It's me, Pearson. Boy, you scared me. Shh. Why'd you come back? Not all your boys were square dancing at Central City. Where's Stryker sleeping? Oh, Stryker, huh? That's right. Out back, near where the horses are hobbled. We better be careful, Ranger. He's got a gun. Good. A test can give me the final proof I need if it's the same gun that killed Cashman. I'll come with you. If he wakes up before I get to him, you hit the ground and stay there, no matter what happens. Don't worry. I'm a surveyor, not a hero. There, under that tree. Branches in the moon got it all in shadow, though. He's not here. Somebody's trying to get away with one of the horses. Come on. Oh, you must have seen me out in the moonlight crossing to the tent. Get away from that horse, Striker. You're in the light now. I can see you, too. There's something you won't say. Oh, Ranger, you're hit. Drop. Got him. Be careful. Might be a trick. Are you other men? Stay down. Don't move. Oh, it's no trick, Ranger. Oh, he's hit more than once and bad. I don't want to die. Don't let me die. Better get whatever first aid stuff you have. It. Try and patch him up. You're going to need some work, too. I'll be all right. You men can get up now. Need a couple of you to make a letter. I need it to take him in. I... Easy, Ranger. I got you. Oh, men will have to make two letters. You need one yourself. William Stryker lived long enough to confess his masquerade as the father of his dead brother's child and the murder of Harry Cashman. He was pronounced dead shortly after arrival at the nearest emergency hospital. Jace Pearson had three bullets removed from his body. They matched the bullet taken from the body of Harry Cashman. Six weeks later, Jace Pearson reported back to his company, ready again for duty with the Texas Rangers. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. There's a story about one of the first Texas Ranger captains whose outward appearances seemed to be little more than a boy. One of the Rangers in his command, a big, raw-boned, muscular fellow noted for his complete lack of fear, was asked by a townsman, how come a big fellow like you takes orders from him? Why, he ain't even got enough of a beard to need shaving. The Ranger looked at the townsman. Maybe he hasn't got much of a beard, the Ranger admitted. But when we go out after a gang of bandits with them outnumbering us three or four to one, I never yet heard the captain say, go get them, boys. He always says, come on, men, follow me. Good night, folks. See you again next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Joe Kearns, Tom McKee, Roy Glenn, and Barbara Luddy. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott. 
And the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joe McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Breakdown. It is shortly after midnight, the beginning of Good Friday in the year 1937. Jim Wiley, constable of Romer, Texas, is driving through the lonely outskirts of his territory when his headlights pick out a car parked on the road's shoulder. He breaks to a stop. Damn, some trouble. This heat calmed out on me. I'm trying to get it started for half hour. Well, maybe I can get it going for you. I know a little something about cars. Okay about trying? You bet. Go ahead. Mm. Yeah, it looks like it ain't about to snort, friend. You must be out of gas. The gauge says you're half full. The gauge must be busted, then. Choking like I did, and should have flooded the carburetor. If gas was feeding through, we'd get the smell of it. Yeah, better check the tank. Get a stick or something to shove in here for measuring, will you? You bet. This branch ought to do. Yeah, it's good enough. Give it here. She empty? Dry as a WCTU meeting. Well, that'd leave me kind of stuck. Well, I got a siphon hose from the trunk. We can drain enough out of my tank to get you back to Roma. Is that an all-night station there? No, afraid not. No hotel either. But I can put you up for the night if you don't mind bunking in the jail. What do you mean, jail? I'm the constable. Oh, I see. Well, don't worry, the jail's clean. Come on, let's go get that hose. Well, it's in here someplace if I can find it. You got a match? Ah, you bet. I want to be here someplace. I guess I'll let a lot of junk pile up. I can't hold this match much longer. I'll light another one. Ah. Yeah. That's the last one to book. Huh. Well, you got that hose, haven't you? Well, no point getting snappy about it, stranger. How come you didn't know the gas gauge in your car was busted? Well, it must have just happened, I guess. Seems to me there's a car just like yours on my stolen car list. I hope you got proof of ownership on you. I got it all right. In my pocket, point right square at your body. Huh? Use your head, young fella. Stolen car is a bad charge. But it ain't nearly as bad as using a gun on a peace officer. Now, you better hand that gun over and come with me. <laughs> hmm? Why, you heck, you small town, Rube Cop. <laughs> You're stinking, Rube Cop. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Reach for you. Reach for it. Reach for it so I can kick a face in. Go ahead. Don't be the loco. You can't get away with this. I did that fall from other dumb cops. You never should have told me you're cops, you know. You never should... <laughs> Something coming on your face. Come on, on your face. Get in and blush. Now you look at they stop. You're going to get it right through the face. Hey, hey, you pay off of this. Hey, help. 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 <laughs> Cross country bus. Go on, Pop. Yell. Yell all you want. Try not to yell that motor. Go ahead. <laughs> you... That's too bad, Pop. <laughs> nah, you and me are going to make a trade. Bullet from this gun exchange for your car. What's the matter, Pop? Don't you like it? You'll get caught. They'll get you. Uh, the cop ain't born can take me. 
Come on, Pop. You're going to die. Why don't you crawl a little? Why don't you beg a little? Maybe I'll change my mind. I said... Well, you, could, you could kill me, but you... You ain't scared me. I'll make it easy for you, Pop. But you got to beg me a little. If you don't, I'll give it to you through the kidney. And that ain't nice, Pop. Takes a couple of hours to die that way. And it hurts, Pop. I know I watched a cop die that way once before. You didn't know what he's doing. That's it, Pop. Yeah. Pray louder. Let me hear you. You're the one I'm praying for. You must be crazy. <laughs> praying for me. <laughs> you rude cop. Let's see who you pray for in the next couple of hours. <laughs> it hurts, don't it, Pop? And it's going to get worse. You won't pass out till right near the end. <laughs> Enjoy yourself, copper. Have a good time. Constable Wiley's body was discovered shortly after sunrise when highway patrolmen spotted the stolen vehicle abandoned by the killer. The sheriff was summoned and he called for the help of the Texas Rangers. By noon of Good Friday, Ranger Captain Stinson was at the scene. Accompanied by Ranger Jace Pearson. Wiley didn't die easy, Jace. Look at that. Yeah. Tried to crawl out to the road on a blood trail. Must have been in agony every inch of the way. Do you have any family? An invalid wife, two daughters, and three grandchildren. The man who did this might just as well have shot them, too. They'll feel the same pain Wiley did, only longer. With an alert out for Wiley's car, we might get a break killer may have been spotted in it somewhere along the line. I doubt it. He probably got where he wanted to go and ditched it before sunup. Medical examiner figured Wiley's been dead since about 3 a.m. Must have been shot a couple of hours before that. Gives the killer a good start, all right, Captain. Yeah. Let's get back to the road. We've got one thing going for us, though. Man we're after may have left some prints on the car he abandoned when he took Wiley's. Lab men flew in before we got here. They ought to be coming through with a report soon. Well, Steve Clark is in town waiting for it. He'll bring it out. I want you and Steve to stay on this case until it's cracked. It's one I'd enjoy cracking. Only lead we've got is that the abandoned car was headed west. Well, that's something at least. You and Steve can start off in that direction. Hey, here's Steve now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Howdy, Steve. Howdy, Dave, Captain. You get the lab report? Yeah, Captain. It'll rattle your teeth. Here. Killer's been identified by fingerprints lifted from the car he ditched. While he was killed by Rex Lang. Rex Lang? Rex Lang? Yeah, no doubt about it. The prints were as clear as a bell. There's a copy of Lang's record attached to the report. I don't have to see that. I know it by heart. I wonder how long he's been in Texas. Well, he might have been here for a year or more. Last report on him was when he killed a policeman in Great Falls, Montana. Before that, he pulled jobs in Nebraska, Wyoming, and Iowa. Mm, he's blazed quite a trail. Yes, and I want that trail to end in Texas. It's the first time he's paid us a visit. I want it to be the last. He's not easy to catch. According to that report, he's been jailed only once, Idaho State Reformatory, when he was 16. That's about eight years ago. Yeah, and in that eight years, he's killed six people, four of them peace officers. The first one was the guard at the reformatory. Lang butchered him when he escaped. Look at this record. Look at it. Sent to the reformatory for beating his young brother half to death with a stove poker. Is that Lang's picture clipped on the report? Yeah, a mug shot taken at the reformatory. Well, that'll help us. I don't know, Steve. A big-boned 16-year-old kid. And we're looking for a 24-year-old man. He could have filled out plenty by now. Be hard to recognize. Well, there, there ought to be some description since then. Eh? Ought to be, but there aren't. All the witnesses he's left are dead ones. Is this the complete report? Yeah, that's it, Captain. Oh, except this. Probably doesn't mean anything. The sheriff picked up this empty matchbook that was just lying in back of where Wiley's car was parked here on the shoulder. Lab checked it for prints, but they couldn't pull anything off of it. Well, it might have been thrown from any passing car. Yeah, I guess so. Let me see it. Advertising on the cover. Grand Bowling Alley in Pintado. Pintado's about 70 miles west, Jace. And that's the way the car was headed. He couldn't pick up matches before he got there. Not unless he'd been in Pintado before and was headed back there again when he tripped over Wiley. Well, that's possible. Our trail leads west anyhow. Won't do any harm to check around Pintado when we get there. You're towing a double horse trailer, Jace, so you and Steve might as well ride together. So it's me. I'll load my horse and put him in with charcoal. There's something about Rex Lang it might pay to remember. He was a ladies' man back where he came from, Pocatello, Idaho. All right, boy. Back up. 
Even when he was 14? Yeah, even then. It was a high school girl who smuggled in the knife he used to kill the reformatory guard. And there have been indications that he had a woman lookout with him on burglaries where his prints have been found. I'll get my trailer open for you, Steve. Thanks, Jase. Ah, company for you, Charky. No, you stay in, boy. Now you climb in, boy. Come on, get him. Okay, Jase. I guess we're ready to roll. You'll hear from us, Captain. Uh, Jase, Steve. Yeah. What's the matter, Captain? You both know Lang's record. A killer with a crazy hate for all peace officers. So understand that what I'm going to say now is not in order. If you corner him, you'll have a mad dog on your hands. But I'd like to have him taken alive. That may not be easy, Captain. I know, but Rex Lang has become an idol to young punks and reform school toughs all over the country. Now, if we can put him on trial, convict him in a court of law, and have him executed by the state... It'll show those kids that society is strong enough to stamp him out like a flea. There's nothing glamorous about dying in an electric chair. But if you have to finish him in a fight, he'll still be an idol. He'll say Rex Lang was so tough we couldn't take him, we had to kill him. I understand, Captain. So do I. Now remember, it's not in order. I want both of you back alive, too. That's all. Come on, Steve. Let's go. We headed west, looking for a dangerous kid grown into a dangerous man, with a face we might recognize too late. By midnight, we checked the highway as far as Pintado. In the morning, we started to comb the town, still drawing a blank. That guy at the bowling alley wasn't much help, Chase. Didn't seem to recognize that old picture of Rex Lang. Yeah, Lang may have changed a lot in eight years, but if he made the alleys a hangout, the owner should have... Uh, well, you know, Jace thought the face was a little familiar. Maybe yes, maybe no. Lang was blonde and smooth-skinned as a kid. Hair might have darkened plenty since then, face and frame filled out. And he shaves now, a beard line changes a face. Yeah, yeah, he might have just passed through here and picked up those matches, so maybe they were just thrown out of a passing car. I know. Well, we can't waste too much time on a lead that may be blind. Yeah, how about some breakfast? There's a Mexican place across the street, Lobo's. That's for me. I'm so hungry, I'll even eat enchiladas for breakfast. <laughs> Call this cross. Easter Sunday tomorrow, Jace. Wish I could be home with the wife and kids. I even forgot to order flowers. Oh, why are the captain? you will have some sense of the house for you. Yeah, didn't even think of that. Buenos dias, senores. Buenos dias. Howdy. Let's take the boot, Jace. I'm tired eating on the couch. What can I get for you, senores? It is menu. I have everything. Uh, fruit juice, a couple of scrambled eggs, easy with bacon, coffee and toast. Si, senor. Mm. Let's see. Buenos dias, senorita. I will be with you in a moment. You bet. Here I am starving. I don't even know what I want. Say, why don't you wait on the lady while I'm thinking it over? Of course, senor. Take your time. I thought you were hungry enough to eat enchiladas for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, the man double-crossed me. He gave me a choice. I just want a container of coffee to go, Lobo. Jason, you want a glass? No, creamy sugar. Well, I guess I'll just double your order, Jace. Now, uh, what's the move when we leave here? I haven't figured it yet. You want me to put it in a sign? You bet. How much? You know, Jace, maybe we should go back. Wait a minute, Steve. Here you are. Huh? Sit tight, Steve. Oh, ma'am. Just a minute. You speaking to me, Ranger? Yes, ma'am. I happened to look out of the booth and saw you. Don't I know you from someplace? I don't think so. You sure look familiar. You live here in Pintado? You bet. I must have met you the last time I was through here, about two years ago. Now, you're a mistake, Range. I've only been here six weeks. Oh, well, where'd you come from before that? Fort Worth. That's your hometown? You bet. <laughs> That's one on me. You sure did look familiar. Excuse me, please. You bet. You have the wrong senorita, no? Maybe. Grab your hat, Steve. Why? What was that all about? Uh, something hit me when she was talking. Notice how she kept saying, you bet? Yeah, what about it? That reformatory report about Lang. The part about his habits. You bet was his favorite expression. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jace. Lang may have changed, but I doubt if he's turned into a girl. <laughs> no. But she picked up that expression someplace, Steve, from somebody who uses it regularly. And it could be Lang. Well, it's as good a lead as that matchbook, Jace. It's worth following. I think so, too. Come on. Let's see where she's taking that coffee. You 
You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Breakdown, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We followed the girl, hoping she was taking the coffee to Rex Lang. The hope exploded less than two blocks from Lobo's Cafe when she turned into the doorway of a jewelry store, not far from where my car was parked. Doesn't look like the sort of place we'd find Lange in, Jace. And she went into the back of the store. Look through that corner of the window. Yeah. And there's the container of coffee on that bench right beside the watch repairman. Mm-hmm. And she must have brought it in for him. Guess he's the boss. Looks that way. And he can't be Lang. He must be 60 or more. Jace, get back a little. What is it? She came out of the back. She's behind the counter now. And she's working there then. Let's not take any chances on being spotted. Drift back this way a little. Yeah, that's good enough. She'd have to come out to see us now. Got to keep a tag on her. If she's Lang's girl, she'll lead us to him. Well, even if she is his girl, no telling how often he sees her. He's hot and must be hiding out someplace. We could burn up a week or two and then find out we're sending our dogs at the wrong tree. We won't waste any time. Not if we can get some information about her. I'm going to get to a phone. You stay right here on this block, though. Walk the corner with me. Yeah. Jace, if she was Lang's girl, why should she be working? If she was working in the laundry, that's a question I couldn't answer. But I can think of a good reason why she might be working in a jewelry store. Case it for Lang to knock it over? It's been done before. I'm going to have headquarters check back on some jobs Lang's pulled before. See what you can find out along the street here. She's a mighty pretty girl, so it's a safe bet she's been noticed by other storekeepers along here. Maybe one of them knows her name and where she lives. Chase, we don't want to tip our hand by asking too many questions. Don't make them sound like official questions. Make them sound like you're just another man who's seen a pretty girl. Okay, okay. But you ever mention this to my wife and you and me are going to tag her. (laughs) Get going. I'll make my call and meet you at the car later. I called my headquarters and gave Captain Stinson a description of the girl we were tagging and a list of information I wanted was less than two hours later when he called me back. It looks like you may have hit something with that girl, Jace. I made a few phone calls and got answers that fit. Well, what are they? Fingerprint records from out of state show that Lang's burglaries in the past included a jewelry store, a check cashing agency, and a private home where the owner was in the habit of keeping plenty of cash in the safe. Girl fit into those cases? Yes. A girl answering the description you gave worked at all three places. Only thing that varies in description is the color of her hair. In each case, she quit her job a few months before the actual burglary. That's the modus operandi I've been looking for. Well, if it was the same girl in each case, she always changed her name. Well, that's as easy as dyeing her hair. It all fits. If you're right, Jace, you're getting mighty close to Lang. That's where we want to be. Thanks, Captain. You'll hear from me. Jace, maybe I'd better send you a couple of more men. That'd only give Lang a couple of more targets. Bye, Captain. <laughs> The girl was shaping up like the extra joker in a poker game. By the time I got back to Steve Clark, he had a rundown on her. The name she was using in Pintado was Jojo Deering. That night, the stores were open late for the last-minute Easter shoppers, but finally the lights went out. We followed the girl to her home and staked out to wait. Five minutes later, she came out again. Hey, Jace, look. She's changed her clothes. Yeah. Wearing jeans and a jacket now. Yeah, but why? I don't know. She's moving for her car. I'll let her stay about a block ahead. Don't want to tag her too close with this horse trailer behind us. Right. Yeah, she's pulling out now. So are we. Steve, I got a feeling we're moving in for the finish. Why? The way she's dressed. Not the way she'd dress for a date in town, but it is the way she'd dress to go to Lang if he was holed up in some off-trail spot. Works during the week, goes off to meet him on Saturday nights. Yeah, Jace, it adds. We'll know soon enough. She's turning for the highway out of town. Looks like a long trip, Chase. Hey, hey, where is she? Took a turn off up ahead. You reach in the back and get a Tommy gun. The captain said he wanted Lang alive, remember? I know. If we have to stop that car later, she picks Lang up. I want to make sure we can put it out of commission. Okay. Hey, we're crying out loud, Jay. Oh, sorry, Steve. Sharp turn off there. Grab a look at the map. Where does this road lead? I don't need the map. This is State 61. 
Nothing down here for more than a hundred miles except for a few run-down Mexican settlements. I'm going to cut off my headlights. This road gets kind of rough, Jase. Can't help it. I can follow her taillight without her knowing we're behind her. Yeah, you're right. Odd anything comes through here, she'd scare in a minute. But she'll roll a lot easier if we weren't dragging that horse trailer. I got a feeling we may need it. No need for her changing her clothes like she did if she's going to stay in the car. Any place in here where she could pick up a horse? Yeah, about ten more miles. Ranch owned by an old Mexican woman. All she's got is a couple of horses. Can you think of any place near there where Lang might be hiding out? Yeah, yeah, about three or four miles back in the hills. Used to be a mine there. A couple of them, in fact. They're abandoned, Jase. Isn't there a road to the mines? No, nothing but a rough burrow trail. It's tough country to get into. If Lang's there, it's going to be tough country for him to get out of. Just before we reached the old Mexican ranch, we let the girl's car pull out of sight. We parked for ten minutes, then drove to the ranch. Her car was there, all right, almost hidden in a clump of brush behind the barn. And there was a fresh horse trail leading into the hills. We unloaded our horses and followed it. Only about another half mile to the mines, Jase. She's heading right for them, all right. Something about this that bothers me, Steve. What's that? She stuck to the burrow trail all the way. That's just what I don't like. The only approach in Lang wouldn't be at the end of a clear trail unless he had some way of guarding it. You mean he might have an ambush staked out along here? man who hasn't been caught or even described in eight years doesn't leave his guard down. I don't know. He can't stay awake 24 hours a day. Reckon not. Hey, wait a minute. Hold up. Whoa, whoa, Charky. Whoa, boy, whoa. See something, Chase? Yeah. This brush at the side of the path's been trampled not long ago either. Just bobbing back into its natural position. Horse was waiting in there, and now we got two sets of tracks on the path. Well, that means he expected the girl. Waited here to meet her. Looks that way. Better get down and lead your horse. Right. Come on, boy. Ah, come on, Charlie. Why did he come down to meet her? He didn't have to show her the way. They're still sticking to the path. I don't know. In one way, I wish the moon was a little fuller. And in another way, I'm glad it isn't. Hey, hold it. Huh? Well, hey, they left the trail here. Brush is disturbed again. The tracks turn in there. Come on. This is funny, Jace. We're following their movements through the brush, and we're just making a little half circle right back to the burrow trail. And look here. We're right back on the path. You suppose he made that little half circle just to leave a blank spot in the tracks? A blank spot of less than 20 yards? Isn't likely. Must have had some reason. Let's leave the horses for a second. Let's go back along the path and find out why he cut away from it. Right. Move slow and keep your eyes peeled. Nothing that seems out of line. Huh? Stop. Look at this branch overhanging the path. Just a branch? Why, hey, Jace can barely see it. A piece of string running from the end of the branch to that tree on the opposite side of the path. Don't touch it. Let's see where it leads. Look at that. Yeah. Sawed off shotgun strapped to the tree. That string is tight around the trigger. Gun probably has enough scatter shot and slugs in it to kill an elephant. No wonder he met her to steer her around this. Chase, look at the way that gun is sighted. Anybody on a horse who moved that branch get a charge right through the middle. Anybody on foot who moved it probably get it right through the head. Hey, you were right, Chase. He wasn't planning on taking any chances. A rat. Anybody could be killed by this thing. A rancher, some kid riding through... You don't think that'd make any difference to Lang, do you? What a death trap. A death trap that's going to backfire on him. This is the thing we use to take him, Steve. When this goes off, he'll come running to see what he's got. You have another gun, he'll still fight. He won't get a chance if we work it right. I'm going to pull the trigger on this thing, then let out a scream. Plant myself out there on the burrow path. You stay here in the brush. Then what? Just be patient. Don't move, no matter how long it takes for him to get here. He'll come plenty slow trying to make sure that whatever he hits alone... And when he finds me lying out there, fire your gun and startle him. But keep your fire high. J.C. might pump a slug into you while you're flat on your back. Not if we time it right. But don't fire until he's close enough for me to jump him. You better get the horses and time off down the trail a ways. You'll have time. Say, Jace, how about a toss to see who stakes out on the path? Why should you take the chance? Why not me? Because you forgot to wire the captain about that Easter plan for your wife and kids. Get going after the horses and then get back here. Well, good luck, Jace. Good luck to both of us, Steve. I planted 
myself in the path and waited. I could feel myself breaking into a sweat as cold as the ground. Even if he thought I was dead, a crazy, hate-ridden killer like Lang might waste one more bullet. A half hour passed. An hour. And then we heard him coming. Slowly, like a cat. Watch where I step, Rudy. I can't help it, Rex. I'm scared. You want like a cop with a gun in his back? Shut up. Right near here, wasn't it? Can't you see anything yet? You bet. You bet I see something. Look at that. Look at the moon on him. It's a ranger. Rex. A ranger. A soldier. Be careful. I was the one you told me about, but you were so smart. You said it didn't mean anything. You stupid getting followed here. Oh, please. Rex, don't hit me again, please. You bet, honey. <laughs> if you ever slip again, I'll make you an honorary cop. Now, come on. I'll show you what you get. I'll demonstrate on him. I wish he was alive to feel what I'm going to show you. Oh, no, Rex. Don't make me look, please. <laughs> Now look at it. Look. Imagine what a bullet could do to that pretty face of yours. I got him, Steve! Let go of that gun, Rex. Drop it, I said. I'll kill you with my hand. All right. Here's your chance to try. Get the gun, George. Get it. You want to get up, try again, Rex? Or is that enough? No, no. I come. I come with you. Tell that couple together, Jason. Yeah. It'd be a shame to split such a lovely couple. I guess this isn't the kind of brace that you were after, Jojo, but it'll have to do. All right, Rex, hold out your wrist. Yeah, that does it, Jason. Yeah. Well, let's get started. It's just midnight. After we get him in, a fast drive ought to get you home by morning and... Give you a chance to pick up that Easter plant. Not only that, I'll be on time to go to church with the kids. You going? Borrow a couple of words from Rex. You bet. as an accessory in the many crimes committed by Rex Lang, Jojo Deering was convicted and sentenced to a 50-year term in the women's prison at Gory. Lang tried for the murder of Constable Wiley, slobbered and pleaded for mercy, but the jury gave no heed to his pleas as the prosecution brought his vicious record to light. Found guilty of murder in the first degree, Lang was sent to Huntsville Penitentiary, where on the morning of November 4th, 1938... He died in the electric chair. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Byron Kane, Herb Ellis, and Betty Lou Gerson. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on facts. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record.
Case for tonight, pressure. It is 11 p.m. a Saturday night in January 1933. Sheriff Russ Morton drives his car to the end of the well-lighted main street of Lingwood, Texas, and turns onto a narrow wooden bridge that crosses the railroad yards and leads to the Negro quarter of town on the far side of the tracks. In the car with the sheriff is his deputy, Sam Billings. Both men are uneasy. Doesn't look like there's much doing across the tracks, Sam. I don't get it, Sheriff. I was over here less than an hour ago, and the cafes was packed so thick you couldn't stir them with a stick. No. Who sent out to call for us? Pedro at the Cantina Cafe. I didn't get half of what he said. He sounded scared to death. Just kept yelling to come get old Lucifer out of his place. Hmm. Old Lucifer? No. Can't imagine him stirring up no trouble. Oh, no, neither can I, but... Sam, I I don't like the look of this. Mm. There isn't a light shown in the whole quarter. Not even in shack or shanty. Might have been a knife in, Sheriff. Oh, a knife in might, might make one place go dark, but not all of them. Cantina's off left, off the next street. Yeah. Nobody on the streets. Not even a dog in the prowl. If old Lucifer is behind this, he sure sent everybody running for cover. Now, how can an old man like... Sheriff, look. Huh? Cantina ain't open either. Guess Pedro got old Lucifer to leave without waiting for our help. Yeah, then closed up tighter than a drum. Why? I can't figure it. What are we going to do now? We're going to find out what's wrong over here. Keep your eyes peeled. I'm going to comb these streets until we find a light or somebody stirring. Better reach over and back and get that shotgun. Right. Never saw nothing like this before, Sheriff. Neither have I. There's... Throw the spotlight on, Sheriff. That doorway over there. Oh, it's old Lucifer. Yeah. Stand right where you are, Lucifer. Don't move. Look! Look at him, Sheriff. Something all over his shirt and his pants and his hands. Yeah, no need to look at him twice. It's blood. What happened to you, Lucifer? What's the matter over here? It's my doing, Mr. Sheriff. All my doing. Ain't nobody to blame but me. You got blood all over you. And it doesn't look like it's your own. Who are you fighting with? Somebody in Pedro's place tried to jump you? No, sir. I ain't had no trouble with nobody here. Had my trouble out to the farm where I work. Out of the farm? Yes, sir. I just walked into town a little while ago, trying to get up my nerve to turn myself in. Sheriff, I I killed Mr. Redford. I shot him dead. What? You killed your boss, Mike Redford? Yes, sir. I done it, just me. We got to arguing and I shot him dead. No wonder there ain't a light on over here. You can tell us the rest of it at the jail, Lucifer. Right now, you better get in my car fast before this news crosses the tracks. Yes, sir. We're in for trouble, Sheriff. Mike Redford's been mighty popular around here. Yeah. Get in back, Lucifer. Get down on the floor and stay there. Yes, sir. I'm going to drop you off on Main Street, Sam. Round up the constable and a couple of other deputies. Get them to jail as fast as you can. We may be able to keep this quiet until tomorrow. If we can, it'll give me a chance to get a few Texas Rangers in to give us a hand. The news of Mike Redford's murder struck the town on the afternoon of the following day. But by that time, Sheriff Morton had help. He was joined at the Lingua Jail by Texas Ranger Jace Pearson. Uh, here's Lucifer's confession if you want to see it, Jace. He made a full statement when he brought him in last night. Mm. Pretty short statement. Yeah, short and to the point. Says he had it in for Redford for a long time. Made up his mind to settle it last night. Went up the house, started to fight, and shot him. These uh, are the clothes Lucifer was wearing. Blood all over them. Have yeah, the blood analyzed? Yeah. Medical examiner did it when the J.P. ordered an autopsy. It matches Redford's blood type, all right. We ought to have a full autopsy report in an hour or so. Uh, Captain Stinson ought to be here by then. Good. I got my deputies posted around, but uh, extra hands will be a help in case of trouble. Mm, town looks peaceful enough. Mm, news hasn't been out long. We couldn't keep it quiet after the medical examiner had the body brought in the funeral home, though. Where are you keeping Lucifer? Oh, that's him in the bunk in the cell, back at the end of the block there. No other prisoners? I had them all moved up into the tank upstairs. Good idea. A statement says Lucifer worked on the Redford farm all his life. Yeah. Yeah, started there when Mike's grandfather owned the place and just stayed on. Old Lucifer must have gone crazy or something, Jace. He's had a good home out there. 
Then he turns and bites the hand that feeds him. That's happened before. I know, but... Uh... Uh, Lucifer never gave you any trouble before this, you said. No, no, nothing. But unless you want to count a little row he got in the last summer, didn't amount to much. What was it? Oh, Lucifer hit somebody with a shovel. Some wandering farmhand that worked out at Redford for a few days. Him and Lucifer were cleaning out a pig pen, it seems, and this migratory started cussing Mike Redford. Lucifer told him to shut up. The guy wouldn't, so Lucifer clipped him with a shovel. That's the way the story come out when they brought Lucifer up before the judge. Judge fined him $25, and Redford paid the fine for him and took the old man home. Sounds like Redford and old Lucifer were pretty close. Oh, Redford always treated him square. What you just told me doesn't fit in with this statement you got from Lucifer last night. What do you mean? Last summer, he hit a migratory for cussing Redford. Yeah. But look here. On page two of this statement, Lucifer says, I had a grudge in for Mr. Redford ever since his pappy died, and he come to be my boss eight years ago. I didn't like him, and I made up my mind I'd kill him. It doesn't fit, does it? If this statement were true, Lucifer wouldn't have been up before a judge for defending Redford last summer. Howdy, James. Took your horse out of the trailer and wanted him. Thanks, Sam. Sheriff Lucifer's grandson, Chad's out in the hall. Wants to know if he can see the old man. Uh, just for a minute, please, Mr. Sheriff. Well, I guess it won't hurt none. Come on. Thank you. Got a visitor for you, Lucifer. Grandson, Chad. No. Please, don't let him in. I don't want to see him. Don't want to see nobody. Grandpa, we got to get you a lawyer or something. I don't want nothing. You go home. Don't talk to me. You just have home and stay there. Make him go, Sheriff. Make him go. You know you ought to go. That old man may be right. I don't want to see you no how. Don't ever come here again. But, but Grandpa, you got Never mind, Chad. Never mind. You get out like you said and go home. Come on. Sam, you'd better drive him out of town. Let him cut across the fields and through the hills to his place, but see that he stays off the highway when you leave him. Okay, Sheriff. Go ahead, Chad. Yes, sir. Where does he live, Chad? Up in the hills, about four miles behind Redford. I'd like to take a ride out to Redford's place. If there is going to be any trouble here, it won't come before dark. Besides, I'd like to talk to Chad. I'm going to catch Sam and ride with him. Yeah, I'll uh, see if I can stop him from the window. Sam! Yes, Sheriff? Wait a minute. Ranger's going to ride out with you. Okay. He's waiting, Jace. There's a deputy guard in the place out there, making sure nothing's touched until we get photographed. Good. Thanks. Mr. Ranger, what are you going out there for? I told the sheriff everything, sir. No need for you to be going out there. Maybe there's no need for you being behind those bars either, Lucifer. I'd like to make sure. Noticed a few peculiar marks on Chad's face in the sheriff's office, and in the car I got a chance to see him close up. They looked like scratch marks, and the edge of a dirty bandage showed beneath the frayed cuff of his shirt. You took a full chance walking into town, Chad. People are mighty hot about Redford getting killed. My grandpa wouldn't never kill him. One who'd know that best is your grandpa. He says he did kill him. Came in with Redford's blood over him. Yeah. An awful lot of Redford's blood, judging by the clothes the sheriff is holding. Where were you last night, Chad? I was home, back in the hills. Anybody with you who can verify that? I said, was anybody with you? Uh, no, I was alone. What do you mean, alone? Ain't your wife there? Wasn't she with you? Well, I wasn't at the shack. I was just around it. Doing what? Just walking around, that's all. Is that how your face got scratched up, walking around in the dark? One of your eyes looks kind of puffy, too, like you got hit. I got that... Chopping wood. A piece of kindling flew up and hit me. A piece of kindling hit you on the wrist, too? Pull that sleeve of your shirt up. I gotta cut that, that's all, just a cut. How'd you get it? Come on, Chad. Your place is only a mile up behind Redford's. Were you on the Redford place at all yesterday? Sure. But not last night. Only in the afternoon. What were you doing there? I just went by to see my grandpa, that's all. About what? To give to Linda some money. He give it to you? No. Why not, Chad? You've been mooching on the old man for years. He never turns you down for anything. Why didn't he give you the money? Because Mr. Redford, he saw us talking and he come out the house. He told Grandpa not to give me it. He said I was no counter. I'd be earning my own and not buying from old man. Mr. Redford, he ain't never like me. Told me to get off the place. And I didn't want no trouble, so, so I got and you just walked around in the hills near your house without going inside where your wife could see you, huh? I don't like the smell of that story, Chad. Maybe you never left Redford's place. I did, I tell you. Honest, Mr. Sam, Mr. Ranger, my wife can tell you that. I did go home last night for a minute. 
I left the house because me and my wife had a fight. Hmm. Nothing new about that. She got mad when I didn't bring no money back. We went round and round. She throwed something at me, and I hit her, and she scratched me up and cut my arm with a bread knife. That's when I run out. You didn't go back to Redford's after that? No, sir. I swear, I never did go back. Uh, here's the best place for you to get out, Chad. Got anything else you want to ask him, Jace? No. All right, Chad. You can go. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just wondering if the old man couldn't be covering up for him. You think he was lying about that fight with his wife? Could be. Oh, his women does have a temper. They had it out hot and heavy before. How does he make a living back in the hills? Well, he don't. They live in an abandoned shack up there. He couldn't pay rent no place, and he ain't worth his salt. When he first got married, he tried to move his woman and himself into Lucifer's place, but Redford wouldn't have it, no how. If anybody was toting a grudge against Redford, I'd bet on Chad, not old Lucifer. It's a cinch somebody was toting one, or Redford wouldn't be dead. <laughs> Lucifer's actions hadn't fit into the usual crime pattern. And when we got to the Redford house, the pattern became even more jumbled. Except for the body having been moved, everything was left as the sheriff had found it. The body was laying right here, Jace. You can see the stain on the rug. Yeah. Furniture knocked around. Must have been quite a fight. A broken bottle over here. Yeah, sheriff figured that's what finally knocked Redford out. Then he got shot while he was out cold. What made the sheriff so sure of that? Well, the body... Bullet fired right into the head from close up. Burns on the face. And no blood around except that, that one spot on the floor. And those handprints Lucifer left on the furniture and the wallpaper. Those handprints are what bother me most. Why? If Lucifer shot Redford, why didn't he just back off and get out of here? How'd he get blood all over him? And why'd he smear it all over everything like a kid with a ten-cent tube of red paint? Yeah, I see what you mean. does seem like it was kind of deliberate. You think an old man like Lucifer could have wrecked half this room fighting a younger man like Redford? Ranger, I guess the sheriff and me didn't think of a lot of things. Now that you're pointing them out. No, it's not your fault. You thought you had a clear case and a confession. That makes it easy to overlook things. Young fellow like Chad might have put up quite a fight with Redford. What about the gun Redford was killed with? Well, we haven't got it. Lucifer said he threw it into some bushes on the way into town. Couldn't tell us where. Weapon might have been a thirty-two or thirty-eight. Autopsy will tell us when we get to Slug. All right. Let's get back to town. If the old man is covering up for his grandson, how are we going to break him down if he keeps on... Wait a minute, Sam. Hmm? Look at this. On the cupboard. What? Two whiskey glasses. Yeah. And both of them full. Ring on the wood here shows where the bottle was standing. Looks like Redford poured two drinks, one for himself and one for somebody else. But they didn't get to drink them. Fight probably started before they got a chance to bend elbows. We know the bottle is used to knock Redford out. Hey, that kicks a hole in what we've been thinking. A big hole. Who was Redford drinking with? It's a cinch it wasn't Chad. Redford ordered him off the place. An old man's confession must be on the level. No, it isn't, Sam, because it's not likely Redford would have been having loose friend for a drink either. There was somebody else here. Somebody who either killed Redford or saw who did. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Pressure, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. Sam and I headed back for town. The streets were crowded but quiet the way they should be on a Sunday afternoon. But there was a tension we could feel. We made one stop at the funeral parlor for a look at Redford's body. The medical examiner was just finishing. Now you can see, like I said, the bullet was fired from close up. Yeah. What'd you find, Doc? Well, he'd been struck on the head with blunt object and shot through the brain at close range. I had the bullet here. You want that, of course? Please. There you are. Thanks. Thirty-two twenty caliber. I'd give a lot to get my hands on the gun this came out of. Lucifer said he ditched the gun. Yeah, Lucifer said a lot of things. 
The slugs flattened out plenty. Usually so. I notice, eh? There's something else to notice, too. On the body, the burned area around the wound. Well, what, what about it? Ought to be some powder grains buried in the flesh, but there aren't. None that I can see. None that I can see either. How about that, Doc? No. No, it is an unusual wound. When Lucifer told you he threw the gun away, did he mention what kind of a gun, Sam? Mm. No, why? Because this may give us a chance to trip him up. This bullet didn't come from a small weapon. It came from a thirty-two twenty caliber rifle. Well, how can you tell that without a ballistic check? Well, for one thing, the way the slugs flattened out. Rifle has a couple of hundred pounds greater impact than a sidearm. Yeah, and plowing through a skull had flattened it plenty. Yeah, but there's another thing about a close-range rifle shot. It leaves a burn, but no powder grains in the skin. A revolver will leave powder grains every time. That makes sense, Doc? Yes, yes, it does. With a the revolver, the explosion of the powder on the shell is only a couple inches away from a point-blank target. But with a rifle, well, there's the length of the barrel, you know. Here. Here's my report if you're headed for the sheriff's office. We'll drop it off for you. So long. So long, Doc. Goodbye. I'm learning a lot as we go along here, James. There's still something we both got to learn. Who killed Mike Redford? There were a couple of ranger cars outside the jail when we got there. Men from my company were standing casually at points along the street. They weren't as casual as they looked. Jail was carefully circled and they commanded all approaches. Captain Stinson was inside with the sheriff. Grace... The sheriff tells me you're not satisfied with Lucifer's confession. That's right, Captain. How about bringing Lucifer out here for a minute, Sheriff? Sure thing. Things are going to start blowing around here after sundown, Jason. I know it. I felt it all the way through town. All it needs is some hothead to start it off. Well, if it starts, we'll stop it. Well, maybe there won't be no trouble. Mm, town's pretty crowded, Sam. With a lot of cars coming in. Come out here, Lucifer. Well, yeah, town's stop always it. crowded on Sunday. They're not ganging up any place. Well, that can come later. But there's one sign of trouble you can't ignore. Take a look out that window. There's not a woman in sight all the way down Main Street. The men are coming in alone. Here he is, Jase. Thanks, Sheriff. Lucifer, you said you killed Redford and then threw the gun away. That's the honest truth, Mr. Ranger. Where'd you throw it? I don't remember, sir. Was it a gun like this one in my holster? Well, was it? Maybe. Guns look all the same to me. Oh, was it about the size of this one? All guns are about that size, sir. Not all guns, Lucifer. You're not telling me the truth. Because Redford wasn't killed with this kind of a gun. He was killed with a rifle. You're covering up for Chad. No, sir, no, sir. Chad had nothing to do with it. It was me, just me. Listen to me, Lucifer. You think Chad killed Redford, but I don't. If you want to help him, open up and tell the truth. Oh, Chad couldn't have done it. He left the place when Mr. Redford ran him off. Honest, I see him leave. Then what happened? I went to my house. And after it got dark, there was a shot, a gunshot. It came from Mr. Redford's house. I left my place, run over to see if anything was wrong, and... and... <laughs> Redford was dead when you found him. Then how did he get blood all over him, Jase? He'll tell you, Sheriff. Go on, Lucifer. I lift him a little to hold his head in my lap. I beg him to talk to me, to say something to old Lucifer. I known him since he was a little boy. Watched him grow. <laughs> But when you found him there, you thought Chad had sneaked back to kill him, huh? I didn't know what to think. Why should you cover up for no good like Chad? He's my own flesh, Sheriff. Yeah. Blood is thicker than water. How do you know Chad isn't the killer, Jace? <laughs> Two full whiskey glasses indicated that Redford was drinking with the man who killed him. And he wouldn't be drinking with Chad, Sheriff. It ain't the... Come in. Howdy, Sheriff. Yeah. Sam, Rangers. How are you doing? What's on your mind, Flam? Well, some of the men have been talking around town, Sheriff. They sort of appointed me to come up and see you. Well, you've just been to the funeral home to see Mike Redford. What's left of him? Mike was my neighbor and pretty good friend, too. That would you come to tell me, Flam? No, not exactly. Looks like you're expecting some trouble, and some of us thought we'd like to volunteer to help you. We could take over the guard trick on jail for tonight so you and the Rangers can get some rest. You can go back and tell the boys we're not tired, Flam. And while you're at it, tell them Lucifer didn't kill Redford. Words around that Lucifer confessed, Ranger. It was a mistake, Mr. Flam. What I said wasn't true. Well, fine. Then you don't have to stay here, Lucifer. Why don't you go home, back to Redford's farm? He's staying here. Why, if he got nothing to hold him on? Protective custody. 
And that means just what it says, Flam. He'll be protected. You can go now. All right, Sheriff. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Flam. Yeah, Captain? If you should see any men around who look like they're fixing to start some trouble, do us a favor. And do them a favor, too. Tell them to go home. Sure, Captain. I'll tell them. Sam, lock Lucifer up again, will you? Sure. Come on, Lucifer. Yes, sir. Flam looks like he may be the man who sparked that crowd. Yeah. Flam and Redford were mighty close. Sheriff, we've got to move Lucifer out of the county for safekeeping. If Flam gets a mob stirred up at night, anything can happen, and a few people are liable to get killed. He's safer in here than he'd be if we took him outside. Not if they fire this building. We'll move him right after sundown. How? Where? Seems to me the best place would be some small town lockup across the county line where nobody'd know him and nobody'd think of looking for him. That's what I had in mind. Sam? Yeah, Captain? Get Jace's horse, Charcoal, out of his trailer. Pick up two more horses and take them all to the field south of town. Hobble them and stash the saddles away under cover so you'll know where they are later. Okay. After you leave them, on the way back, you can drop the word that we're moving Lucifer out of here tonight. You mean you want the whole town to know it? They won't know as much as they'll think they know, Sheriff. After dark, you and I can make a run in my car. They'll figure we're moving Lucifer, and they'll all make a run to block us. Meanwhile, Jace and Sam can slip him out the back and make for the horses in the field. After that, Jace, it's up to you. It's 11 miles cross-country to Hills Crossing. There's a lock up there. See that nobody stops you from getting him to it. We waited until dark without turning on a light in the building. Then Captain Stinson, the sheriff, took one of the deputies covered with a blanket and made a run for the captain's car, while Sam and I took Lucifer out the back. We ran across the field where the horses had been left and began to saddle them. Listen! Sounds like the sheriff and your captain have hit trouble, Jace. Probably somebody tried to block the road and kept scaring them off. Hurry with that last Yeah, ready to go, Jace. After I take this one hobble off. Good. Come on, Lucifer. I'll give you a boost. Yes, sir. Here's charcoal, Jace. Ready to run. Thanks. Steady, boy. You set, Sam? As soon as I get mounted, no more shooting. No. Captain discourages them quick. Yeah, but by now that crowd may know they ain't got Lucifer in the car. Too late to do them any good. This is going to be a rough ride for you, Lucifer. Let us know if you want to slow up or stop. I'll be all right, sir. Good. Let's ride. Up, Chark. Get up, boy. Come on. Just hang on the horn, Lucifer. Yes, yeah, sir. Come on, boy. Up. When we got to Hill's Crossing, the town was dark and sleeping, except for a couple of rangers who'd been sent down to take over guarding Lucifer. Once he was safe under lock and key, Sam and I started the ride back to Lingua. Hey, you're cutting the wrong way, James. We should turn down that valley to Lingua. I know it. We're not heading back for town yet. I want to make one more stop. Where? Back to Redford Farm again? That's not much out of the way. Getting Lucifer safe was only part of the job. we still got to find out who killed Redford. That means we've got to find out who was drinking with him. If there was anybody. Lucifer said Redford didn't have any visitors yesterday. He said he didn't see any visitors. That doesn't prove anything. He'd have been sure to see a car if one had driven in. His shack's near the farm road. He, even if he'd been inside, he'd have heard it. Maybe the visitor didn't use the road. Might have come in on foot or mounted from another side of the farmhouse. I guess that could be all right. Probably put his horse in the barn or the back corral. That'd keep Lucifer from knowing anybody was in the house. There's an the old wagon road the other side of that grove of trees we're coming to. We'll have easier riding once we get over there. Hold it, Sam. Huh? Ooh, whoa, Charky. Oh, boy. Hey, what's the... Shh. Listen. Hounds. And they're on trail. Look, over there in the hill. Hey, something's on fire. Jace, that's right up behind Redford's place. Isn't that where Lucifer's grandson, Chad, lives? Yeah. What do you suppose is going on up there? Somebody wants blood. They didn't get it from Lucifer, so they're running down his family. Come on. Up, Chuck. Up, yeah. boy. That shack is really flaming, Jace. They trapped him in there. He's had it. They haven't got him yet. Those dogs are still after something. Keep going. <laughs> We raked our horses all the way. We'd been about a mile off when the blaze started. When we reached the shack, it was a flaming heap on the ground. We saw a woman staring at it in a daze. She must have been Chad's wife. She wasn't harmed, so we took off after the sound of the dogs. Listen to that, Jase. They got Chad treated. They wouldn't sound off like that. Yeah, they just threw this thicket. All right. Just throw a feet on that tree and rake it till he falls. No, no, Mr. Flam. I ain't done nothing. 
Hold it, Slam. You and whoever's with you. Oh, boy. Who? who? Mr. Razor, he's trying to kill me. Nobody's going to kill you, Chad. You men, grab your hounds and shut them up. You're all under arrest, and that includes you, Flam. What for? We were just doing a little night hunting. The dogs treat Chad here by mistake. The dogs didn't set fire to his shack, and arson's a crime. Look, Ranger, he killed my neighbor. Yeah. Why'd you switch to him? Because you couldn't get your hands on old Lucifer? They were in it together. Redford ordered Chad off a place yesterday. Did you tell him that, Chad? No, sir. I didn't tell nobody but you. And you didn't get it from Lucifer, Flam, because you never got near him. So how do you know? Who told you Redford chewed him out? Nobody had to tell me. I was visiting Radford at the house. He saw Chad on a place and went out and ordered him off. But after I left, him or the old man sneaked in and killed Mike. Throw that rifle over here, Flam. Why? Never mind why. Just throw it over. And be careful how you throw it. We're willing to leave here peaceful. Just a hunting weapon. A thirty-two twenty hunting weapon. Just like the one that killed Mike Redford. For the last time, Flam... Throw it over. Come and get it. Hands off those guns, the rest of you. That's better. Now gather in and pick up your pal, Flam. You followed him out here, you can tote him back. You hit me. I'm hurt bad. Yeah, you just winged. It's a better break than you gave Redford when you killed him. It was self-defense. I killed him in self-defense. Sure. While he was knocked out after you hit him with that whiskey bottle. Should have finished your drink, Flam. You'll never see another glass of whiskey as expensive as that one. Jack Flam confessed to the murder of Mike Radford. His statement disclosed that the killing had been the result of an argument over ownership of a strip of land between his farm and Radford's. Flam was sentenced to life imprisonment. Four other men convicted of armed participation in the attempted lynching of old Lucifer and his grandson Chad were given prescribed terms in the county jail. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. There are thousands of people living today who have survived only because of the Red Cross. These people will never have to be reminded of its great service to humanity. But this year, the Red Cross drive has fallen short of its needed goal. So give to the Red Cross, won't you? And invest in humanity. Good night, folks. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of... The Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Will Wright, Herb Vigran, Ernie Whitman, Roy Glenn, Bill Conrad, and Byron Kane. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murkoff. And the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. This is Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Bad Blood. (laughs) 
It is 7 p.m. September 14, 1950. In an isolated house trailer in the fields on the outskirts of Cheney, Texas, Joe Prager, an aircraft worker, is packing a suitcase. There is a knock on the trailer door. Just a second. Howdy, Joe. Oh, howdy, Russ. Ain't you going to ask me in? Yeah, sure. Come on in. See you packing already. That's right. What's on your mind, Russ? Well, Joe, I figured two weeks is long enough for old friends to be mad at each other. I come to ask you to shake hands. <laughs> you know, now that you're here, I can't figure just what we've been mad about. Ain't anybody I'd rather shake hands with than you, Russ. You're my boy. But we ain't never going to talk politics again. Oh, that's a deal. <laughs> I didn't want you to leave feeling sore at me. Why are you going, anyhow? Why are you pulling out your job, Solid? You're needed here. Well, I didn't want anybody to know about it yet, but looks like I'm needed someplace else, too. Huh? Here, read this. Well, going back in the Army, huh? I didn't know you stayed on the reserve list. I'm on it, all right. You talked to him about this out at the plant. After all, you're married now. You got a kid. You're in essential work. Maybe you could get out of it. I thought about it, Russ, but you know, I don't want to get out of it. I got kind of a funny feeling about it. A feeling I've had ever since the kid was born. Like, well, maybe if I go again now, maybe I can help so he'll never have to go when he grows up. Yeah, I can't argue against that. Not with two boys of my own, one of them pushing 17. Yeah. Ellen and me are plenty worried about him with this Korea thing. Oh, don't let it get you down, Russ. Boy, I'll be all right. <laughs> Say, uh, I was just about to fix me some grub. How about joining me? Oh, thanks, but Ella's expecting me home. Uh, say, where's Marge and the baby, anyhow? Oh, she drove the kid up to her mother's today. I got a week more before I report, and yeah. uh, we sort of figured we'd go away someplace together, just the two of us, you know, till I have to leave. Yeah, well, when are you pulling out of here? Tomorrow, when Marge comes back. Ella, I'd like to see you and Marge before you go. She's been beefing at me ever since you and me fell out. Yeah, Marge's been bulldogging me about it, Well, too. can't you come and have supper with us tomorrow before you go? How about that? Well, that's a deal. Swell. Ella, be tickled. Well, guess I better be getting home with the old pay envelope. You need any help with anything? I mean, we got a few dollars for... No, buy. no, thanks, Russ. We'll get by. Well, good luck to you, fella. We'll see you tomorrow. Hmm? Sure thing, Russ. Say, if they had a draft, somebody, why couldn't they take that brother-in-law of yours? <laughs> Orville? That'd be giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> I know Orville ain't giving any aid and comfort to his department out the plant. If we wasn't short-handed, he wouldn't last ten minutes. Well, good night, Joe. Good night, Russ. <laughs> Just a second. You forget something? Oh, it's you, Orville. Yeah, it's me. Russ was just here. I thought it was him coming back. I know he was here. Been waiting out back long enough, waiting for him to leave. You could have come in. Russ don't buy it. He doesn't like me. Reckon that's your fault, Orville. Oh, sure. Everything's my fault. How come you sticking up for him? Thought you and him wasn't talking. We are now, and I don't think it's any of your business. What do you want, Orville? Joe, I... Need some help. I got my check cashed, and I guess I didn't notice it till I was almost home. I got a hole in my pocket. I lost my pay. Do I look like a half-wit to you? Well, I only want... The last time you came to me with that story, you said your pocket was picked. And the time before that, you said you got stuck with a loan you signed for somebody. That's right, Joe. Honest. Stop using the word honest, Orville. Doesn't sound right coming from you. If your money's gone, you lost it in the pay night crap game at Holland. I haven't been near Holland's in weeks. Oh, Joe, you gotta help me. My wife will buck like a maverick under a brand of nine if I don't bring some money home. You and sis got some side money. I know we have. I ain't denying that, but this is one time you ain't dipping your hand into it. Yeah, take a look at this paper. Go ahead, read it. <laughs> Drafted, huh? Going to play soldier again and leave my sister with a kid to take care of. She and the kid will be taken care of, Orvie. I'll see to that. You never had to give us anything and you never will. Joe, I need money. And I ain't leaving here without it. There's nothing here for you, Orvin. Better try someplace else. I said I wasn't leaving without that money. Well, I reckon you'll be here a long time then, Orvin. You have to excuse me. I'm going to fix my supper. I ain't going to ask you again, Joe. Glad to hear. Just going to keep ignoring me, huh? Like I wasn't even here. That's right. Maybe I can make you pay a little attention with this. <laughs> 
Put that down. No. I'm going to help you dish out your supper like this. I told you I wasn't. I told you, do. I told you. The body of Joe Prager was discovered when his wife returned to their trailer home early the following day. Sheriff Vern Lamont immediately called for the help of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. He joined the sheriff at the scene of the crime shortly after noon. I've kept the whole field blocked off, Jace. Nobody's been near the place except Prager's wife and me and the deputies. Good. Where's the wife? Sitting over there in her car. Tried to get her to go into town to the hotel, but she won't. She's in in kind of a daze. Shock. That's natural. You want to talk to her? Yeah, it wouldn't help when she's like that. Maybe by the time we've had a look around, she'll break down and cry it out, and then we may be able to get something. Let's have a look inside the trailer. Right. There's a body, and there's a murder weapon. Wrought iron frying pan. We'll be able to pull any prints off that. Metal's too coarse. That's why I just let it lay there. Medical examiner estimate the time of death? He figured it was between 6 and 8 o'clock last night. Hmm. Suitcase on the bed, half packed. Prager trying to run away from something? No, I don't think so. Letter on the table here explains it. It was in the Army Reserve. Called back to duty. I see. Where was he working here? Out of the aircraft plant, other side of town. Spot welder. How come his wife didn't report this until this morning? Well, she was away for the night. They got a baby? Baby oil and nipple jar on the dresser there. Yeah, that's why the wife was away. She took the kid to her mother's up in Abilene. Come back this morning. You check on that? First thing. Got a list of eating places. She stopped at both ways, and she gassed up at a mobile station in Abilene last night after she got there. Uh, spots are away from here, all right. Let's check around outside. All right. Will it be okay for the medical examiner to move the body now? Yeah, I think so. How come they parked their trailer out here instead of using one of the parks near town? Save money, I guess. Rents are high with the plant working full blast. Mm, gasoline lamp in the trailer for light, but what'd they do for water? Well, there's a well out back. Used to be a house here some time ago, but it was moved. They had everything they needed to get by. I see. Want to walk out to the road where our cars are? I can send one of the boys into the funeral home to arrange a pickup. All right. Wait a minute, Sheriff. Hmm? Watch your feet. What's the matter? These car tracks up the road to the trailer. Yeah. Prager's own car, I reckon. Same tracks all over the road from coming and going. Uh, different tire pattern and a couple of the soft spots, though. Look here. Yeah. Overlaps most of the older tracks, but Prager's car tracks go over the strange tread once. Right here. Yeah, I see what you mean. Another car must have driven in here after Ms. Prager left yesterday. And that spot is where she drove over the tracks when she came back this morning. It's the way I measure it. And we can pull a cast off that tread. May help us run down the car. Hey... One of your deputies coming up the road now. Well, that isn't one of my boys. Hmm. Why'd they let him in? I don't know. Hey, you! Yeah? How'd you get in here? I come to help my sister. Who is your sister? Marge. Prager's wife. He was my brother-in-law. That's why the deputies let me through. All right. Your sister's sitting in the car back there. Reckon she does need somebody with her at that. Thanks. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, Ranger? Walk along the edge of the road. Stay out of the tire tracks. Why? Because we're asking you to. Isn't that good enough? Well, I only ask you for a reason, that's all. What's your name? Orville James. You work with your brother-in-law? Well, yeah, sure. Out at the plant. Not in the same department, though. How'd you know your brother-in-law had been killed? I didn't know. Until I saw your deputies down by the road, and they told me. Isn't the aircraft plant working today? Yeah, sure it is. It's on the other side of town. What brought you out here now? I got a lift out during lunch to see my sister. That'd just about take your whole lunch hour. And more if you didn't catch a ride back right away. You make a habit of hitchhiking out here on your lunch hour? No, of course I don't. And why'd you do it today? What are you asking me all this for? You trying to pin something on me? Reckon that's going to depend on how you answer. Come on, talk up. Well, I... I just... Well, I wanted to ask her about my mother. I knew that she'd been up home, see, and I wanted to find out how my mother was. I see. Your mother been sick? Yeah. No, no, she, she's been all right, I reckon. And why the rush to get out here this afternoon? Why not tonight, after work? Because I wanted to come, that's all. 
Anything else you want to know? Yes. When did you see your brother-in-law last? I, I don't know. Three, maybe four days ago. Not yesterday? No. Not even at work? It's a big plant, Ranger. Joe and me didn't even work in the same building. What time did you quit yesterday? Five o'clock. Then you weren't working between, say, six and eight o'clock last night? No. Then where were you at that time? And who was with you? Well, I... I cashed my check at Holland's and... And then... And then what? Did you come out here? Yeah. What? I said yes, yes, I come out here. I'd have told you before if you hadn't started to question me so funny. Why'd you say you hadn't seen Prager in three or four days if you saw him last night? I didn't see him last night. Listen, you just told us I you came out I told you I'd come with... out here, but I didn't see Joe. I changed my mind about going in because there was a car parked here. Joe had company. Well, that fits in, Jace. Those car tracks. Yeah, but it still doesn't tell us why Orville didn't go in. I'll tell you why if you let me. I recognized the car. It belongs to Russ Newcomb. And I didn't want to go in while he was there because I didn't want to get mixed up in any argument. Who's Russ Newcomb? And why should there be an argument? Russ works out at the plant, too. Him and Joe had been friends, but they fell out a couple of weeks ago. Hadn't been talking. Then why would Newcomb be visiting here? Why don't you ask Newcomb that? It took a long time for you to suggest that, Orville, considering that Prager's dead and you knew that there'd been bad blood between him and the man you say was here last night. I don't like to throw suspicion on a man for murder, Ranger. But you're mighty quick suspecting me. A man ain't likely to kill his brother-in-law. Newcomb had the reason, not me. Now, you're going to let me go to my sister, ain't you? Jace. All right, Orville. Go ahead. Yeah. Looks like this thing is cracking easy, Jason. It sure does. You better get out to the aircraft plant. Yeah. We got enough to pick up Newcomb, all right? We got more than that. That tire track on the road matches Newcomb's car. We got enough on Newcomb to send him to Huntsville. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Bad Blood, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We drove out to the aircraft plant. News of Prager's death hadn't reached the place yet. We were directed to Russ Newcomb's section leader, and he pointed Newcomb out to us. He was on a welding job. Hey! Hey, you up there! Newcomb! Yeah! Knock off a minute and come down from that wing, will ya? Be right there! What can I do for you? Let's go into the office where we can talk. Sure, be glad of Yeah, Sheriff, what's up? You find a woman who owned that purse? Purse? What purse? What are you talking about? The purse I turned into your office about two months ago. Money in it, don't you remember? Oh, that was on a Sunday. Guess I look different in a work outfit. Oh, oh, yeah. What's this about, Sheriff? I thought he looked familiar. Turned in a woman's purse he found in the streets a couple of months back. No identification in it, and the owners never claimed it. Oh? The way you're talking, Sheriff, I reckon it isn't a purse you want to see me about. No, it isn't. You know Joe Prager? No, him what? Joe's one of my best friends. When did you see him last? Only last night out to his place. Why, what's the matter? Joe in some kind of trouble? You say he was a good friend. Other people say you weren't on speaking terms for the last couple of weeks. We weren't until last night. We, well, we got in a dumb political argument one day during lunch here. Both got hotter than we should have. But you patched it up last night. Yeah, when word got around that Joe was quitting, going away, well, I went out and... Buried the hatchet. You sure you mean a hatchet, not a frying pan? Look, you fellas asking me something, but you ain't telling me nothing. You talked politics again with Prager last night? No, no, we just shook hands, and I asked him to bring his wife over for supper tonight, and then I left, that's all. Prager still alive when you left? Well, what do you mean he was... Still alive? You telling me Joe Prager's dead? He was beaten to death last night with an iron frying pan. Beaten to death? Joe? You see anybody else at the trailer? No, no, no. We were alone, just the two of us. Newcomb, the law requires me to warn you that anything you say from here on can be used against you. Used against me for what? 
You're talking like I'm under arrest. You are under arrest for the murder of Joe Prager. We took Newcomb back to Cheney and locked him up. Meanwhile, Prager's body had been brought into the funeral home. I went over to see Mrs. Prager to see if she could give further verification of a quarrel between her husband and the man under arrest. Yeah. Joe told me that had some kind of an argument. But I didn't think it'd ever be as bad as this. I didn't think Russ would kill him. Why don't you leave her alone, Ranger? I'd already told you there was bad blood. Now maybe you'll believe me. Other witnesses aren't going to hurt anything, Orville. I'm all right, Orville. He's got to find out everything he wants to know. What else do they need to know? If you ask me, they got enough of a case right now. If we ask you. But so far, nobody has. And until somebody does, how about keeping quiet? All right. You're the law. Go ahead and make them miserable. I'm going over to Holland, sis. I'll be there if you want me. I'm sorry to keep after you like this, Mrs. Prager. Did your husband ever have any trouble with anybody besides Newcomb? No. Was he in fear of anybody, worried about anything? No. He was worried at first when the army letter came. But when we decided it was right for him to go, he didn't worry anymore. Just figured out things so me and the baby could get along. We we even had a little money saved. We, we were going away together for a week. Just Joe and me. To the place we went on our honeymoon. We were going to have so much fun. Now I'll have to use that money to bury him. I'm sorry, ma'am. Why did Russ do a thing like this to Joe? Why? Why? I don't know, ma'am. I've never been able to figure out why men do a lot of things they do to each other. I went back to the sheriff's office. It looked like the case against Newcomb was just about closed, but it opened again. Opened wide when the sheriff showed me the personal effects that had been removed from Prager's body. Look at this, Jace. Bank book, isn't it? Yep. Prager. It was in his shirt pocket. Take a look at that last line. Drew out every dime he had yesterday afternoon. Mrs. Prager told me they had some savings. They were going to use it to go away. Reckon that's why he drew it out. Yesterday was payday at the plant, too, Jace. So Prager should have had this amount he withdrew. $312 plus his pay. Wasn't there any money on him? Less than a dollar in change. I had my deputies go out and comb that trailer. Cupboards, dishes. They didn't find a dime. Newcomb turn any money over to the jailer when you booked him? About five dollars, that's all. But he had time to hide that money. All we got to do is find out where he hid it. If he did hide it. What do you mean? That purse Newcomb found a couple of months ago, the one he turned into you. He mentioned that there was some money in it. That's right. A little over a hundred dollars. What are you thinking? I'm thinking about motives. We've been figuring Newcomb killed Prager because he was nursing a grudge. Robbery angle changes that picture. Yeah. Yeah, it sure does. Fellow who finds money and turns it in when he could keep it isn't likely to kill somebody and steal from him. Unless, of course, he was trying to cover up. He said he'd invited the Pragers to supper tonight, and they were going to come. That's right. You check on Orville's movements last night, see if he was telling the truth? Had my deputy do it. Only place to check was Holland's, and he was there all right after work. Cashed his check there, like he said, then got in a crap game with some of the boys in the washroom. He couldn't have played very long, or he wouldn't have gotten to Prager's by 7 o'clock when Newcomb was there. I don't get what you're driving at. Orville must have lost in that crap game. Game like that between fellows who work together, the winners usually stick to the end. Yeah, they get sore at a winner who quits until they've had a chance to get even. Your deputies find any sign of bloody clothing when they check Newcomb's place? Nope, but they're checking the cleaning shops now. You know where Newcomb lives? Sure. You want to go over there? Just into the neighborhood. I want to talk to Newcomb's butcher. Come on. Newcomb's butcher? What can he tell you? What Mrs. Newcomb ordered for tonight's dinner? <laughs> I saw the butcher, and his answer to my question pulled Newcomb back a step away from the electric chair. I got in my car and started to drive toward the field in Prager's trailer. You look like you learned something, Jace. I did. Ms. Newcomb ordered stew meat yesterday for tonight's supper. She called up this morning and changed the order to lamb chops. Twelve lamb chops. That mean anything to you? And changing from stew meat to lamb chops sounds like she was expecting company. 
When she orders lamb chops for her own family, she usually gets eight. I see. The other four chops could have been for Prager and his wife, then. I think so. And Prager was dead when she ordered them. Well, Newcomb could have told her to order them for a cover-up. Could have. But it's a little too smart. He didn't strike me as being that clever. Yeah, I'm going to go along with that. I think you're right. Well, what do you expect to find at the trailer? I don't know. But I want to look around a lot more than we did before. I shouldn't have waited this long. Didn't seem to be any reason for it with the case we had against Newcomb. Well, there's a reason now. We need a new case. And I got a hunch which way it's going to point. I don't know, Jace. We've fine-combed that trailer, and there's nothing we didn't see before. And the only strange car track you found on the road was Newcomb. Hey, wait a minute, Sheriff. Somebody was sitting down here by the well. Leaned back against it and had his feet stretched out. You can see where the edges of his heels were resting on the ground. Yeah. Circle out around the back here. Let's do a little trail cutting. You figure the killer took off away from the road? If he was on foot, it'd be his best bet. If he went to the highway and walked, somebody might have seen him. If he had blood on his clothes, he'd steer clear of town until it was late and everybody was sleeping. All right, Jace. Which way do you want me to go? Circle out that way. I'll work from this side. Okay. Hey, Jace. Yeah, Sheriff. Orville was on foot. I know he was. That's why we're looking. We found the trail just as it was getting dark. It led into open country. I got my horse charcoal from the trailer behind my car while the sheriff went to a nearby farm to borrow a mount. It was dark when he caught up to me. You still on the trail or are you cutting to pick it up? I lost it a couple of times further back, but I'm on it now. You know this country back here? No, oh, I've ridden it before. We'll be coming to the Horner River soon, about a half mile farther. The river angles toward town, doesn't it? Sure does. Cuts under that bridge just outside Cheney. That may be the way the killer followed to get back to town. Let's ride for the river bank and see if we can pick up tracks there. May save us time. Good idea. Dig, boy. Ah, come on, oh, Turkey. We found tracks on the bank, all right. Just a few that led to the edge of the water, and that was all. We cut back and forth on both banks for hours before we picked up a sign. He'd come out of the river on rock, and we barely spotted the place where he'd marked the ground again. That's it, all right, Jace. Same heel impression. He had us fooled for a while, all right. Now let's go. Come on, Sharky. Yeah, come on, boy. What's that up there ahead? Looks like a shack of some kind. I don't know, Jace. Quite a few shacks in here along the river. A lot of deer around. Some folks keep places for fishing and hunting. Mm, his tracks lead right to it. Yeah. Get on, boy. Come on, Sharky. Yeah, he stopped here all right. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh. Flash your light on that door. Yeah. Yeah. Lock's been sprung. It's open. Yeah, he was here all right. Left his marks in the dust on the floor. I guess nobody's been using the place for quite a spell. Yeah. There's something else, too. Foot locker here. Lock on it's busted, too. Hmm. Shirts and jeans in there. I'd like to bet there's one set missing. Orville or whoever it was stopped here to change clothes. He must have known the setup. There's a funny smell in here, Sheriff. Like the place been smoked up not long ago. For something burning. Pot-bellied stove there. Yeah. Anything in it? Plenty. Clothes that didn't quite burn. Smells from kerosene he poured on him. But he came through the river so his pants were wet. Fire must have smoldered out after he left. Better pull those things out and see if we can save enough of them for identification. It's enough, all right. Look at this. Blood stain didn't even wash off when he came through the water. We prove who owns these things and we've got our man. We'll be able to prove it. Look. Shirt was bundled up with the wet pants. Just enough to save most of the collar and this. Mm-hmm. Laundry mark. Let's get back to town. <laughs> back to Cheney. We got what we were after on our third laundry stop. A half-burned shirt belonged to Orville James. We went to his home. His wife was at the funeral parlor with Mrs. Prager, so he was there alone. What you want from me now? Sheriff's got a few things rolled up in that poncho. I thought maybe you might be able to identify them. Who? Who they belong to? Joe or Newcomb? We want you to tell us. 
All right, Sheriff, unroll them. Recognize these? What's the matter, Orville? You look kind of sick. Well, I'm just upset about Joe, that's all. I was at the funeral home with my sister almost all night. Well, you ever seen these things before? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen them. Whose are they? I could be wrong, I guess, but they look like new ones. That's funny. Well, what's funny about it? Looks like they were burned quite a bit. Yeah, but they were too wet to burn all the way. Guess that gives you a real tight case against Newcomb now, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? A perfect case, except for the laundry mark on the shirt. Laundry mark? That's right, Orville, your laundry mark. But there can't be a laundry mark. There can't be a laundry mark. Keep your hands off those things. You heard him, Orville. Let me go. Let me go. I... Oh, my arm. You better hold still. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> my wife. My wife always hounding me for money. Always screaming about how hard she worked. Always yelling about how she was ruining her hands scrubbing greasy work shirts. But she wasn't. She was sending them out. <laughs> Laundry market. A lazy pig. I'll kill her. I'll kill her. You're not going to kill anybody, Orville. Your killing days are over. Open the door, will you, Sheriff? Sure. All right, Orville. In the car. Let's go. Orville James broke down at his trial and confessed the robbery slaying of his brother-in-law. He was found guilty in less than 20 minutes and sentenced to Huntsville for the rest of his natural life. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Paul Fries, Whitfield Connor, Sam Edwards, Harley Bear, and Barbara Luddy. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keats. This is Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents... Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Conspiracy. It is 2 p.m. the afternoon of October 17, 1926. Captain Clint Stinson of Texas Ranger Company B is seated in his office. Across the desk from him sits a woman sobbing bitterly. <laughs> they killed him, I tell you. They shot him down in cold blood the way they shoot a dog. <laughs> now, get a grip on yourself, Mrs. Wendell. Oh, help me. Please help me. Ed was a good man. Our baby's only seven months old. Now Ed is dead, and the man who killed him is walking the streets of Crescent as though nothing happened. Crescent? Yes, in Ames County. That's where I came from. I see. Some pretty funny things have been happening in Ames County. Who was the man who killed your husband? 
A man named Ray Thorpe. It happened four days ago. But he wasn't even arrested. The grand jury said that according to the evidence, he killed Ed in self-defense. Any witnesses testified to that? Yes, three of them. But they were lying. They were lying. My Ed never carried a gun in his life. Are you sure of that? A wife doesn't always know. I knew. Why can't you help me? What kind of a world am I living in? What kind of a world am I bringing my baby up in when his father could be killed without anybody even lifting a hand? <laughs> now, now, just take it easy, Mrs. Wendell, please. <laughs> Yes, Captain. Get me a Sheriff Porch at Crescenta in Eames County. Yes. What are you calling him for? I want to help you, Mrs. Wendell, if there's anything that calls for help. You won't get the truth in Sheriff Porch. You said yourself that funny things are happening in Eames County. Funny things are liable to happen in any county where there's a big oil strike. <laughs> Drifters and floaters crowd in. You can't always condemn a sheriff for what happens. <laughs> you mean it's just too bad if a man gets murdered. I didn't say that, ma'am. Yes. Sheriff Porch, Captain. Go ahead. Hello. Hello, Captain Stinson. How are you? Fine, Sheriff. I'd like a little information. Sure thing. What about? Man named Ed Wendell, shot and killed in Crescenta by a man called Ray Thorpe. Well, ain't much I can tell you, Captain. Thorpe killed Wendell in self-defense. Wendell's always been, well, sort of a hothead, troublemaker. Started a fight with Thorpe and pulled a gun on him. Thorpe had to kill him to save his own hide. I understand there were witnesses. There sure were. Three of them. And one of the three was my deputy. Open and shut case. I see. Well, thanks, Sheriff. Just check him. Uh, what brought the case to your mind? Uh, you have, uh, some sort of a complaint? Wendell's wife thinks he was murdered in cold blood. Well, Captain, you know women. Can't believe anything wrong about the men, folks. That happens. Thanks, Sheriff. Anytime. Goodbye. Goodbye. You don't have to say anything. I know what he told you. Mrs. Wendell, I'm sorry, but there's nothing much I can do. He left the house smiling, waving to the baby. And he never came back. And they wouldn't even let me see him again after he was killed. What's that? <laughs> Mrs. Wendell, are you telling me that you never saw your husband's body after he was dead? No, they wouldn't let me. They said it was a law because of the way he got killed. There's no law like that. Are you sure you're telling me the truth? Why would I lie to you? You never saw the body. No, I tell you, they buried him in the county cemetery the day after he was killed. Do you know if an autopsy was performed? No, I don't know. I see. Mrs. Wendell, if I can get an order to have your husband's body exhumed, will you give your permission? Yes, but... Oh, they won't let you do it. They're not going to know it's being done. Yes, Captain. Put out a call for Jace Pearson. Tell him to report to me immediately. And bring Steve Clark in, too. Then get me headquarters at Austin. By late afternoon, Captain Stinson had a magistrate's authorization to exhume the body of Ed Wendell. Later the same night, Texas Rangers Jace Pearson and Steve Clark accompanied by a medical examiner and Mrs. Wendell, were at the Ames County Cemetery, three miles from the county seat at Crescenta. Box lid is almost clear, Jase. All right, Steve, hold it. See if we can get the top off now. Want to flash that light down here, Doc? Oh, yeah, sure, Jase. Mrs. Wendell. Yes? Maybe you better go wait in the car, ma'am. No, I'm all right. She'll have to identify the body anyhow, Jace. I guess you're right. All right, Steve, let's get the cover off. Right. Yeah, that's got it. Just lift it up over the edge of the hole. Yeah. Yeah. The body's completely covered with a sheet. Yeah. We'll lift it out to you. I got this in. All right, lift. Yeah. Yeah. I can get a hold now. Yeah, I'll help you. Uh, All right, that does it. Boost me, Jason, and I'll pull you up. Right. All right, now grab my wrist. Got it. Hey, we'll have to replace the cover and shovel the grave in again. We can do that as soon as Mrs. Wendell identifies the body. I hate to ask you like this, ma'am. It's all right. 
I know he's dead. What can it matter? Uh, Jase, you got a pocket knife? I have to slit this sheet. Yeah, here, Doc. Yeah. Well, Mrs. Wendell? Yeah. <laughs> Don't look anymore, man. You better take it to the car, Steve. Come on, ma'am. There's nothing more you can do. Just a sheet on him. Didn't even bury him with his clothes. Yeah, it wasn't even embalmed. There's something strange here, Jace. Yeah. Have me roll the body over. Pull that sheet down further. Sure. No marks in the head and the chest. Uh, yeah. Here's what we're looking for. Yeah. This man was shot, all right. Shot in the back. <laughs> The medical examiner took the body into the funeral parlor and Steve Clark took Mrs. Wendell home. It was after 2 a.m., but what I had to do couldn't wait. I located the home of the county attorney, Lou Morrison, a ranch about 10 miles out of Crescenta. I got him out of bed. Oh, what's on your mind this time of night, Ranger? Official business. It seems to me you could have waited and come to the courthouse in town in the morning. A few men I'm after might be disappearing from town by morning. I had to wake you up. I need some warrants. Warrants? Somebody in Crescenta? Yeah. The first one for a man named Ray Thorpe. On what charge? The murder of Ed Wendell. Thorpe killed Wendell in self-defense. He's already been exonerated by the grand jury. Look, Mr. Morrison, I've just come from the cemetery. We exhumed Wendell's body. A body can't be exhumed without an order? We had an order from a magistrate at the other end of the county. And Wendell's body proves Thorpe couldn't have killed him in self-defense because Wendell was shot in the back. That's impossible. Did you see the body before he was buried? No. No, I didn't. But but there were witnesses. The witnesses lied. Mr. Morrison, I want a murder warrant for Ray Thorpe. All right, Ranger. You seem to have some evidence. I'll go into my office and write them up. You can get Judge Padgett to sign them. Thanks. I'll have to dress. You, uh, said that you... You wanted several warrants. That's right. Three more beside Thorpe's. For who? For the witnesses who claimed that Thorpe shot in self-defense. On what charge? That's a funny question from a county attorney. A charge of perjury before the grand jury. I got the warrants, but Morrison's attitude told me they weren't going to be easy to serve. I'd arranged to meet Steve Clark at an all-night cafe in Crescenta. He was waiting there. Get the warrants? Yeah. Jase, there's something funny about this town. It smells to high heaven. And say that again. There's more to this than just a murder. County attorney didn't want to cooperate. And one of Thorpe's witnesses is a deputy sheriff. Yeah, it looks like the law is trying to cover Wendell's death. And I think I found out why. Huh? Mrs. Wendell spilled it when I was taking her home. Said that her husband was planning on having some kind of a meeting at his house on the night of the day that he was killed. She say what kind of a meeting? Yeah, it's about the county elections coming up next month. What about him? Uh, Sheriff Porch and County Attorney Morrison are both running for re-election, but nobody's running against him. Both unopposed candidates? Yeah, that's why Wendell called a meeting. He didn't like it. He was fixing to stir the town up for a write-in vote. How come Mrs. Wendell didn't mention that before? I guess it didn't seem to have any connection with her husband getting killed before. You finished with your coffee? Yeah. Let's get those warrants served. This town's going to get awful hot. Sharp works on a ranch out beyond the oil fields. I'll go out there and pick him up while you... Hit the ground, Steve! Where'd it come from? Caught a flash from the corner across the street. There's something moving in the shadows there. Let him have it! He's, he's mounted, Jason! He cut through the alley. The field's behind town. Can't get a shot at him now. Come on, let's get our horses out of the trailer. Right. Keep back, everybody. Keep, Keep back. back. Come on, Sharky. Come on, Come on, Longhorn. Come on. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Ah. There he is, Jace, stopping the rise. Not going to go far. His horse is breaking stride. Looks like he's gone lame. Yeah, must have picked up a stone. He'll have to leave him soon. He's out of sight now. Be careful after we cross the rim. He may run on foot and keep going, or he may drop into cover and try and pick us off. Any way he wants to play is all right with me. Now here's the top of the rise. Hunch low in your saddle. There's his horse, Jase. No rider. 
Yeah, he's dismounted. Oh, fast and drop. Whoa, whoa, Charlie. Whoa, Longhorn. He's in that clump of mesquite. Yeah, I know it. Keep flat. The moon touches the top of that brush beside you. Reach over and nudge it. Draw fire. Right. You get him? I don't know. The skeet seems bent over like there's some weight on part of it. Crawl toward it. Keep your gun ready. Better stay a few feet apart. No sign of movement. We'll know in a minute. I can see a boot sticking out of the mesquite. Must be laying out flat. He's hit all right. We can get up. No more trouble with him, Jason. Right between the eyes. <laughs> Some shot for hitting a man you couldn't see. I knew he was firing a rifle. He had to be drawn a sight, so I just fired a little above and to the right of the flash. Wonder who he is. We'll find that out later. Better get his horse. We'll have to lead him back. Yeah. Easy, boy. Easy now. Come on, we'll fix where it hurts. Turn him a little, Steve. Let the moon hit this side of his saddle. Yeah, around, boy. What do you see? A couple of letters burned into the leather. Yeah, look like initials. Hey, R.T. Yeah, R.T. I guess we can tear up that warrant for Ray Thorpe. are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Conspiracy, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. It was sunup when we got back to the main street of Crescenta. The town was waking up for the day, and shopkeepers and morning crews headed for work in the oil fields followed us to the funeral home. I was unstrapping Thorpe's body from my saddle when Sheriff Porch came through the crowd. Let me through here. Let me through. Well, howdy, Rangers. Howdy. Hello, Sheriff. I uh, see you got Thorpe all right. About time somebody got him. Yeah, I know. County attorney told me what you found out. Could have knocked me over with a feather. I'll bet. All right, Steve, grab his feet and let's carry him in. Right. Uh, I'll get the door for you. Put him down there. All right. Sure is heavy. He tried to fight it out, huh? Tried to ambush us, you mean. And somebody better explain how he knew we were after him. Reckon you can blame me for that, Ranger. Hmm? What do you mean by that? County attorney called me right after Judge Padgett signed your warrants for you. I knew where Thorpe was hanging out when the hot spots outside the town. Thought I'd go out and pick him up for you. When I told him you was after him, he sort of caught me off balance in Bolden. Kind of convenient, Sheriff. Especially since you let him out once before. After he'd shot a man in the back. I didn't know that. I never looked at Wendell's body. I, well, I was home, sick. My deputy handled the case. Same deputy that said Thorpe shot in self-defense? Yeah, same one, Joe Slade. I got a warrant for him, too. I know. That's why I got him locked up in the jail right now. You're getting mighty cooperative, Sheriff. Well, Slade was right with me when I heard you wanted him. I know my job. I'm trying to help you. How about the other two witnesses Thorpe had? Rollo Kane and Arthur Sampson. I still got warrants for them. You'll find them out in the oil field, I reckon. They got two operating wells and they're drilling a third. Just past the old stockade north of town. You'll need horses. The road's too muddy for a car. I'll ride out with you. Thanks, but we can handle it. You need a rest. You've been working too hard. <laughs> They're not drilling, Jace. They're just pulling the drill stem out of the hole. Yeah. Probably jumped a pin on the bit. Funny thing, Kane and Samson being mixed up in this Wendell killing. You think a couple of oil men with producing wells would be on the side of the law? Something behind this we haven't hit yet, Steve. Man by the tool shed's watching us. Oh, yeah. Doesn't seem to be doing much work. Maybe he's one of our boys. Won't take long to find out. Be able to ask him in a second. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, boy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Howdy, Rangers. Howdy. Hello. I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Mind telling your crew to knock off? Sure thing. Hold it, boys. Cut fire. Hey, hey, what's on your mind? What's your name? Kane. Rollo Kane. Arthur Sampson around? That's him. 
Up on top of the deck, greasing the crown chair. What's the matter down there, Rollo? Tell him to come on down. All uh-huh. right. Rangers want you to come down. Uh, uh, send a hook up for me. Uh, just a second. Look, what's this all about? I got warrants for you and your partner. Oh? What for? Perjury before the county grand jury. <laughs> You must have the wrong names, Ranger. I never testified for a grand jury. Who are you trying to kid, mister? Records will show whether you did or not, so if you didn't, you got nothing to worry about. Now get your partner down here. All right. All right, boys, send a hook up. Look, you uh, mind if I get my coat? It's right there in the two shed. Go ahead. I can watch you. All right, thanks. Get out, Jake! Oh. Cut that power! Hey, drive crafts off the top of the derrick. Yeah. Hit right where we were standing. Thanks for the push. Yeah. Hey, you you heard, Rangers? That come close to being a nasty accident. It came close to being nasty, but I don't think it was close to being an accident. What do you mean? You know what I mean, Kane. Pretty convenient time for you to step into that tool shed. Oh, well, I'm just lucky, Ranger. Starting right now, your luck's running out. All right, Samson. You can climb down. I'm sorry that happened, Ranger. I just knocked it off, reaching for that hook. If anything else falls from that, Derek. You're going to come with it. Oh, come on now. Climb down. All right, climb down. No. Man can't be too careful if he wants to live, Ranger. These oil fields can be dangerous. There's something else can be dangerous, too, Kane. Something you're going to find out about. Yeah? What's that? Breaking the law in the state of Texas. We herded Kane and Samson back to Crescenta and marched them into the jail. All right, boys, step in. Go ahead, and I'll see you right to the cell. Uh, you know the law, Ranger. Got to check your guns here in the office if you come inside the cell block gate. Unbuckle them and hang them in the cabinet. All right. I want to talk to your deputy, Joe Slade, anyhow. Steve, you better take care of the horses. Right, well, I'll meet you. Well, we can eat at the cafe in about an hour. Okay, Chase, I'll see you later. All right, Sheriff. Go on, Kane, move. You too, Samson. All right, move. You know, you're not going to keep us here long, Ranger. We'll see. Your charge won't stand up. Into the tank with Slade. Was wondering when I was going to get company, Sheriff. I knew you wouldn't let your star deputy die lonesome. Shut up, Joe. Get out of the gateway and let these men in, Slade. For sure, Ranger. Sure. Come in, fella. I want to talk to you, Slade. Why, sure. You're Jace Pearson, ain't you? You got a reputation for being pretty good at the gun. I'm still alive. Why did you lie to the grand jury? Me? You got the wrong boy, Ranger. Oh, that's my office phone. You gonna give me the same story I got from your two pals? That's right, Ranger. Same stuff. Sure. Slade never appeared before the grand jury either. It's all your imagination, Ranger. If the three of you have one brain to go around, you'll tell the truth. You're not in here without evidence. The grand jury records are being subpoenaed. Listen to the man, fellas. He knows all about the law. You're in for a few surprises, Ranger. A few big surprises. Seeing the three of you sent to Huntsville isn't going to be a surprise to me. A Ranger. Yes, yeah, Sheriff. What? Oh, I see you got a gun, Sheriff. You're not supposed to bring a gun past the cell block gate either. It won't do no harm. You don't make me use it. You see, Ranger? Surprises, like I said. Back away from that cell gate, Ranger. All right. Now you get in there with him. What's the idea? You're under arrest by order of the county attorney. For what? For the murder of Ray Thorpe. The sheriff was showing his colors openly now. He was part and parcel of all that was crooked in Ames County. I was dumped into a cell with three men who would gladly kill me if I gave them the chance. Don't stay off in the corner by yourself, Ranger. That's far enough, Slade. I'm keeping this side of the cell for myself. Don't come past the middle, any of you. Who's going to stop us? Sheriff is gone for the day. Yeah, since I'm in here, thanks to you, there ain't nobody on guard. I didn't come to this town alone, you know. You're counting on help from that other ranger. Don't get too happy about it. Probably somebody breathing down his neck right now, just like we're breathing down yours. Be too bad if you got to brooding about the way you killed Thorpe. 
Sheriff forgot to take your belt away, you might hang yourself. You got real broken up. Sure. I might even stab myself with this. Hey, he's got a knife. Lousy pocket knife. You think you're going to scare three of us with that? No, not three of you. But I'm figuring it's good enough to scare one of you. The one who comes at me first. You better get together and figure out which one of you it's going to be. Because he's the one who's going to get killed before I do. I didn't dare sleep. I had to watch every move they made. There was no sign of Steve Clark in the morning the sheriff came in. He took Kane, Samson, and Slade out for the arraignment before the judge. When he came back, he didn't bring them back with him. Here's some food for you. Stop playing, Sheriff. You know I'm not going to eat anything you give me. Suit yourself. You may be here a long time. Longer than most of your prisoners stay. What happened to him? If it's any of your business, Judge Paget released him. No evidence. You call grand jury records no evidence? Seems like the grand jury records have been misplaced. I suppose the county attorney took care of that. This town's going to come down around your ears, Sheriff. You can't... What's that? Maybe what I've been expecting. What happened to Steve Clark? Well, how, how should I know? You mean you don't know whether your men got him or not? Well, you couldn't have gotten away. Watch your hurry, Sheriff. All right, now, keep your hands away from that gun cabinet, Terry. Captain Spencer. Hey! I'm all right, Steve. Have you out in a minute, Jace. Take the keys, Steve. You can't let him out. He's my prisoner. We've got a rick for him. And to keep the record straight, Sheriff, you're my prisoner. Howdy, boy. Glad to see you, Steve. I was afraid you caught one in the back. Ah, uh, no, not quite. They tried to take me after I left here, but I got away on Longhorn, not run them. Had to ride cross country most of the night to get to a phone. Let's go. We got a lot to clean up. Yeah. Captain's got a lot of information on what there is to clean up. Yeah, I sure have. Things that Porch could have told you, Jace. Porch is a rich man, aren't you, Porch? Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about bank accounts all over the state. Big, fat accounts belonging to you and to County Attorney Morrison and Judge Paget. I've been checking on you for two days. You can't prove nothing wrong about that. Yes, we can, Sheriff. We've just come from the courthouse. Your friends didn't have time to burn all the records. You're getting a little pale, Sheriff. It was just business, that's all. Nice business. You and others like you forming a combine to rob the people of this county. We can convict you on 50 conspiracy counts, along with complicity in Wendell's murder. But killing Wendell wasn't my idea. Morrison ordered it when Wendell started to raise a fuss about the administration. That's all I wanted to hear. Jace, you and Steve go after Morrison. He's not in town. Must be at his ranch. What about the others? Oh, we had a shooting match with Samson and Kane as we left the courthouse. They were making a run in the car. Some of our boys took him to the hospital for patching up. Mm. How about Joe Slade? No trace of him, but I got a hunch we'll find him with Morrison. Morrison's account shows Slade's on his payroll, probably burning more papers out at the ranch. Let's go. <laughs> on the ride to County Attorney Morrison's ranch, Steve Clark gave me the insight on the gigantic racket that had been working in Ames County. Yeah, Jace Catton dug it all up. When the oil strike came, Morrison's crowd bought up county land at auction, but no auctions were actually held. Of course, Morrison and his pals didn't take the land in their own names. They turned it over to men like Kane and Samson, strong-arm boys who'd give them a kickback. But there uh, must have been some of the townsmen known what was going on. Uh, sure they did, but they were scared stiff. Didn't always take force to do it either. How can you fight a crook when he's in control of the law you had to fight him with? A couple of men who wanted to run for office were beaten out of the idea. That's why Morrison and Porch had no opposition. There's Morrison's ranch up ahead. Yeah, I see it. Hey, Jace, look. There's a car coming down the ranch road. Really raising dust, too. Step on it. Block them off the intersection before they get on this highway. We'll beat them to it, all right. Hey, they spotted us. Car is turning. And we're almost the ranch road. Keep low. You get cut, Jace? No. Get their tires when I turn in after them. Yeah. Good shot. Hey, they turn turtle. Out. Look out, Steve. That slave breaking for the trees. I'll get him. You dig Morrison out of the rack. Right. You miss, Slade. I won't miss again. You're going to have to step out and take better aim than that. I got Morrison, Jace. You're up, Slade. We'll lick. You better listen to him, Slade. Huh? All right, Ranger. Guess it'd be crazy to shoot it off. I'm coming. I'm dropping my gun. Both hands up. Get that arm from behind your back. I can. 
I hurt my arm and my back when the car turned. Watch him, Jake! Oh! Come on, Morrison. Ah, still had one rattlesnake trick left, didn't he? Yeah. His last one. He'll send somebody out for his body. All right, Morrison, let's get back to town. My company should have all your friends rounded up by now, including that phony grand jury you stacked. You won't keep us long. I wouldn't bet on that, Morrison. You won't be handling the prosecution this time, and the judge won't be one of your partners. Get moving, mister. You've got a long way to go. James County conspiracy was smashed and 12 key men were convicted and sentenced to jail terms ranging from 10 to 50 years. Since then, Ames County has become a model American community. And now here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Texans are mighty proud of their state, and the story that best illustrates that pride has made the rounds for many years. It was started by an old Texas ranger whose son was going off to war. In parting, the ranger gave him this advice. Son, you're going to be with fellas from all over the world. There's one thing you must never do. Never ask a man where he's from. If he's from Texas, he'll tell you. And if he isn't, don't embarrass him by asking. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lillian Byeth, Herb Ellis, Ken Christie, Byron Kane, Tom McKee, Lamont Johnson, and Herb Vigran. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Mercott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Can Death. It is 1.15 a.m., January 26, 1940. Bob Farragut, a rancher, comes awake slowly. As his eyes open, a wave of nausea sweeps over him, and he breaks into a cold sweat. He throws back the covers, staggers to his feet, noticing that his wife has left her place beside him. Uh, May? May? Where are you? May? What's the matter? Why are you out of bed? Oh, Bob. I feel so, so sick. Yeah, I feel kind of funny myself. I was just putting some water on my face. What's the matter with me? You're as white as a sheet. You better get back and lie down. <laughs> funny, I can hardly stay on my feet without holding on to something. You're all perspired. Oh, Bob, what should it be? I don't know. Must we're all coming down with the flu or something. Kids act it. Kind of funny before they went to bed. I was up with them about 11 o'clock. 
They were complaining about stomach aches. Wait, we better go have a look at them. If they feel like we do, I'm going to call the doc. Are they, they seem to be all right now. Both sleeping. Better close the window by Petey's bed. Janet's got covers kicked off. I'll put a quilt over it. We better get back to bed ourselves. Have Doc out in the morning. Oh, I never felt so sick. Bob! What is it? What's the matter? Oh, Janet's face. Feels so funny. Bob, she isn't breathing. She feels so cold. Now, don't go getting yourself excited. I'll wake her up. Janet? Janet? Wake up, baby. Janet! Wake up, baby! Wake up! <laughs> Petey! Wake up, Petey! Oh! Petey! Oh, what's the matter with him? Doc. Gotta call the doc right away. Stop! Don't leave me! Stop! <laughs> May, May, May. Gotta get him. Get somebody to help. Gotta get downstairs to the phone. Hi. Bodies were discovered two days later when a neighbor noticed Farragut's milk cows wandering in pain as the result of not being milked. The sheriff was summoned, along with a medical examiner who made a preliminary diagnosis of poisoning. The bodies were moved into town for autopsy, and the sheriff called for the aid of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Everything in this medicine cabinet seems to be innocent enough, Jase. Your deputy checked the garbage cans and refuse bins? Yeah, no empty bottle of any kind. Just a few cans, vegetable peel, and stuff like that. I'll need some wrapping to pack these bottles in so they can be flown to the lab for examination. Probably find what you need downstairs. Jase, I've been in office nine years. And this is the dirtiest killing I've ever had. Seem pretty sure this wasn't an accident. Not with kids being affected. Farragut's are mighty careful people. Mm. Car pulling up outside. Yeah, it must be the doc with the autopsy report. No, Sid Max. Farragut's partner in this ring. Who did it, Sheriff? Sid, if I knew that, I wouldn't be standing here. We gotta do something about this. I don't want anybody getting away with it. You can post a five thousand dollar reward for the killer in my name. Make it ten. Make it anything I got. Take it easy, Sid. I know how you feel. Uh, Sheriff tells me you own half this place. That's right, Ranger. How come you haven't been out here in a couple of days? Well, I don't live on the place. It was just an investment to me. I got a hardware store in town, living there. I see. You know anybody who was packing a grudge against the Farragut's? Against Bob and May and those kids? It would take a madman to want to hurt them. Oh, Jace, that's Doc's car coming now. Good. Oh, why does everything take so long? Everybody's standing around waiting instead of doing something. There's no point in doing anything until you know what you're doing. And Doc tells us what killed the Farragut's. We'll have something to trace. Oh, I'm sorry, Ranger. It's all right, Mr. Mack. Howdy. Howdy, Doc. You know Sid. This is Ranger Pierce. Hello, Sid. Hey, hey, Ranger. Yeah, the results of the autopsy is kind of surprising, Sheriff. Death in all four cases is accidental. Well, accidental? accidental? No doubt about it. Deaths were caused by botulism. What's that? It's the result of improper home cannon. Stomach content showed the Farragut's had made their last meal on green beans, potatoes, and canned sausage meat. There's nothing in that to kill them. Yes, there is, Mr. Mack. The doc's right. Cannon meat at home is tricky business, Sid. Should be done under steam pressure at high temperature. If it isn't, uh, bacteria forms and it's plenty deadly. You sure that's what killed him, Doc? Bacteria was unmistakable, Sheriff. It was the sausage meat. Nothing else. I uh, guess we should be thankful in a way. It's nice to know it wasn't murder. Dead. Just from sitting down to a meal. And they're all dead. Well, Jase, looks like I brought you down here for nothing. I don't know, Sheriff. Looks like we've got a real job on our hands anyhow. What do you mean, Ranger? The sheriff and I have fine-combed the house. There's nothing in there that's home canned and no equipment for home canning. Hey, that's right. All we did find was one cannon jar on the kitchen drain board. 
Must have been washed out along with the dishes when the last meal ate. Are you sure of that? Wasn't even a steam boiler big enough for home canning. And a woman doesn't just put up one jar. She cans in batches, and the whole batch might be contaminated. Women do pass out samples of their home canning to neighbors and friends. That jar must have been a gift. Quite a gift. Like a stick of dynamite with a lighted fuse. Somebody around here must have a pantry full of poison, and they don't know it. You mean what happened to the Farragut's could happen to somebody else? It will happen to somebody else if we don't find out where that sausage meat came from and fast. Sheriff, you better get all your deputies and a bunch of volunteers out here right away. We'll need them to make direct contact with anybody in the area who can't be reached by phone. We've got to warn anybody that may have given the Farragut's that sausage meat. I'll call them right away. And ask the phone company to put on a staff and make calls to every listing. Right, Jase. Is there anything I can do, Ranger? You got your car. You can take an area when the sheriff and I map it out. I can help you there. I'd rather use you in another way if you don't mind, Doc. Drive into town, go to the newspaper and the local radio station, ask him to get out a warning. Right. You want me to come back, then? No, you better stand by in town and pray that we don't bring in another case for the hospital or the morgue. <laughs> Five days and nights, we covered the territory, the shacks and farms and ranch houses without phones, and then doubled back on the phone listings that hadn't answered, running down the whereabouts of people away on business trips or vacations, but we couldn't locate the source of the contaminated meat. If only somebody would come forward and admit that they can to stuff the Farragut's ate, we'd know we were safe. Uh, they may be afraid of being held responsible for the deaths. Uh, it is something to wonder about. Well, we almost back to my office. Maybe one of the other men has left a report. What time is it? Almost midnight. Yeah, here we are. Oh, howdy. Uh, howdy. You Sarah Kingman? That's right. This is Ranger Pearson. Hello. What can I do for you? My name's Burton. I just came down from Dallas. I'm an investigator for the Midland and Frontier Insurance Company. We understand that you're still investigating the death of the Farragut family. Well, we're trying to find the source of the stuff that killed him, if that's what you mean. Then this isn't a criminal investigation? No. Deaths were accidental. What's your interest, Mr. Burton? Well, Ranger, it is unusual for an entire family to be killed, except for a highway accident or a fire, some natural calamity. And the Farragut's were all heavily insured by my company. I'm just making a routine checkup before we pay the beneficiary's claim of $30,000. $30,000? You say your company insured all the Farraguts? That's right. $10,000 each on Farragut and his wife, 5000 each on the children. All the Farraguts are dead, though. Who is the beneficiary? Mr. Farragut's partner, Sid Mack. Sid Mack? How long ago were those policies written, Mr. Burton? Uh, a little over a year ago, when the partnership was formed. That's the main reason my company wanted to make certain about your investigation. It's a matter of routine for partners to insure each other, but... Uh... But this involved Farragut's whole family. Yes. However, since there's no criminal investigation, we'll have to honor Mr. Mack's claim. Thanks for your time, sir. Uh, just a second, Mr. Burton. Yes? If I were you, I wouldn't recommend payment of that claim just yet. But the sheriff just said that there's no criminal investigation. There wasn't a minute ago, but there is now. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Can Death, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. In the morning, Sheriff Kingman got a search warrant for Sid Mack's house. Mack had already left for the hardware store, but we were admitted by his hired girl. She was young and frightened. She watched us in silence as we started our search and then disappeared. Nothing in here, Jase. Yeah, nothing in the pantry either. Let's try the attic. Mm. That girl screwed it mighty quick, didn't she? Yeah, she probably told Mac what we're doing by now. Could have kept her here until we were through. Yeah, doesn't make any difference. He'd know sooner or later. And if anything's here, he won't be able to stop us from finding it. In this door here. We're not going to find anything, Jase. If there was more of that contaminated food, he'd be stupid to have it around. And if he did kill the Farragut, he's not stupid. Oh, this whole job is too clever. No job is perfect. There's always a slip someplace. Let's move those crates. Okay. 
Uh, nothing in these things, Jays. Better look in those barrels, too. Yeah. Hey, hold it. Somebody's coming upstairs. Mac, I reckon. You and the ranger up there, Sheriff? That's right, Mac. What's the idea? Just having a look around, Mac. We've got a search warrant. Maybe you're going to need more than a search warrant. I had a call from an insurance man named Burton this morning. Yeah, we had a call from him last night. That's why we're here. I've got a legitimate insurance claim, but you've stopped it from being paid. It'll be paid in due time, if it should be paid. Is that so, Ranger? Well, let me tell you something. I think the way you stopped that claim constitutes slander. You think of any reason why I shouldn't slap a lawsuit on the two of you? No, Mac. Not any more than I can think of a reason why you insured Farragut's wife and two kids. Then maybe I'll give you the reason, Sheriff. Farragut knew I had them all insured. You can't insure somebody without them knowing it. The company will tell you that. Farragut was my friend. You understand that? My friend. Sure, I insured his wife. If he'd lost her and been left with the two kids, he'd need somebody to take care of them. And that cost money. Farragut could have insured her himself. So I did it for him. And I loved his kids. I don't have any, and they, they were like my own. The policies I had on them weren't just life insurance policies. They were endowment policies, too, to pay for the education. Now, what's wrong about that, Sheriff? Nothing wrong, Mac. If what you're saying is true... Ask the insurance man. Ask him. Out at the ranch, before we found out what killed the Farragut's, when we thought they'd been murdered, I offered to put up everything I have as a reward, didn't I? Well, didn't I? Yes, Mac, you did. I'm glad you mentioned that, Mac, because it brought something to my mind. Something that's been trying to register, and you just brought it out. What do you mean? How long you been in the hardware business? Uh, Eleven years. Why? Because when Doc told us the Farragut's died from food poisoning, from food that wasn't canned properly, he had to draw you a blueprint. You didn't seem to know anything about it. I don't know anything about it. No? Don't you sell canning equipment at the hardware store? Well, we can go over to the store and have a look, Mac. All right. So I sell canning equipment. Any hardware store does. What does that prove? Companies that make canning equipment usually put out instruction booklets, too, telling how the equipment should be used. And those booklets contain a warning about the possibility of food poisoning. Maybe they do. I never read one of them. Don't kid me, Mac. man who's been handling a line for 11 years has to know the answers when customers ask about the stuff he's selling. If he doesn't, he doesn't last 11 years in the business. You're covering up, Mac. That doesn't look good. So, it doesn't look good. All right, Sheriff. What are you going to do about it? Arrest me for telling a lie? Don't be smart, Mac. I don't even know why I'm bothering to talk to you. You got your warrant. Go ahead and search. But you're not going to find anything here. No canning equipment and no canned sausage meat. So go ahead. Search your heart out. Mac wasn't hedging anymore. But having him out in the open made me feel uncomfortable. He was too defiant, too sure of himself. We finished our search, but we found nothing. Started back for the sheriff's office. He knows something about those deaths, Jace. Practically told us so, right to our faces. I know. He can't prove anything. Yeah, he could have brought cannon equipment home from the store. Could have taken it any place. Then ditched it when he was finished. He'd need more than just the equipment, Sheriff. What? Hog meat? Might have bought a hog. I had one butchered at some farm around here. But which one? We checked every house in the territory once, warning them about the meat. I reckon we'll have to check them again from a different angle. Be a job. Some folks off in the backwoods keep a hog or two. We'll check them all. I'm towing a double horse trailer. We can load your mount in with charcoal in case we need them for the woods or hill country. Matter of fact, places off the beaten trail might be our best bet. I know it's going to be done, Jase, but even if we find a place, can't jail them for buying hog meat. Just the same, it's our next step. And it might be the step that starts Mac on his way to a cell. <laughs> It was work, grim, routine, discouraging work. The game of questions and answers without ever getting the right answer. In three days, we checked all the spots that could be reached by car. Then we switched to the horses and rode into the backwoods. These backwoods people are kind of tight mouth, Jay. Yeah, so I've noticed. I guess they figure the world doesn't want to share the trouble, so they hold up back here. You see what I mean next place we come to? Crazy Annie. Crazy Annie? That's what they call her. She isn't really crazy, just kind of strange. As a son, feeble-minded. They had him at the state asylum for a while, but he was harmless, so they let him go. 
old lady came into the woods with him, and, well, they've been here ever since. They got hogs? Yeah, hogs, a couple of chickens. That's about all they have got. Oh, yeah, they got one other thing. The meanest dog in the state of Texas. Keep your eye open for him when we ride up. Don't they keep him tied? Yeah, yeah, but he chews loose. Hates everybody but the old lady and her son. Place is just through this clump of trees. Hey, hold it, Sheriff. Who? Who? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Look at that. Mound of earth covered with rocks and a cross sticking up at the head. Looks like a grave. Uh-huh. Reckon Luke did that. Old Annie's son. Always burying dead birds and things. Gives them all a first class funeral. Oh. Now get up, Chuck. Oh, come on, boy. Uh, there's Luke now. Luke! Yeah. You scared him. He took off for the woods like a jackrabbit. Yeah. Never know how he's going to act. I don't see any dog any place. No. First time I come here that he hasn't tried to sample my pants. Oh, there's the old lady coming out of the shack now. Yeah, I see her. Oh, hold on. Oh, Sharky. Howdy, Annie. You frightened my Luke. Why do you come to frighten him? We don't mean him any harm, ma'am. We just came to see you. Where's your dog, Annie? I don't want him sneaking up on me. The devil came for him. He's dead. And Luke cries for him. He's afraid in the night without the dog. Maybe you're just as well off, Annie. That hound might have turned on you sometime. Uh, how are the hogs coming? See, the sow has a new litter. Yeah, those sucklings ought to make good canning. Uh, maybe you got some canned meat that I could buy. I ain't got nothing canned. Not until we butcher. That's true, Jace. Ford checked her shells when we were warning everybody. I see. You ever give any canned sausage meat to the Farragut's? I never give them nothing. Why are people always asking me that? You know the Farragut's are dead, don't you, Annie? Yeah. If you never gave anything to the Farragut's, did you ever give or sell any canned sausage to Sid Mack? Or any hog meat, or even a live hog? Well, did you, Annie? You've got a right to sell what you own. I don't know the man you talk about. Now, don't lie to us, Annie. We're friends. You know that, don't you? I never sold him nothing. I never did. He never come up here. All right, Annie. Want to write on, Jace? No sense trying to catch Luke when he's scary like he is today. He can't even talk. Yeah, let's go. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye, Ann. Up, Charlie. Up, boy. Of course, it's hard to tell with anybody like that, Jace, but she seemed to tighten up when you mentioned Sid Mack. She did. Her hands started to work nerves. And the boy Luke ran when he saw me. Of course, he's done that before. If they can give us any information, it isn't going to be easy to get. I got an idea. Maybe a wrong one, but it's worth a shot. Let's turn back for town. Come on, Charlie. Come on, boy. Come on. You going to tackle Mac again? No. I want to see the doctor. Well, there's a complete chapter on botulism in this book, Jace. Now, what was it you wanted to know? This food poisoning from improper canning, Doc, does it always happen? I mean, if the batch wasn't cooked the proper length of time, or if it wasn't sealed under the proper steam pressure, would it necessarily be poisoned? No, not necessarily. It could be all right. I just wanted to make sure. Well, what's your point, Jess? If Mac put up that contaminated meat, he'd have no way of knowing it was bad without testing it. So since he wouldn't test it on himself... He didn't test it on anybody else, either. There'd have been another death or somebody sick enough for Doc to know about. Mac wouldn't have gambled on the Farragut's just getting sick. He wouldn't have even gotten the food to him unless he was sure it was deadly. Well, he could have tested it on an animal. Would an animal eat that food, Doc? Well, the meat would seem all right by taste or smell. Yes, yes, an animal would eat it. That's all I wanted to know, Doc. Sheriff, we're going for another ride in the woods. I think I know what for. Shouldn't take two guesses. We're going to dig up Luke's dog and send it to the lab at Austin. I want to know what that dog died from. took Deputy Ford with us to stay on guard and keep old Annie and Luke from leaving their shack. We dug up the dog and sent it to Austin. The answer fit. Death by food poisoning. Sheriff and I rode back to the shack in the woods. Old Annie was white and shaking and her son huddled in a corner. His eyes enormous and frightened. His lips numb. Annie, believe me, nobody's gonna hurt you or Luke. 
But you've got to help us. You had no reason to harm the Farragut's. We know that. But we're after the man who did have a reason. I don't know. I don't know. All you have to do is tell us. Was Mac here? Did you sell him anything? Or can anything under his direction? Oh, I guess it's no use, Jace. Yeah, we can try again when we get to town. Annie, you and Luke will have to come with us. We're taking you in. I don't want to come back. Luke, Luke, listen to me. We're only taking you into town. I wouldn't have to do that if you or your mother would answer my question. <laughs> the lies, boss. They want to take me back there. Mr. Max says they take me back. Max says? Wait a minute, Sheriff. Where did Mr. Max say they were going to take you, Luke? You know where. The place where they took me before. They ain't going to take you, Luke. I won't let him. Yes, I think he means the asylum. That's what he does mean. That's the key to why he won't talk. Wait, I got a hunch. Luke. Mac isn't a good man. He killed your dog. Well, he did, didn't he? No. He was always giving me stuff to feed him. My dog died. He died. You're getting to him, Jase. We don't want to send you away, Luke. Mac lied. He's the one. He wants to send you away. No. He tried to help me. He told me who was trying to help me send back there. It was Mr. Farragut, that's who. Don't tell him, Luke. Don't say any more. You better let him talk, Annie, because if Mac didn't kill the Farragut's, then Luke did. He didn't. He didn't mean to. He didn't know what he was doing. Mr. Mac said I should be nice to Mr. Farragut and his wife. Then they wouldn't send me away. What did he mean by telling you to be nice? He said I should go and bring him a present. He gave me the present to bring. Something nice for them to eat. Something in a jar? Something canned? Yeah, the same kind of stuff he always kept giving me to feed my dog. And my dog died, and Mr. Farragut and his lady, and the little baby, they died too. And that's it, Jase. Making him an accessory to the murder of four people. I know. But with Luke's background and with a smart defense attorney in court scaring him and confusing him, Luke's story wouldn't hold up. Mac could get away with it. But what else can we do? You gotta find the rest of that food and prove it passed through Mac's hands. He had a batch of it. Kept feeding the dog samples until he found a jar that was deadly. Annie, your boy's in trouble. You know that, don't you? Leave him alone. How much of that stuff did Mac bring up here? A lot. But he kept it hid someplace in the woods. Except in what he fed the dog. He didn't tell us why. And after the dog died... That's when he got the jar from his hiding place for Luke to take to the Farragut's, wasn't it? Luke never knew what killed the dog till after. No. <laughs> Mr. Farragut thanked me and he gave me a half dollar. And the lady, she smiled at me. It was pretty. Luke, do you know where Mac hid that food? Did you see him digging any place? Did you follow him? I, I never know where he kept it. He always went over the hill. We over where it's all rock. That rock formation across the gully, Jace, about a mile from here. Think he left the stuff there? Yeah, it wouldn't be safe for him to cart around. He had to leave it someplace. Come on. We're going to need more men, Sheriff. We may have an all-night digging party. Warren! Yeah, Sheriff. Just watering the horses. Well, hop on your pronto and head for the nearest ranch. Get on the phone and call for deputies. Tell them to bring shovels and keep their mouths shut about where they're going. I want them up here right away. <laughs> We dug by flashlight and torchlight. Finally, we found it. A burlap sack loaded with jars of sausage meat. Canned death. We rushed back to town, and just after dawn, a fingerprint crew flew in from Austin. I held my breath. All we needed was a print. One fingerprint belonging to Sid Mac. We got it. More than one. There were sets on every jar. By that time, his store was open, and we went for him. Well, Sheriff and the Ranger... What uh, bright ideas have you got this time? Got an idea? We're going to lock you up, Mac. You can drop that smile, Mac. Luke was just as scared of us as he was of you. We know the whole story. Well, guess fellas with your mentality might believe Luke, but a jury won't. You know what the law says about a reasonable doubt? We also found a few buried samples of your canning, Mac, with your fingerprints all over the jars. Just yours. So? Like you once said, I sell cannon equipment, and I handle the stuff I sell. So my prints were on the jars. Smart, isn't he, Sheriff? Regular genius. Thanks. Sorry I can't return the compliment. 
You're just like all the smart ones, Mac. You just made one mistake, and it was a real stupid one. About those prints. You had to put them on the jars after they were filled, when the canning was completed. Any prints that were on before would have been boiled off. Hey, Don't go back to claw hammer, Mac. Don't make me put a bullet in you. Because heaven knows, Mac, I'm tempted. Wait a minute, Sheriff. I'm not resisting. I'm not touching anything. All right. Move. Better lock the door, Mac. You won't be coming back. Sid Mac was brought to trial on August 3rd, 1940. He was convicted of premeditated murder. And on April 19th, 1941, he died in the electric chair. week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Paul Fries, Virginia Gregg, Will Wright, Ken Christie, Joe Forte, Edmund McDonald, and Don Diamond. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, no living witnesses. It is 11.30 a.m., a Monday morning in November 1939. Sheriff Ross Betsby turns his car into a quiet residential street of Harper's Landing, Texas. Seated in the car with him is Mrs. Blackburn, a medical assistant. She becomes increasingly nervous as they approach a sign marking the home of Dr. Walter Hennett. Now, don't go getting jumpy, Ms. Blackburn. There could be a hundred reasons for the doc to be missing. Not Doc Hennett, and you know it. It ain't like him to just disappear. No sign of him since Saturday night. Wasn't at church yesterday, and he ain't at his house this morning. He's always there for visiting hours at 9.30. So he's probably out on a house call. Maybe over to the hospital at Ridge Hill. If he was, the phone operator would know about it. Besides, his car is still in the garage. Well, here's a house. Better get out of the car and see if we can't raise it. That's what I've been trying to do all morning. You sure he wasn't at church yesterday? Of course I'm sure. He always gave me a ride home to my place, and I'd always make Sunday breakfast for him before he'd start on his house calls. You don't work for a man for ten years without learning his habits, especially a doctor. Well, he's got to be around someplace. Doc? Hello, Doc? Doc? Doc Hemet! Don't you have a key, Miss Blackburn? Never needed one before. Front door to the waiting room's always been open, except at night. Of course, he could have driven off with somebody, but... Oh, I don't know. But if he's here, why doesn't he answer? Well, even doctors get sick. And Doc Hammett's no youngster. He might have had a stroke. Oh. What are you going to do, Sheriff? We got to get inside. I got no legal right to bust in without a warrant. 
But that'll take time, and maybe this can't wait. Why don't you just go in, then? Doc knows you. He'd understand. If he doesn't understand, I reckon he'll just have to sue me for a broken window. I'll knock this one in with my gun, then I'll climb in and let you in through the door. Well, hurry. All right, come in. Where's Doc's bedroom? Back here. Not here. Bed's been used, though. It was all made up Saturday night when I left. Then he slept here Saturday night. Bathroom door is open. Nothing in there. Reckon we better go through the rest of the house. Kitchen's clear. You can see out back through the windows. There's nothing there either. Sure, if I'm... I'm frightened. The sliding door to his office was closed when we come into the waiting room. Better have a look at that office. If he isn't in here, I don't know... Oh, Oh, Sheriff! Better stay back, Miss Blackburn. Oh, Dr. Hammond! Dressed in a robe and pajamas. Must have had a heart attack. Come in here to get something for it and... Wait a minute. What is it? On his robe. It looks like blood. It is blood. From a bullet wound. He's been murdered. Sheriff Betsby made an immediate request for the aid of a Texas Ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. He joined the sheriff at the home of Dr. Hemmett shortly after 1 p.m. Uh, Jace, uh, this is Miss Blackburn. She was Doc's helper. Uh, this is Ranger Pearson, Miss Blackburn. Howdy. Howdy, ma'am. I asked Miss Blackburn to stay until you got here. Reckon she knows more about Doc than anybody. I gather you didn't live here in the house, ma'am. No. I have my own place. I don't know just what I'd like to ask you yet until I look around. Would you mind waiting a little longer? I'll stay as long as you need me. Thanks, ma'am. Where's the body, Sheriff? In the office. Through that sliding door. I've been keeping it closed off. Nobody's been in here but me and one deputy. He just took a couple of pictures. Good. Medical examiner been here yet? No, but he'll be along soon. He's driving down from Hesterville. Mark alongside the doc's temple here. Bruise about two inches long. A pretty heavy blow. Looks like he might have been knocked out with a gun barrel. That figure. Because he wasn't standing up when he was shot. He was lying here on the floor. What makes you think so? Bullet went right through the chest and buried in the floor under him. I moved him a little and I dug the slug out. Here. Forty-five. Yeah. There's something funny about this, though. Quite a bit of blood on this examination table, almost six feet away from the body. Yeah, I wondered about that myself. The instrument tray and surgical dressings pulled up beside the table. There's a couple of hypodermic needles that look like they've been used. Well, Jace, Doc couldn't have been trying to treat his own wound. He, he never moved after he was shot. That slug wouldn't have been in the floor right under him. Of course, he, he, he might have staggered around before he was shot, after he got hit on the head. It still wouldn't account for the blood on this table. There was no bleeding from the mark on his head. That means the blood on the table comes from somebody else. Medical examiner can type it for us later. I want to see Mrs. Blackburn for a minute. We can use some help from you now, Miss Blackburn. I'll tell you anything I can. Mrs. Blackburn, was it part of your job to clean the doctor's office? Yes. Every day after his final visiting hours. According to the sign outside, his evening hours were from 5 to 7 p.m. That's right. You clean the place after 7 p.m. Saturday night? Yes. What time did you leave? Well, the doctor had a few calls to make after visiting hours. House calls. I waited until he got back and fixed his dinner for him. Reckon it was late when I left. After 10 o'clock. Uh-huh. Look through the door of the examination room for a minute. Yes, sir. Is that surgical tray usually in that position? I mean, did you leave it like that Saturday night? No. Everything was put away in the cabinet. How about the examination table? You cleaned that off Saturday night? Yes. Was the doctor expecting any patient after you left, late? No, no, he said he was going right to bed. And he must have gone, too, Jace. The bed had been slept in. and You can see what he was wearing. Poor doc. I... I think it'd be all right for you to go home now, ma'am. If I need any more information, we can reach you there. 
Thank you. Uh, tell the deputy outside that I said to drive you home. Right. I'd as soon walk. Get to home. Yes, well, thanks for helping, Miss Blackburn. Well, that settles one thing, Jace. Doc had an unexpected patient late Saturday night. Somebody who routed him out of bed and killed him. But why? I got an idea. It was to keep the doc from calling you. Keep him from calling me? What do you mean? Whoever came here was hurt, bleeding. So it wasn't a planned visit. Not somebody who came here deliberately to kill the doc. Doc was killed to keep him from talking about the visit. Oh, Doc Hammett would never talk about a patient's business? Only in one case, where the law would require it. He'd have to report it if he treated anybody for a bullet wound. Yeah, that's right, Jace. That could be it. That probe on the instrument tray has blood on it. And that's just what a doc had used to dig out a bullet. I know. I've had a few dug out myself. Let's comb this examination room again. What are you looking for? If we're right, the slug doc Hammett dug out of his patient. We found it, wrapped in a piece of blood-stained gauze in one of the trash containers. There was something else in the container, too, part of a faded blue denim shirt that had been used to bind a wound. It must have been a bad wound, Jace. That denim was soaked. Yeah, and take a look at this slug. Looks like a slug from a savage 303. But Doc was killed by a 45. That's natural. The man who came here wounded was shot someplace else by somebody else. Wouldn't be the same gun. Fellow we're after must have been in a gunfight then. That's the way it shapes up. With all that blood, he couldn't have come far. Couldn't have waited too long to get to a doctor. And the chances are he wasn't alone. Somebody must have been helping him. Oh, they could have just left Doc knocked out, trussed him up and gotten away. Why'd they have to kill him? I can't answer that one. When the medical examiner gives us the wounded man's blood type, I'm going to send the two slugs we've got through to Austin for a ballistic check. Get a rundown on every police report involving gunplay that took place anywhere within 100 miles of here on Saturday night. The medical examiner came and after a quick check gave us the blood type of the man we were after. I arranged for the two slugs we had to be sent through to Austin at the same time phoned for a complete report on all shooting incidents that had occurred on Saturday night. And the sheriff and I started the drive to his office. This looks like a tough one to me, Jace. We got a blood type to check for, but I reckon a million people in Texas have type O blood. Yeah, but not all of them are going to have a recent bullet wound they can't account for. You're right. If we find one who's been wounded. But for all we know, the man Doc treated might have got himself shot by accident. If he did, he wouldn't have killed the doc to keep him from reporting it. I guess you got me hogtied on that point, Jace. But all the same, I don't... Hold it a minute, Sheriff. KTXA to Unit 10. That's for me. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead. Have info you requested on cases involving firearms. None reported your general vicinity for Saturday night. 10-4. There is possible lead, though, Unit 10. What is it? Body of man killed by gunfire discovered a few hours ago on slope of Thunder Ridge, Roebling County. About 70 miles west, your present location. Time of death, not yet determined. Waiting report of medical examiner. 10-4. Is another unit assigned to that case? Unit 3 covering. This unit proceeding to join Unit 3 to explore possibility of link between two killings. 10-4. Best approach to scene is west slope of Thunder Ridge. We'll have to leave car, go in mountain. 10-4. Unit 3 making contact by field set. We'll notify Unit 3 if you're coming. 10-4, Unit 10, clear. KDXA, Austin. You think that might hook up with us, Jase? It's the only thing that's turned up. Another Ranger unit's there, Unit 3. That's Steve Clark. We can work it together. Suppose I leave you on deck here to cover anything that turns up. Suits me. Just drop me in my office. Even if this fellow you're going to see was killed on Saturday night, Jase, it could still be a coincidence. I know. But it'll stop being a coincidence if he was killed by the same 45 that was used to murder Doc Hemmett. I dropped the sheriff off, then headed for Thunder Ridge. When I got to the base, I unloaded charcoal from my horse trailer and started the climb. The sun was sinking as I started up the slope, and darkness came fast. I spotted torches moving like fireflies. I rode for them. Easy, easy, Charco. Watch your footin', boy. Hello there. Hello. That you, Steve? Yeah. Jake? Right. Coming up to you. Hold up back there. Rest your horse for a second. Uh, howdy, Steve. Howdy, Jace. <clears throat> Got a walkie-talkie message you were coming. 
Didn't come down the road to meet you because we wanted to get the body out of here. The medical examiner can't do much till we get it into town. Where is the body? Back down a pack mule with the sheriff's deputies. I'm leading the way down. Uh, might as well get moving then. I'll ride with you. Right. All right, we're going to move again. Follow this gully all the way down and watch your step. Come on, boy. Come on, Charlie. Any line on how long he's been dead? Not for sure. But I think it's going to fit in with what you're looking for. What I can judge, he was killed Saturday night. Got anything to back that up? Yeah, the man's a cowpoke. Works on that ranch at the base of the ridge. He rode up here Saturday night to see some Mexican gal he's been caught in. But he never did get back to the ranch after he left her shack. I wonder why anybody traveled all the way up here to kill him. He was ambushed on the way back to the ranch. It'd been just as easy for the killer to wait until he hit the flat down by the ranch. Funny you should say that. Why? Because he was shot down on the flat. Well, then how'd his body get up here? Well, near as I can figure, he started to ride back up to get help. He wasn't killed right off, fell out of the saddle, and died where he fell. Seems to me he'd have ridden on to the ranch for help. Well, the ranch house is 11 miles off. Back up this way was only one mile. Chase, I'll be able to show you the whole thing when we get down. I'll follow his tracks both ways. Say, you, you leave your car near mine? Yeah. Well, the shooting took place not far from where we're parked. There was a break in the fence there and the marks of a truck, but they weren't deep enough to make a cast of them. You mean whoever gunned him had a truck down there? Yeah, that's right, Chase. Or say, there are cattle tracks all over the place, too. Well, that might mean he surprised somebody who was trying to run some stock off the place. Yeah, not only trying, but succeeding. A few white faces that were grazing in that section can't be located. Did he spit in with your doctor killing? Depends on whether your cowpoke was killed by a forty-five and whether he returned fire and hit one of the men he saw down there. And he fought with him all right. He was carrying a saddle rifle. He dropped it when he got hit, I reckon. I found it beside his tracks down below. Already sent it on to Austin. Only one thing you got to tell me then, and I'll know if the two killings go hand in hand. What kind of a rifle was the cowpoke using? What kind are you looking for, Jace? Savage three hundred three. You got a case. That's what it was. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Free chimes mean good times on NBC. We're boasting a little because here at NBC, you'll find the roughest, toughest, most romantic crime fighters ever assembled under one network roof. Take Wednesday evening, for example. On Wednesdays, you'll hear action with Mr. District Attorney, The Big Story, and that new daring private eye, Rex Saunders, played by Rex Harrison. So just keep your mystery ear glued to your NBC station every Wednesday. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and tonight's case, No Living Witnesses, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. The cowpoke and Dr. Hemmett had been killed by the same man, all right. Ballistics proved the bullet dug out of the floor from under the doctor was a twin to the forty-five taken out of the murdered cowpoke. Steve Clark and I put our horses in the double trailer I was towing and headed for Harper's Landing. Ballistic boys at the lab didn't take long comparing those slugs, did they? I never do. It all fits. They even test fire the cowpoke's rifle. It fired the slug Doc Hammett took out of that patient we're looking for. We're not only looking for him, we're going to find him and whoever was with him. There must be more than one man, all right. Once you told me about the blood on that piece of denim shirt, he couldn't have been in any condition to drive by himself, not all the way to Harper's Landing. Yeah, 70 miles. And he must have known he was going to need a doctor. Hey, you look like that gives you an idea. It does. I think it answers a question the sheriff asked me. Why they killed the doc instead of just tying him up. And what's the answer? They killed him because they didn't just happen by his place. They knew Doc Hammett, and he knew them. That's a big conclusion, Jason. It's not hard to reach either. Look, Steve... Doc Hemmett's house in Harper's Landing isn't on the main street through town. It's on a side street, not easy to find in the middle of the night, unless you knew where it was. Not only that, but they had to pass through two bigger towns on the way there, towns with more than one doctor. Steve, if you were shot and wanted to keep it covered, but you had to be treated, what would you do? Well, go to my own family doc, I reckon, and hope that I could talk him into keeping it quiet. You're right, Jase. That means the men we were after must live in or near Harper's Landing. Let's say on a ranch somewhere outside the town. Some place they could have taken stolen cattle. We know the brand mark and those stolen white faces. Say, we're going to do some range riding? Until we find them. Until they show up for sale at some commission house or auction barn. You think the sheriff will be willing to ride with us? Of course he will. Doc Emmett was a friend of his, and the sheriff doesn't take to killers. (laughs) 
Parson Ranch is about two miles farther on. Might stop there and get some grub if you'd like. I'm all for it, Sheriff. How about it, Jace? Haven't taken much eating time for the past two days. Ah, why don't you just grab a handful of range grass? It's loaded with vitamins. <laughs> You'll be loaded with buckshot if you come up with any more ideas like that. Yeah, come on, Jace, before we get so skinny that a gust of wind will lift us right out of the saddle. Okay, okay, I guess the horses can use a rest. You see there, Sheriff? He don't care about us, just the horses. Ah, look who's talking. I never saw you sit down to a meal without seeing to it that your horse was fed and watered first. I was only kidding, Jace. Let's get out of that Larson place. All right, get up, boy. Yeah. I wish we'd find some sign of those white faces. We must have looked over a couple of thousand head without finding a single altered brand. Yeah, they got to be around, Steve. They haven't been sold through any commission house or barn. All records have been checked back through last Saturday. Yeah, we better find them soon before too many people know what we're doing. Ranchers who've seen us know we're not riding this range for exercise. Yeah, at the Larson Ranch off there to the right of the mesa. There? Nope, that place belongs to Yancey Coburn and his son, Jed. Yeah, pull up a minute. Ooh, oh, boy, oh, boy. Oh. Yeah, those cattle are acting kind of funny, Jace. Yeah. Disturbed and excited, milling around. Can't see any reason for it. Wide open range. No sign of a coyote or a mountain cat. Yeah, it must be something they smell. I've seen them act just that way when a beef has been slaughtered on the range. Blood smell stirs them up and they start bunching just like that. No, oh, nothing in that herd to interest us, though, Jace. Can see none of them's white faces. Their yeah, white parts might have been painted over. You know, that kind of camouflage has been used before. I yeah, can't tell till we get close up. We're going to have to check them sooner or later. Might as well be now. Well, there goes our lunch, Steve. Yeah, I guess they eat on the Coburn place, too. Yeah, but Yancey and Jed ain't exactly hospitable. Well, come on. Get up, boy. Get up, Sharky. Come on. And they're bunching right along Coburn's fence line. That's good. We won't have to cut the fence. We can just tie the horses off there and climb through. They sure are acting up. All right, hold up. Oh, oh, oh Charky. Oh, oh. I'll hold the wire, Jason. Thanks. Climb through, Sheriff, and I'll come through and hold it for Steve. Right. Okay, Steve. Come ahead. Okay. I'm clear. Let it go. Yeah. Ain't no strange stock here, Jace. They're all wearing Coburn's brand. Yeah, I can't spot any that have been altered. Besides, there's not a white face in the lot. It's you that plain now. Well, what are they so head up about? It beats me. What are you looking at, Jace? Tracks. The way they've been milling around. Marks form a big circle. A boulder over there seems to be the middle of it. They move up toward it, and then they start to mill and pull back. Come on. Wow. Look at the mess of red ants around that boulder. Why, they're just pouring in and out of that varmint hole under it. Hey, look at it. The hole's bigger than it looks. Most of it's been covered by the boulder. Hey, let's see if we can move it out, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jam too tight, Jake. Yeah, there's enough of an opening for my arm. I'll stretch flat and stick my hand down there. Well, watch out, Jake. You'll get ants all over you. I don't care about the ants so much. I just hope I don't get a mess of gopher teeth in my hand. Feel anything down there? Yeah. Look, quick line. Hey, Jake, you better wash that off right away. I will. You got your wire clippers? Sure. What's the matter? Cut the fence and bring the horses through. We're going to pull this boulder. Why, Jake? What's down there? It felt like a bunch of fresh-skinned beef hides. They were hides, all right. Stripped from a half-dozen white face. The place where the brands should have been were burned over to obliterate what had been there. Packed the hides on our horses and headed for the Coburn Ranch house. They sure wiped out any proof on those hides, Jace. Yeah. If there wasn't something wrong with them, they wouldn't have gone to the trouble of hiding them. Pretty smart butchering the stuff before they sold it. Probably figured every commission house in the state would be watching for brands. They couldn't risk altering them, and they couldn't risk keeping the stock around. You seen the Coburns lately, Sheriff? Haven't seen Jed for some time, but I saw Yancey only last night at the drugstore in town. Yeah? He buying something? Yeah, he was. A lot of stuff. Bandages, adhesive tape. I saw the druggist wrapping it up. Sounds like the stuff he'd need to change dresses on a bad wound, Jase. They were coming to their sheds. The house is just the other side of them. Ride right into the sheds. Leave the horses there. I don't want them to see these hides yet. Okay. Here we are. Oh, boy. Oh, 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 oh. 
Take a look on that floor there, Jase. Over there. Yeah. One spot cleaned up mighty good. But look, look at the beam right over it. Meat hooks. A little blood on them. Yeah, must have done his butchering right here. Made awful sure to get that floor clean. Let's go talk to him. There's Yancey now at the back screen door. Uh, uh, howdy, Yancey. What you fellas want on my place? The rangers want to have a little talk with you. I ain't got much time for talking. I got work to do. And so have we. Where's your son? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Just like I said, I don't know. Now, anything else that can help you with? Don't get smart, Yancey. You know where Jed is, you better talk up. He took himself a little trip down to Mexico. Suppose you invite us in and tell us all about it. Reckon I don't have to have you in if I don't want you, Sheriff. He's perfectly right, Sheriff. So Steve and I will just wait here while you ride into town and get a warrant. And we can invite ourselves in. You want to make us do it the hard way, Yancey? I ain't got nothing to hide. Want to come in? Come in. You keep a gun in the house? Shotgun there in the corner by the stool. How about a forty-five, Yancey? Never own one. You haven't slaughtered any beef lately either, have you? Any log in it? Nobody said there was. Stashing the hides away under a boulder is a little bit unusual. You're getting kind of pale, Yancey. Now, there ain't no... Pro- What'd you stop for, Yancey? You're about to say there aren't any brand marks left on those hides, weren't you? You putting words in my mouth. Choose your own words, but answer me. Tell the truth. Where's your son, Jed? I told you he's... He's not in Mexico. He's holed up someplace recovering from a wound. The wound Doc Hemet was killed for treating. I don't know what you're talking about. Get in here, I tell you. Jase, look at that ladder there in the corner. Just a ladder? I was, was fixing to do some paint. A man who's going to paint usually buys some paint before he brings a ladder in. What's that up in the ceiling? Looks like an entry into the attic. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get your hands off of that shotgun. Oh. That's better. I'll hold this for safekeeping. You might hurt somebody. Keep him covered, Steve. I'm going to use that ladder and see what we got upstairs. I'll help you, Jase. Jed's probably up there, and he ain't the kind to come quiet if he's cornered. That's You'll right, be- Sheriff. Get covered, Sheriff. Kill him, Sheriff. Yes, he don't move. Be smart, Jed. You can't get out of that attic. No. But I can blow the head off anyone that comes up here to take me out. I got to see you first. Remember that. We don't have to come up after you, Jed. We can rake every foot of that ceiling with gunfire. Yeah. That's just a sample. Can make it look like a sieve, and you look like one with it. Now you better get down here with your father while you still got the chance. Come down, Jed. Come down, or they'll kill you. We didn't do nothing. They can't prove nothing. How about it, Jed? All right. But my leg is hurt. You have to bring the ladder on to help me down. Sure. Just to make it friendly. Open that trap all the way and drop your gun down here. All right. Yeah, that's better. All right, Sheriff. Set the ladder up again. This is the gun we wanted, Steve. Yeah, forty-five. All right, Jed. Ease yourself down and I'll help you. All right. My, my leg hurts. Come on, come on. Look, we didn't do nothing. And that's all we ever going to see. We didn't do nothing, yeah. You'll love it up in Huntsville, then. It's full of innocent fellows just like you. You ready, Steve? Yeah. Sheriff? All set, Jace. Good. All right, Yancey, Jed, get moving. Throughout their trial, Yancey and Jed Coven steadfastly denied any crime. However, Jed's blood type matched the blood found in the office of Dr. Hemet, and ballistic experts definitely identified his 45 caliber gun as the weapon used to murder both Dr. Hemet and the cowboy whose body was found on Thunder Ridge. It took the jury less than two hours to bring in a verdict of guilty. The Cobans were sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for the rest of their natural lives. And now, here again is the star of our show... Joel McRae. I believe you'll enjoy an amusing story I heard recently. It comes from a young lady who lives in the Lone Star State. It seems that a Sunday school teacher was making quite an impression with the little ones in her class as she told how the pharaohs of early Egypt drove the children of Israel from that land. A little fellow in the front row was biting his nails fiercely as the teacher went on to describe the cruelties inflicted upon the Israelites. 
how they were beaten and driven forth without food or water. When the story was over, the young fry stared straight ahead. Finally, he snapped, Gee whiz, where were the Texas Rangers? See you next week, folks. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Virginia Gregg, Herb Ellis, Ed Begley, and Parley Bear. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Mercott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight... Paid in full. It is 7.45 p.m. August 18th, 1941. Nick Hubbard, a West Texas farmer, is seated at the dinner table with his wife, Min. But Hubbard is not eating. Instead, his attention is riveted on an advertisement in the newspaper before him. Will you stop staring at that thing and eat your supper, Nick? I ain't hungry. You've had your nose buried in them new car ads ever since you got the check for the cotton crop. Mm. That lot of good it's doing you. We can't buy one. We couldn't if and I didn't have to pay that Mexican for working on shares. You could have made the crop yourself if you wasn't so lazy. You want to shut up or I have to fetch you a punch in the mouth? I didn't mean nothing, Nick. I shut your trap and keep it shut. Eleven hundred dollars for my cotton, and I've got to give half of it to that Mexican. Ain't nothing he can do about it, Nick. Don't you go telling me what I can do. Doc took him and his family in, and now fed them, let them live on a shack on my land. Seems to me that's enough for any man to do for him, Nick. Worse than soap. Morales didn't chop enough cotton to make into a nightshirt. How can you say that, Nick? You got eleven hundred dollars out of his crop. Even half of that's more than you made before doing the work yourself. Ah, he knows you got the check, Nick. You can't stall him much longer. It's been three days now, and he's coming back again tonight. Reckon that's him now, Nick. Coming right up on the front porch like you own the place. You're busy with your dishes. I'll handle him. Morales, what you want? Uh, Senor Hubbard, I, I come for my money uh, for the cotton. I told you I'd bring it to you when it come. I ain't got it yet. I can't give you what I ain't got. Uh, please, Senor, por favor, I, I don't like to bother you, but my wife, she's sick. We, we're going to have another baby. Look, I got troubles of my own, Morales. Senor Hubbard, I know you got the money. I asked the cotton buyer. He tell me that everybody is paid. You checking up on me, you stinking wetback. I am not a wetback, senor. I do not sneak across the border. I am a good citizen of this country. Good citizen. <laughs> All right, come on in. Now, look. I'll tell you what I'll do, and it's better than you deserve. Yeah. There's fifty dollars. We'll call it square, and you and your brute can get off my land by morning. No, senor. No. You don't give Jose Morales fifty dollars. I want my money, senor. All my money. You better pick that 50 up, Morales, because that's all you're going to get. Senor, you do not give me the money. Tomorrow I go to a lawyer in the town. Lawyer? Oh, yeah. No, the lawyer, no. Please, please let me go, senor. You're going to take that 50 and sign a paper right now. Please. Nick, what is it? You stay out of this, man. Me and Morales just made a deal. 
Where's that pencil and some paper? In the second shelf. I cannot sign any paper, senor. Come back here, Morales. I call for the law, senor. You ain't going far. Nick, no. No, not the shotgun. Let go of me. Nick, you're crazy. Get back. Come back here, you stinking wetback. No, no. All right, then. That brush ain't going to cover you. Oh, Nick. Nick, what'd you do? Shut up, shut up, man. Nick. He's dead, Nick. What are you going to do, Nick? Shut up, shut up. Shut up, let me think. Let me think. Uh, i got to get him off the place. Help me lift him. I've got to get him off the place. I can't, Nick. I can't touch him. I can't. Help me, I said. I keep your mouth shut. Forever from now on, keep your mouth shut. Or I'll shut it like I shut his. The body of Jose Morales was discovered two days later by a field hand. It had been dumped in a thicket in rugged country near a path used as a shortcut to town. The sheriff was summoned, and he in turn asked for the help of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Good thing you were towing your horse trailer, Jace. Be a rough go on foot. That path looks like it gets plenty of use, though. Yeah, field hands use it for a shortcut to town when they're walking or mounted. Yes, they figure three miles of this is better than eight miles of highway. The body's just up ahead. I rode down a ways to meet you when I heard your horse. You said something about somebody reporting Morales missing before the body was discovered. That's right. His wife came into my office yesterday and said he hadn't been home all night. Means he might have been killed the night before last. It seems that way. Oh, here we are. Oh, boy. Oh, Charky. <laughs> right in that thicket. Shotgun, huh? Yeah. Got it behind the head and through his back. Heavy charge. Twelve gauge, probably. He just like he was found? Yeah. Wasn't killed here, then. Not killed here. Why not? We're at the head of the body. That means he'd have been walking this way, through the thicket, when he was shot. And he'd fall forward on his face toward us. Mm, that's right. All right, now look at the thicket behind his feet. The direction he would have been coming from. What about it? It hasn't been disturbed. He couldn't walk through that thicket without breaking some of it down. Besides, he wouldn't be walking off the path. I uh, see what you mean. He must have been on the path when he was shot then. Never gunned him, carried the body over this way, and dumped him into the thicket. Let's have a look at that path around here. Well, blood from his wounds should have left a mark someplace, a stain on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, nothing here. No sign of blood, no sign of the earth being scuffed over to hide it. No. Yeah, we're not going to find anything. Not around here. He'd been dumped when that wound was fresh. We'd have found something by now. He was brought in here after all the bleeding had stopped because somebody didn't want the body found where he was killed. Well, that means we've got to find out where. It's not going to be easy. It never is. There's one good thing about it. Once we do find the place, it isn't going to be far from the killer or the body wouldn't have been moved. There's nothing else for us to see here. Lab man's flying in from Austin. Might find something when the medical examiner does an autopsy. Uh, I'll have to stay here a while. Men who directed you here are bringing pack animals to take the body into town. There's no sense in both of us staying. I'll get started. Hey, you know where Morales lived? Yeah, shack near the cotton fields on the north rim of Nick Hubbard's farm. Yeah. Thanks, Sheriff. Ah. Don't suppose you know if Morales was having trouble with anybody? Uh, not that I know of, Jace. I reckon his family might know something, though. Or maybe the Hubbards. I'll see them both. Meet you in town when I'm finished. Okay, Jace. Get around, Chuck. Up, boy. Come on, let's go. I got back to my car, loaded charcoal into the horse trailer, and drove to the Hubbard farm. Hubbard wasn't there, but his wife was out back scrubbing clothes. She was trembling and kept wetting her lips as she spoke to me, and I could see that she'd been crying. Yes. We we heard about it maybe an hour ago. Somebody called on the party line to tell my husband. Where's your husband now, Mrs. Hubbard? He, he drove out to the Morales shack to tell Mrs. Morales and see if maybe there wasn't something he could do for her and the kids. Morales worked chairs for us, you know. And so the sheriff told me. I, I don't know what, what his woman will do now. How far is the shack Morales lived in? A little over a mile. Our place goes back quite a ways. Landing too good. We got a lot of it. Morales ever come here to your house? I mean. 
Only when he had some business with Nick, my husband. When was the last time? I, I don't rightly know, Ranger. Like I said, he'd come to see Nick. Well, he'd probably be around when he came, though. When was the last time you saw him? I can't say for sure. I'm too upset to think. Oh, there comes Nick now. There's his car coming across the field. Good. Maybe he'll know something. I'd like to know if Morales was here the night before last. Nick will know for sure. He'll tell you. Howdy, Ranger. Howdy. So your car here is how it's coming across. Mighty slick looking here. Puts my old bus to shame. Nick, the Ranger wants to know some things about Morales. Well, I can figure that for myself, man. What else would he want to know about? Yeah, I just left his widow. This thing's hit her kind of hard. Sure feel sorry for him and them kids. I know. Of course, men and me will do anything we can to help them. I told her they could stay out of the shack, men. And that we wasn't fixing to charge him no rent nor nothing. Poor woman. I mean, hold on, yes. Your wife can't help how she feels, Mr. Herbert. There's just a couple of things I want to know. When'd you see Morales last? Your wife couldn't remember. Yeah, you sure are broken up, men. You ought to remember Morales is here night before last. I... I wasn't sure, Nick. Night before last, huh? What time? Why, just after we finished supper, eight o'clock, maybe. The same night he was killed. What? You mean he's been dead that long? Judging by the appearance of the body, yes. We'll know for sure when the medical examiner gets finished with him, but why are you so surprised? Well, I mean, he was only found a little while ago. He's been missing since the night before last, though. His wife reported that to the sheriff's office yesterday. You knew that, didn't you? Well, sure I knew it, but, uh... Well, I figured he was off on a tube celebrating with that roll of money. What roll of money? Money I paid him for working shares on a cotton. Is that when you paid him? When he was here night before last? Sure, handed him $550. That's why I'm surprised men didn't remember him stopping by. Why, you remember, men. You was there when I handed him the cash and he made his X on that receipt I wrote out. I wasn't sure of the night. So he had $550 cash on him. Well, now I can see a reason for his being murdered. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's the matter? What? Something Mrs. Morales told me just a while ago when I was over there. About a field hand who dropped in the night Morales disappeared. He wanted to borrow some money. Waited around for him, but when he didn't come, the fella said he'd walk down toward my place here and see if he couldn't meet Morales on the way. She mentioned the field hand's name? Uh, can't remember. Uh, Shorty, I think. Shorty something. Anybody show up here that night looking for Morales? No, not while he was here, not after he left. Wasn't nobody, was there, man? No. Must have met Morales. Away from here then, Ranger. Hmm? Maybe the man you're after. Sure looks mighty possible, Hubbard. I'm going to see Mrs. Morales and find out who that man was. You want to point out the way? You better than that, Ranger. I'll ride out with you. Fine. Let's go. Goodbye, Miss Hubbard. Bye, man. Back later. Bye. Sure is a smooth car you got here, Ranger. <laughs> I won't get me a new car soon. Oh, oh she sure do hum, don't she? Yeah. Am I heading right? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Straight across the field and follow that fence line. Sure is a shame about Morales. But uh, I reckon you ain't going to have much work once this woman tells you who that fellow was, the shorty. Yeah, it looks like you had a motive, all right. Sounds like the killer to me. I hope you get him, Ranger. Morales is a mighty fine Mexican. Mighty fine. Hate to see anybody get away with killing him. Man, this is a fine car, ain't it? Ha! Listen to her purr. <laughs> In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. But first, here is an important announcement. Next Sunday, over most of these same NBC stations, you will hear Tales of the Texas Rangers at a new and earlier time. Yes, beginning next Sunday, listen one hour and a half earlier for this program. This new earlier time will bring you Tales of the Texas Rangers immediately following the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show and right before Theater Guild on the Air. Remember, next Sunday, tune in one hour and a half earlier for Tales of the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae 
And tonight's case paid in full, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. The Morales shack was threadbare, but scrubbed clean like the two wide-eyed kids who clung to their mother's skirts. There was heartbreak in her eyes. She kept it smothered for the sake of her children till she sent them outside so we could talk. Go, go. Play in the back. Papito, help Rosa find her dog. I... I try not to cry when they are near me. Uh, take it easy, Mrs. Morales. Easy? What is easy? Life is hard for me, for them. And now they have no father to help me. Now, now, everything's going to be all right. I, I told you you can stay on here rent-free and everything. We didn't want to stay here. We were going to move away and get a little place of our own for the new baby that's going to come. As soon as you came, we'll say he's morning. Why do you make him wait so long? Well, I... For three days, every day he asked you for his share. And you keep saying you don't give the check yet. But you did. What is this, Hubbard? Well, it's just a little misunderstanding, Ranger. I can explain it. I, I didn't want to give Jose the money. I wanted to give it to Mrs. Morales here. I asked him to bring her down to the house and collect it. Why? Why, for her sake and the sake of the kids. You know how some sharecroppers are. I might have taken all that dough and blown it in on a tequila bin. Jose would not spend our money that way. He was a good husband. Well, I got no way of being sure of that. I was just trying to look out for you and your youngsters. Is that a crime? No. But while you were being so considerate, you could have driven out here with the money instead of expecting this woman to walk to your place to get it. Mrs. Morales. Mr. Hubbard says you told him about somebody coming here to borrow money from your husband the night he didn't come home. See, a man who worked with us at some place once before, two years ago. They call him Shorty. Shorty Davis. You tell him your husband had gone down to Hubbard's place? He. Then he said he would not wait anymore. He would walk down and try to meet Jose. Then he went away. That's all. You see, it's just like I told you, Ranger. Probably met Jose, talked him into going to town when he found out he had the money. Then he murdered him when he got him off on that shortcut trail. My poor husband. Now, don't you worry. They'll get that shorty fella. We haven't got him yet, Hubbard. A couple of things don't fit. Mrs. Morales, did Shorty Davis have a shotgun with him when he came by? No. Probably had the whole thing planned in advance, Ranger. Had the gun stashed away on the shortcut. It still doesn't add up. How Why not? Because Morales wasn't killed on the shortcut. He was killed someplace else and taken out there. Yeah, how do you know that? Because there'd be certain signs at the scene of the murder that weren't around where the body was found. You mean like blood on the ground? Things like that? Yeah, things like that. So, uh... Shorty must have killed him someplace else. Somebody did. We'll pick Shorty up and see what he's got to say. Goodbye, Miss Morales. Goodbye. Come on, Hubbard. I'll drive you home. When I got back to the sheriff's office, it was late afternoon, and the medical examiner and our lab man had finished. The sheriff had a complete report. Hoping this speaks to your approval. Oh, the report's right there on my desk, Jay. Snap top folder. Thanks, Sheriff. You were trying to Anything special in this lab report? Yeah, a few things. Yeah, let me show you. Look here. Shot followed a downward path, indicating that the gun was fired from above and behind the victim. Pattern of shot spread and number of pellets striking target from normal number of pellets in regulation 12-gauge shell... Further indicates that shot came from approximately 20 yards behind victim with gun muzzle at high level. That's pretty interesting, isn't it, Jase? Plenty interesting. Means that Morales must have been shot by somebody who was standing on something above the ground level, or maybe somebody mounted. Mm, that's the way it shapes up. You know anything about a field hand named Shorty Davis? Yeah, I've been around here for quite some time. You know where to find him? He doesn't live anyplace regular, just grubs around. Got hurt in an accident before the cotton season and never had a chance to put any money by. I reckon he's mighty hard up. What do you want him? Tell you why we're looking. Let's find him. We combed the town until midnight, but there was no sign of Shorty Davis. I called my headquarters, and with the sheriff supplying a description, put out a statewide pickup. It was just after dawn when it paid off. Shorty Davis was picked up by the highway patrol less than 50 miles away. They brought him back to us. All right, Shorty. Sit down over there. Mr. Sheriff, what for those men bring me back yet? I ain't done nothing. If you haven't, you'll be taken back to where you were picked up. Meanwhile, where were you going? 
Just heading for El Paso to see my folks, Mr. Ranger. Kind of sudden decision, Shorty. You've been hanging around here for months. I couldn't go before, sir. I was waiting to get me some money. Now you mean you've got money now? Why, yes, sir. Where'd you get it, Shorty? What, what? From my accident. You remember the accident I had, sir, when Mr. Hoxie Wilson hit me with his automobile? Well, the lawyer man, Mr. Corby, he got me some settlement money for getting hit. Is that the truth, Shorty? Won't take long to find out if it isn't. I wouldn't lie to you at all, sir. You could ask Mr. Hoxie Wilson. You better call him and check, Sheriff. No, I sure will. I'm right here. Give me Hoxie Wilson's place. Yeah, Hoxie Wilson. Mr. Ranger, where did the sheriff think I got the money? You'll find out later, Shorty. How much have you got? Well, uh, I had a hundred dollars. Just spent a couple for eating yesterday. Hello, Hoxie. When did you leave town? Yesterday morning. Fine, what time? Early, right after the bank opened and Mr. Hoxie got me the money. Then you didn't know that Jose Morales was found dead yesterday morning? Dead? Murdered. He was murdered the night you stopped by his shack to see him. I never did see him that night. But you did stop by the shack. Yes, sir, but he wasn't home. His wife tell you that, sir. His story about the money is okay, Jace. Sir, I ain't telling you no stories. I'm telling you the truth. Well, just keep on telling. Go ahead, Jace. I've been listening with one ear. Mrs. Morales told you where her husband was, didn't she? She said he was at Hubbard Farm, that's all. And didn't you leave the shack saying you'd go down to the farm and meet him? Yes, sir. I wanted to get the lender some money from Jose. He knew me. We worked together once. He loaned me before, and I always paid him back. We ain't asking about your credit rating, Shorter. What we want to know is what happened after you met Morales. I never did meet him. Well, nobody at Mr. Hubbard's place. The Hubbards weren't there? No, sir. I knocked hard on the back door, and there wasn't nobody there at all. Now, you have been mighty sure what you're saying, Shorty. I am sure, Mr. Sheriff. That old house was just plain empty. Jose wasn't there. I thought maybe he'd come back, or maybe he hadn't been there yet. So I went over in the field and sat me down on the stump and waited. Then Mr. Hubbard and his wife, they drove up real slow. Had a couple of horses hitched to the back of the car. Horses? Yes, sir. What kind of story are you trying to invent? I ain't inventing nothing, Mr. Sheriff. That's gospel. Didn't the Hubbard see you? No, sir. Like I said, I was in the field, sitting by a stone. Well, didn't you let him know you were there? No, sir. It was Morales I come to meet, and he wasn't with him. I didn't want Mr. Hubbard raising a fuss with me and ask me what I was doing around his property at night. No, sir. That man, he mean. Jeez. Hubbard wouldn't be towing horses around at night without a reason. The only reason I can think of is for packing something to a place he couldn't get to in his car. You mean like packing Morales' body up that shortcut trail? That's right. But why'd they kill him? Because Hubbard was lying about paying Morales' his share in that cotton crop. He acted mighty funny when it came out he'd stalled about paying. Shorty? Yes, sir? I want you to repeat your story and we'll type it. Yes, sir. Take your statement. Statement. Yes. After that, Sheriff, we're going out and have a good look at Hubbard's farm. A darn good look. I know. Uh, excuse me a minute. Hello? Speaking. Hello? Sheriff, what's the matter? That was Doc Barker. Mrs. Morales come into the funeral parlor to see her husband. She fainted fell. Jeez, she lost her baby. We headed for Hubbard's farm, but we parked off the road about a half mile away and cut across the fields on foot, hoping we could check around outside the house without being spotted. We were in the cover of some trees, and we saw Mrs. Hubbard come from the back of the house carrying a wash tub. What the devil is she doing with that wash tub, Jeez? I don't know. Don't let her see you. Hey... She's dumping it by the brush. Yeah. Well, why didn't she dump it in back? Never saw a woman carry a laundry tub around to the front of the house to dump it. Unless she was growing something. A lot more than one tub full has been dumped in that spot. Look at that ground. It's soaked. Come on. Don't let her see us. I want to find out what she's doing. Hubbard isn't around. The garage shed is open and the car isn't there. Just a minute, Miss Hubbard. Oh, it's you, Ranger. And the sheriff. That's a funny place you picked to empty a laundry tub, ma'am. Well, I... The ground seemed kind of dry. It's dry all around here, except for this one spot by the brush. Quite a lot of water's been dumped here. Much more than you had in that tub. Take a look around, Sheriff. Well, what are you looking for? Maybe a couple of blood stains dried into the ground. Uh, if there was anything here, Jace, we're too late now. Mud's an inch thick. Clear to the base of this brush. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but there's one thing that's still here. 
Take a look, Sheriff. What is it? The leaves on this brush. Holes ripped through some of the leaves, just the way they'd be if a shotgun charge came through. They've been some, some bugs. Bugs never made these holes, ma'am. Sheriff, look at the porch of the house. How far away did you say it was? Well, maybe 18, 20 yards. What makes... Hey, the lab report said the shot was fired from approximately 20 yards. With a muzzle level above the victim, and that porch is the only elevated spot it could have come from. Hubbard must have fired from there. That ain't so. Nick didn't kill Morales. He didn't. He did, and you know it. When I asked you when you'd seen Morales last, you kept stalling your answer until your husband came. He's committed two murders, if the truth is known, men. Because Mrs. Morales just lost the baby she was carrying. Oh, no, no. Nick is your husband, men, but lying for somebody like him ain't right before earth or heaven. You know it. I told him not to do it. I begged him to pay Morales, but he was greedy, greedy. He... He took a shotgun and... Where is the gun, ma'am? In the house. I'll show you. I can't go on with this no more. All last night, he was dumping water out there by the brush where Morales fell. Something you said yesterday about blood stain scared him. It scared me, too. That's why I brought the laundry water out there. I couldn't stop thinking about it. There's the gun. There in the corner. Maybe I ain't a fit wife. Maybe I shouldn't have told you, but I feel better about it now. I feel better. Some night, maybe I'll sleep again if I live to be old enough. Where's your husband now, Mrs. Hubbard? I don't know. He left this morning before sunup to drive to Center City. He said he'd be back before noon. I guess we'll just sit and wait then, if you don't mind. Hey, wait a minute, Sheriff. Car coming up the drive now. Take a look out through those curtains. That ain't Nick's car. That, that one's brand spanking new. That's Nick in it, though. So that's what he went to see the city for. She's right, Sheriff. That man really loves new cars. Yeah, stand back from the window. Let him come in. Hey, man! Come give your eyes a treat. I... Howdy, Hubbard. Yeah, hi. Howdy, Sheriff. Ranger. And why are you looking at me like that? I told him, Nick. I told him everything. I told him how you cheated Morales, how you shot him in the back. Shut up! Shut the crazy mouth! No, you don't. Don't try that again. Now get up. Mrs. Morales lost her baby, Nick. Ain't you proud of that? While you was buying your new car, she was losing her baby. Don't, Ben. Don't say any more. Please, Ben. You got a new car, didn't you, Nick? <laughs> you know where you're going to drive in it, don't you, Nick? You know where. Take care of her, Sheriff. I'll take him. Right, jeez. Come on, Nick. Let's go. At his trial, Nick Hubbard broke down and confessed to the murder of Jose Morales. He was sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for the rest of his life. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Virginia Gregg, Whitfield Connor, Ed Begley, and Jester Hairston. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tonight, transcribe from Hollywood another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. the fire.
files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Square Dance. It is 9.50 p.m. Saturday night, October 14th, 1949. There is a square dance in progress at the Fun Spot, a barn-like dance hall on the outskirts of Bankerville in West Texas. Mrs. Mort Rogers, a rancher's wife, is seated in a corner, waiting for her husband to return with some soda pop. She looks up as a stranger approaches. Well, looks like I found me a pretty old wallflower. How come you ain't dancing, man? Reckon I'm a little out of breath from the last one. My husband went to fetch me some soda pop. Good. While he's fetching it, you and me can dance. Not a couple needing that square over there. Come on. No, uh, no, thank you. But I, I, I'd rather wait for him. Oh, you're just going to waste sitting there. Come on. Oh, please, I, I'd rather not. Oh, I ain't the kind of a man who takes no for an answer, especially from a pretty girl. I told you I don't want to dance with you. Let go of my arm, please. Come on, man. What's going on here? What's the matter, Harry? Oh, uh, I, I was waiting for you. And, and I just had him buy an answer for a dance, that's all. And left finger marks all over arm. Looks like you asked pretty rough. Ain't no harm done. You want to get hard about it? Take these pop bottles, Harry. I'm not doing I said take them. Now, you want to repeat that question? Uh, place is probably full of friends of yours. I don't know anybody around here. I... It just happened in. Why don't you just happen out? Before you get in trouble. Go ahead, beat it. All right. Well, maybe I'll meet you alone sometime. Any time you want to try. No, more, please. Let him go. I'm all right. Well, it seems to be somebody like that. Wandering in where people haven't found him. Forget about him. He went out. Drink your pot. Here. Look at you, honey. You're shaking. Not from here. There's a little chili in here now. I thought. Oh, where's that little jacket you bought? I left it out in the car. I'll go fetch it for you. Ain't that cold, more? No, no, no. Just turn him blue as <laughs> All right. Would you mind getting the phone? Oh, I said I would, didn't I? Any more strangers ask you to dance, hit them with that pop bottle. <laughs> I'll be all right. Jack is in the back seat. All right, I'll find him. Well, huh? look who's here. Well, it's you, huh? What you doing hanging around these cars? Thought I told you to get lost. Better watch your tongue. You ain't surrounded by friends now. <laughs> yeah, I figured you'd follow me out. I didn't follow you out. I come out to get my wife's jacket. And as for friends, mister, I don't need any to hand the likes of you. Now, why don't you get while the getting's good? Too bad your wife didn't come out to get her own jacket. Yeah, she's kind of cute. <laughs> Shut up. Right yeah, now. If I would have asked her to dance if she hadn't given me the eye. Right. Yeah. Right. Come on, get up. Get up and fight. Or get up and run. I'll fight. Or we'll fight my way with this. I might have known someone like you. Carry a knife. You're going to know it. Just once more for good measure. Guess your wife ain't gonna be so particular who she dances with from now on. Oh, when Mort Rogers failed to return to the dance, his wife came out to look for him. Her screams as she found the body brought dancers streaming from the hall. Somebody summoned the sheriff, and he in turn called for the help of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. He arrived at the parking lot outside the fun spot shortly after midnight. Howdy, Sheriff. Well, howdy, Jace. I'm glad you were close by. Here's the body. Mm-hmm. Radio was buzzing with calls as I drove in. KTXA's origin roadblock set up on every highway near here for 100 miles. Yeah, I know. I phoned in a description of a stranger who was at the dance tonight. Yeah, I heard it. 
Let's hope they can pick him up. Well, they'd have got him sure if I'd had the description earlier, but it took almost an hour to get Miss Rogers so she could talk. Is she the dead man's wife? Yep. Saw the whole thing then, huh? No. No, she was inside when it happened. Come out and found the body. Well, then why the pickup for the stranger in particular? Rogers have trouble with him? Just words. Nothing anybody saw. It tried to force Miss Rogers to dance with him the way she tells it. Rogers come along, saw what was going on, and ordered the fella out. The whole thing happened less than two hours ago. The killer can't be too far away, then. Yeah, far enough. Yeah, but if the roadblocks don't pick him up, we'll know he's either living or hiding within a two-hour ride from here. Could be a hundred yards away or a hundred miles away. Even then, he might not be the one. Over 60 couple at the dance tonight. Any one of them could have stepped outside. I haven't let a car pull out since I got here. Good. You shake everybody down? Yeah, didn't find anything on anybody, though. Deputy has two knives and a gun that were ditched under benches when he started searching. Knives clean? As far as I could tell. We'll send them through to Austin, make sure. If there's any blood left on one of them, the lab will find it. Yeah. We're not going to have to wait for that, though. Not if the killer's still around. Why? This wound on Roger's throat cut the juggler. See how the blood spurted out. Killer couldn't miss getting some of that blood on his clothes. You check for that on the shakedown? Well, just their hands, see. Well, you better line them up again inside. Blood's had time to dry. Killer may have had a chance to try and wash it out, but we'll have to check every suspicious-looking stain. Well, I got the names and addresses of everybody in the place. Good. You can use that as a checklist. Make sure nobody's taken a run out since you got here. Deputy's been stationed all around. All doors have been locked, except this one leading out to the parking lot. I had to let folks out here because some of them have got babies sleeping in their cars. Yeah, I understand. Well, let's get them in. Right. All right, inside again, folks. Everybody inside. Joe, Charlie Higgins, don't let any stragglers hang back. Keep them moving. Hey, you better send one of your deputies into town. Dig up some clothes from the jail or someplace. If you find any suspicious stains, a few of these people mightn't have anything to wear home. The sheriff's list checked out 100%. Nobody to run. A couple of cop folks had stains on their shirts and jeans. We took their clothes and sent them through to Austin for analysis. Next morning, I got my report. A long-distance call from my chief, Captain Stinson. Austin Lab just finished with the stuff you sent through, Jace. Both the knives were clean. I see. How about the clothing, Captain? Well, there was human blood on one of the shirts. A small stain. According to your report, the cop folk you got it from said he'd cut himself and got a little blood on it. Lab says a blood stain is type O. Type O, huh? That's right. Well, he's not our boy, then. Medical examiner did an autopsy on Rogers during the night. Rogers' blood was AB. Everything keeps pointing to the stranger who got away. Do you think Mrs. Rogers gave a good description? Well, I think so. She gave me the same rundown she gave the sheriff. Claims she'll never forget what he looked like. Do you think she'd recognize a photo of him if she saw it? I'm sure she would. Good. The boys at Austin are going through the gallery pulling shots of all known criminals who fit that description. Especially the ones who are too free with a knife. I'll bring the photos down myself. Let Mrs. Rogers go over them. While I'm waiting, I think I'll have a look through the ranch area around here. All we know about the man we're after is that he got away. We don't know whether he was in a car or on foot or mounted. A few cow folks did come into the dance on horses. I see. The fellow we're looking for might be a new hand just drifted into the territory. I got charcoal in my horse trailer. Sheriff's getting his mount. You'll keep us busy until you get here, unless you have another idea. No, Jace, you go ahead. I'll see you tonight. Right. Bye, Captain. Bye, Jace. Ready, Sheriff? If you are, my mount's all saddled. I'll get charcoal out of the trailer. Let's go. <laughs> from ranch to ranch, taking shortcuts through the gullies and arroyos, working through the good grazing as well as the badlands, riding close to get a good look at cowpokes working the range wherever we spotted them. We're on Blue Baker's land now. Be able to see the ranch house when we reach the end of these trees. How many hands he got on the place? Three. They've been around for quite a spell, unless he took on a new one. Brubaker. That seems to me his name was on the list of folks who were at the dance. Yeah, he was there with his wife. Well, then he was asked if he'd noticed the stranger. Asked everybody that. If anybody by that description was working for him, he'd spoke up. Well, I thought we might talk to his hands. 
Right. Even if they weren't at the dance, they might have noticed a stranger around someplace. Possible. Worth a try. Yeah. Hey, there's Blue Baker now climbing into his tractor there with the tool shed. Hey, Blue Baker! He sees us. Howdy, Sheriff. I hear you. Oh, boy. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. yeah. Howdy. Howdy. Glad to see you, Sheriff. Matter of fact, I've been thinking of phoning you. You got some information on the Rogers case? Well, no. It's something I guess I shouldn't even be bothering you with right now. Just wanted to put in a little complaint. What kind of complaint, Brubaker? Well, see, just before the dance last night, the missus and me did some shopping in town. Matter of fact, going to the dance was an afterthought. Just decided to drop in when we was driving home and pass the fun spot. Mm -hmm. Well, see, like I said, I hate to bother you about it, but uh, a couple of things were stolen out of my pickup. While we was at the dance. New bridle I'd bought in town and a new pair of wire clippers. Are you sure those things were taken while you were at the dance? Well, they couldn't have been taken any place else. They were the last things we bought before we went to the dance. Put them on the shelf behind the cab seat. Could be something to this, Jay. Yeah, sure could. Anybody stealing things from a car wouldn't be doing it while you and your deputies were all over the place. And we were there till after everybody had cleared out. Mm. Stuff must have been taken out of Brubaker's pickup before Rogers was killed. As a matter of fact, Rogers might have surprised somebody going through the cars. I wouldn't rule out the stranger we're looking for. He left the dance hall before Rogers went outside. Bridle and wire clippers wouldn't be easy to trace. I wonder if he might have taken something else. Well, I haven't had any other complaints. People don't always complain. Thanks, Blue Baker. Come on, Sheriff. Let's get back to town. Sure. So long. So long. Get up, Charlie. Come on. Now, let's go. You planning to check over that dance list again? We'll call every name on it. See if anything else was taken from that parking lot. Up, Charlie. Come on, boy. Let's go. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tonight, over most of these NBC stations, Theater Guild on the Air will feature Raymond Massey and Shirley Booth in Ethan Frome. Mr. Massey also starred in the play's original production in 1936, while Miss Booth is well known for her dramatic performances on radio and the Broadway stage. Remember to hear them on the Theater Guild on the Air presentation of Ethan Frome tonight. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and tonight's case, Square Dance. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. The sheriff and his deputies started a phone check of people who'd been at the dance, asking them to list missing articles. Meanwhile, Captain Stinson drove in with the gallery shots of possible suspects. We took them over to the funeral home to see if Mrs. Rogers could identify the stranger who quarreled with her husband. Captain showed him to her, one by one. <laughs> Uh, how about this one, Mrs. Rogers? No. Well, this is the last one. No. That's not him either. Hey, yes, that does it, Jace. The man we're after isn't a known criminal. Not in this state, anyhow. Can I... Can I go back to my husband now? I, I want to be near him until they have... <laughs> sure, ma'am. Go ahead. We wasn't even married a year. This month, we'd have had our first anniversary. I might as well get back to the sheriff's office, Captain. Yeah. A young bride like that. A nice future the killer left her. We gotta get him. I'll stay on until hey, I... Hey, Captain! Oh, there's the sheriff now. Looks like we've hit something on that phone check, Jace. Deputy just got a call from Perny Richards. Not the old man, but Perny Jr. Something missing from his car? Yeah. Ladies, Hamilton wristwatch. Perny bought it for his gal's birthday. Left it in the glove compartment of the car. Was fixing to surprise her with it today. Hey, that's going to help, Jace. Plenty. New purchase like that, the jeweler will have a record of the serial number on the watch. Killer might try to sell it or pawn it someplace. He might just give it to some gal. I don't think so. Man we're after doesn't sound like he'd have a gal of his own. Come on. Let's get a rundown on that watch. The 
We got the serial number and put out a bulletin to jewelers and pawn shops, all the logical places where a man might dispose of a watch. Because it was Sunday, we had a break. The bulletins would be on file before the killer had a chance to unload. Meanwhile, Captain Stinson was in phone contact with Austin, digging up another angle. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I wanted. Well, thanks. No, not necessarily. Mightn't mean anything, but it can't hurt us. I'll call you later if I need anything else. Right. Goodbye. I have anything? A little. I asked them to check open files, unsolved cases of petty theft, especially things taken from cars in dance hall parking lots. There must be plenty of cases like that. The same man wouldn't be responsible for all of them. No, but a couple of cases follow a pattern, Jase. I've written them down. Now, look here. Portable radio stolen from a car a week before last outside of Elderton. Roadhouse there was having a square dance. And here's a constable's report. Same night, same place. Man answering the description of our stranger got in a beef. He pulled a knife on a fella. Didn't get a chance to use it, though. And ran before the law could get there. Hey, that's good. Now, here's another one. Also a square dance. South of here at Pa's Crossing. Happened a month ago. Manager at the dance hall ordered some fella out for bothering a woman. Again, the same description. Fella went outside and threw a rock through a window and got away. Cars had been looted. That's our boy, all right. Yeah, but we still don't know who he is. Uh, something we do know, though. Look at this county map. He's been here in Bankerville, west of here in Elderton, and south of here at Pars Crossing, all within a month. Yeah, that's right. Means he must be living in this area or hanging around at some place. And draw a circle around the three spots he's been seen at. Gives us a radius of about 40 miles in any direction. And that fits. Because he wasn't picked up in the roadblocks. I don't know, Jase. He's been a stranger in all three places. And they're the only towns around here. Most of the area in the middle of your circle is hill country and badlands. And not many ranches he might be working on. No, but there's a lot of prospecting going on in those badlands, Captain. Big new kick. Not gold or silver anymore. Uranium. Hmm. Hey, not many people would see a prospector. Not unless he had a habit of wandering into some town on a Saturday night with a yen for square dancing. All right, Jase, I'll buy it. What's your move? Thought the sheriff and I might do a little prospecting, too. <laughs> Uranium? No. A man with a knife. <laughs> Sheriff put in with me. Next morning, we loaded his horse into my trailer with charcoal and headed into the Badlands. The old settlement's up ahead. We can leave the car at Red Miller's store. I thought the settlement was deserted. Well, it was for a few years, but Miller opened up again because of this prospecting thing. Reckon they give him enough trade to keep going. It's either they buy from him or take a car trip every time they have to lay in supplies. I never thought of that. Miller may have seen our man. Possible. Coming into the settlement now. Hmm. Ghost town. Where's the store? Long Derby building just ahead. A lot of cars parked under a shed just behind it. I, I see it. Boy, I hope he's got some soft drinks and a way of keeping them cold. This sun's a scorcher. Well, we'll be able to wet your whistle in a minute. Yeah, here we are. Yeah. Hardly think Miller could make a living here. Well, there's just him and his old lady. I reckon they don't need much to get by. Huh? Looks like we'll be his only customers. Hello? Anybody here? Oh, well, lad. If it ain't Sheriff Gooner, howdy. Howdy, Miss Miller. Uh, this here is Ranger Jace Pearson. Hello, Hello ma'am. Uh, where's uh, Reb, Miss Miller? Oh, now he's just plain gonna die because he missed you, Sheriff. But he drove up to Elton to see the doc. She's back again. Oh, that's too bad. But he'll be back for supper if and you can stay. We might have to. Depends on whether or not you can help us. Somebody here can help us, all right. What is it, Jace? Take a look in this showcase. What? Well, I'll be. I'd called his attention to something that stood out like a sore thumb. The store was run down, its shelves barely stocked with necessities. But there before our eyes, in a dirty showcase with cracks running through the glass, was a brand new Hamilton wristwatch. Reb is stocking some mighty fancy merchandise, ain't he, Ms. Miller? 
You mean that watch? You want to buy it? All we want to know is where you got it. Well, Reb took it in trade from a fellow who run a bill here. What's his name? Why, Carp's his last name. Don't know his first one. That, uh, that watch ain't stolen, is it? We can tell you that in a minute. Get it out of the case, Sheriff. Right. You remember the serial number? Yeah, I got it written down in my book. Pry the back cover off. <laughs> yeah, fingernails won't do it. I'll have to find something. When did this carp bring the watch in, ma'am? Well, yesterday, Sunday. Reb's always trusting people, you know. Carp owed him more than twenty dollars. Instead of cash, he give Reb the watch and a pair of wire clippers. Wire clippers? You hear that, Sheriff? I sure did. I'll have this watch case open in a minute. Oh, I told Reb not to trust nobody. Reckon Carp wouldn't even trade here if he had cash. Couldn't give Reb no money. Oh, no, but when he come back yesterday, he had new bridle for his horse. Reckon he had to pay cash for that someplace. You're reckoning wrong, Mrs. Miller. He got that bridle the same way he got the watch and wire clippers. Yep, yeah, that does it. Here's the number, Jace. H-427-991. H-4279. That's it, all right. Harp's our boy. Where is he? Well, he's out in the hills, I reckon. He saddled up and rode off after he brought our car back yesterday. He had your car? All Saturday night, Sheriff. You know Reb. He'll lend anything to anybody. That's why we ain't got nothing ourselves. Carp never even paid him for the gas he used up. Then he had the nerve to borrow his shirt and jeans while he used my tub to scrub out his old clothes. And water scarce as it is. <laughs> Don't need two guesses what he was scrubbing for, Sheriff. You can say that again. Come on, Sheriff. Let's get the horses and move. Well, look here. Don't you want to know what he looks like? Thanks, ma'am. But that's something we already know. It was rough going through the Badlands, and the territory we had to cover was big. We met prospectors here and there, but not carp. At the end of our second day, the trail led to rocky ground, thinning out in spots and disappearing in others. We kept going until the sun dipped under the rim and darkness came past. Oh, I can't see anything, Jace. If the tracks were heavier, we could keep going, but the ground's too hard. I can't pick up marks like that in a flashlight. I know. Better find a campsite and rustle some grub. Well, you can do the eating. All I want is a place to rest my bones. We'll find a spot when we get on level ground. Up, Charlie. Come on. Come on, boy. Sheriff. Yeah? It's like somebody solved our camp problem for us. Over there at the right. Sparks. Yeah, fire behind those rocks. Circle around. Cart, maybe. Could be. It's a cinch at somebody. Let's ride for it. Up, boy. Come on. Come on. Come on. See the fire now, Jace. Man getting up. He can't see us yet. Here's us coming. Looks like a big fella. Carp is big. Mrs. Rogers said about 6'3. His horse is there, Jace. He's moving over toward it. He'll be able to see us in a minute. Drift away from me. Leave a little distance between us. All right. Get over, boy. That's good. Seems to be waiting. <sighs> Don't go all the way in mounted. Pull up and we'll walk to him. Whoa, whoa, oh, Chuck. Oh, whoa, boy. Oh. <sighs> Keep the same distance. Yeah. Who's that out there? We're looking for somebody. Who? I'll tell you in a minute. Keep your eyes open, Sheriff. Maybe you better tell me now. A fellow named Carp. Is that you? What do you want to see Carp about? It's kind of a personal matter. Unless you're Carp. He got behind his horse, Jason. You stay right where you are. Hold it, Sheriff. Ooh, ooh, Chuck. Ooh. Ooh. Pull the rifle from his saddle holster. You girls better get mounted and ride off. I don't like anybody sneaking around me at night. And I don't like getting mounted and riding away from a fire. Makes my back too good a target. So you... You look like a Texas Ranger. You got good eyes. And I'm a sheriff, Carp. So don't try anything funny. Put that rifle down and let's have a talk. Oh. Well, what do you want... What do you want to see me about? I want to invite you to a square dance. You... Hit the dirt, Sheriff. Oh. He dropped down. Roll behind the fire, Jason. Can't see him. Can't see us either. Must be close behind that fire. Shoot into it. Chip sparks off that heavy log that's burning. Might be able to shower him with a big hot foot. I say when. Let go. 
That did it, Jace. He's up. Drop your gun, pal. I'll kill you. Ah. Ah. You hit him, Jace. There he is. And there's his gun on the ground. Gun stock split. That's what I hit, not him. Shock knocked him out. Well, just the same. He's out cold. And while he's laying here, I might just as well get these cuffs on his head. Look out, Sheriff! Oh, shut your heart up! Drop that knife! Let it go! Oh, my arm! Thank you, Jace. He almost planted that in my ribs. Yeah, it's something he won't try again. Come on, Carp. Get up. Hey, Josh. Save your story for the jury, Carp. Maybe you can tell them how to be a big hit at a square dance. Come on, get moving. Uh. Randolph Carp was tried and convicted for the murder of rancher Mort Rogers. The final piece of evidence against Carp was a bloody fingerprint on the steering column of the car he had borrowed from storekeeper Reb Miller. It was Carp's right thumbprint, and the blood specimen matched the type of the slain man. Carp was sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for a term of 99 years. Here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. A famous Texas ranger was once asked what he considered the most important quality in a ranger. Well, he pondered, I liken a good ranger to that broad-brimmed hat of mine hanging over there on that old steer horn. It's made of some sort of fabric that holds up and it takes the toughest handling I've ever seen. Must be in the character of the material, I guess, because as old as that hat is, it's never showed a sign of going to pieces. I never did like hats or men that'll come unglued. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lou Krugman, Betty Moran, Harley Bear, Byron Kane, Joe Forte, and Jeanette Nolan. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murkoff, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keats. Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on facts. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Joyride. It is 9.40 p.m. December 3rd, 1946. The small town of Purdy, Texas, is quiet and ready for sleep as a car turns off the state highway and into the main street. At the wheel of the car is a pimply-faced youth. Beside him, a young girl. That car still behind us? No, it kept right on the highway. What are you so jumpy about? The way he was tagging us, I thought it might be the highway patrol. You are getting chicken, ain't you, Chuck? I ain't fixing to go back to no reform school, that's all. Oh, stop worrying. This car ain't even reported stolen yet. You saw the owner go into the movie, didn't you? Okay, Ruby, okay. Fun joy, right? Thought we was going to have fun. You ain't got anything to drink. I ain't got any money. Didn't have no car either when we started. You ain't like you used to be, Chuck. 
Well, you should have lots of fun. Till you turn yellow. Don't you go calling me that. I, I ain't got a gun, that's all. I got one, Chuck, right here in my purse. Where'd you get it? She lifted it from my old man. What difference does it make where I got it, as long as I got it? So look at the store up ahead, Chuck. New sign? I see it. Can hardly have a door ride or something to drink. It's late. They roll up the sidewalks in a town like this. The place must be closed. If it was closed, the sign wouldn't be late. Gonna stop, or ain't you? Sure, I'm gonna stop. See? Storekeeper's still there. You seen through the window. Counting up money from this gas register. Could have a real party with something to drink and some money. Stay here. Keep the motor running. Give me the gun. No, I'm gonna come in with you. I can handle the gun. You crazy? You suppose he's got a gun, too? Look, he's an old man. He wouldn't dare do nothing. Come on, Chuck. We can't just sit here. You better not get rattled. Look who's talking. You're coming, or ain't you? All right, I'm coming. But be careful. I always wanted to do something like that. Shut up. Oh, Howdy. 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 Well, we're just fixing the clothes. Heard your car pull up outside. I thought it was my old lady coming to get me. Uh, what can I do for you? I'd like a fifth of that bonded bourbon. Oh, you would, eh? How old are you, son? Twenty-one. Nineteen would be closer, wouldn't it? Maybe a year less than that for your lady friend here. I said I was twenty-one. All right, boy. We'll say you're twenty-one. And we'll also say that I'm closed for the night. Now you can just run along. We ain't running any place, mister. Now you just get... What? Where'd you get that gun? I made it out of old bottle top, stupid. He told you what we want. It's on the top shelf. Get up on the stool and get it. All right. Just don't... Don't get nervous with that thing. Put the money on the register, Chuck. You got the money. You ain't going to be happy about this. When you see the inside of a jail... Thanks for telling us. Because here's something you ain't going to be happy about. No! No! Rudy! Rudy, you killed him! I know, Chuck, I know! Come on! Come on, we got to get out of here! No, we don't know we come for. Grab a couple of bottles! Rudy, are you crazy? <laughs> You're afraid, ain't you, Chuck? Get the bottles! All right, all right. <laughs> now, let's go, let's go! Come on. The body of Malcolm Barnes, proprietor of the liquor store, was discovered by his wife less than five minutes after the killing. Sheriff Frank Corcoran was summoned. He immediately phoned for the help of a Texas Ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned, arriving at the scene of the crime at 1 a.m. Coming through, folks. Howdy, Frank. Oh, howdy, Jace. Was hoping they'd send you. Here's a body. He the owner of the store? Yeah, Mountain Barnes. Wife found him just like he is at about 10 or 10. Usually closed just before 10. She'd always come pick him up in their car. Doc figured it couldn't have happened more than just a few minutes before she got here. Where's the doc? Drove over to see about the funeral parlor. Body will be taken there for autopsy when we finish. I've had everything photographed. Cash register's been rifled. Uh-huh. Hmm. Shot through the back three times. Hey, watch out for that broken glass. Yeah, I'm watching. Place sure smells with all the bottles smashed. Alcohol dries up fast. Yeah, left big stain rings, though. Puddled right out to here before it dried out. Any of your deputies or anybody pick up any of those bottles that are cracked or broken? No, I got here right after Mrs. Barnes. Nobody's touched a thing. Why? Well, the floor is spotted past those stain marks. Look toward the door, a string of small spots. Hmm. Like something been carried that way, dripping. Jace, I was careful to see that nothing was touched, that nobody stepped in where the liquor had been spilled. Those spots might be a break for us, then, because somebody carried a bottle out of here. It must have been cracked and leaking. You mean the killer might have grabbed it up? That's right. If it marked this floor, it would mark the walk outside, too. Come on, let's take a look. Spots run right to the door, all right. 
Lucky I told the deputies to keep everybody off the side of the police. Yeah, careful where you step. I want to run a flashlight along the sidewalk here. It's been mighty dry around here, Jace. Dust surface on the ground. Mm, that'll help us. Yeah. It's here, all right. Look, mm. little craters in the dust dried out hollow. Yeah. They only go a few feet. Mark's end right here at the curb. Uh, that tells us something. Whoever was carrying that bottle got into a car. They weren't on foot. Tire tracks aren't going to help us. Mess of them all around from cars driving in and out. Yeah, I wish our killer had been on foot, Frank. Why? That would point to somebody who came from close by. Somebody in the town. Car doesn't rule that out. No, but it sure broadens the field. I'm going to call Austin and have a lab crew sent in. If we're lucky, they might lift a fingerprint or something for us to work on. That's a good idea. Phone in the store. Over there. Uh-huh. You got anything in mind for us while we're waiting? Yeah. After I call Austin, I want to check with local officers in every town around here. I'm pretty sure the killer took liquor, and if he took it, he's going to drink it. We'll check on every case of drunk driving that turns up tonight in this county. <laughs> Lights burned in the liquor store all through the night as the lab crew checked. Meanwhile, the sheriff and I covered more than 200 miles by car, investigating drunk driving cases reported by local constables and highway patrolmen. Uh, uh, sun's coming up, Jason. We sure spent the night running into blind alleys. None of those drivers we saw could have been anywhere near Purdy at the time of the killing. Well, alibis all checked out. Maybe the lab crew will have a lead for us when we get back to the liquor store. Didn't you get some kind of report on the shortwave before while I was dozing? I kind of remember you talking. Yeah. In order to phone headquarters for a ballistic report, Barnes was killed by a 38 police special. Well, that's our first lead. We need more than that before we ATXA can... ATXA to Unit 10. Yeah, that's that. ATXA to Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead. Highway Patrol Unit 109 requests Unit 10 to proceed to junction of Ranch Road 23 and State Highway 19 west of Bartonville to examine the stolen car recovered at that point. 10-4. Does Unit 109 think stolen vehicle may have connection with this unit's current investigation of murder? Unit 109 reports liquor bottles found in abandoned vehicle. 10-4. Unit 10 heading for rendezvous with 109 immediately. We'll keep you informed. 10-4. Unit 10, clear. PDX, Hold tight, Frank. Got to swing around. Let's hope this is a break. Better be. We need one. <laughs> Highway Patrol Unit 109 was Tommy Manuelo's unit. We spotted his car, and he flagged us down near the junction of the ranch road. The stolen car he'd located was parked off the road in a small grove of trees. I found it just before sunup, Chase. I was making the turn off, my headlights reflected on the chrome. Just barely saw it. Then when I checked the license number, it was on my hot car sheet. Number came over by shortwave last night. Now, what time last night this car was reported stolen? I got the flash a little after 11 o'clock. Bond was killed before 10. I know, but this car could have been missing from 8 o'clock on. Owner went to a picture show about that, and car was gone when it came out. Where was the car taken from, Tommy? Bartonville. Only four miles from here on the state. About 60 miles from here to Purdy, Jason. Yeah. But if the car was taken at 8 o'clock or a little after, the thief had plenty of time to drive to Purdy before 10 o'clock. KTXA said you found some liquor bottles in the car, Tommy. Yeah, that's right. I'll show you. Hmm. There you are. Empty fifth on the floor in the front seat, and there's one half empty there in the back. I'll open the back door. Hmm. Government tax seal on that bottle isn't even broken. No. I didn't notice, eh? Well, I could have empty half of it without breaking the seal and pulling the cork. The bottle must be cracked. Stain around it on the floor, Matt, where it's been leaking. This is what we've been looking for, Jason. Yeah. Pick the bottle up, Frank. Don't touch the glass. Lift it with your fingers pinched around the tack stamp. Right. <laughs> Drip's all right. Chip out of the bottom. Wonder why it didn't all empty out. Well, would have the bottle been standing up instead of lying flat. It emptied down until the liquor was even with the place the bottle was cracked. Then it couldn't run anymore until you picked it up. Might get some prints off it or maybe the empty bottle in the front seat. We can try. It's a cinch we're not going to get any from the steering wheel. No, I, I noticed that right away. Uh, not with the cloth cover on the wheel. Might get something from the dashboard or the inner door handles, but well, I don't know. Not often you pick up good prints on a car. <laughs> There's a piece of cleansing tissue on the floor there. Here. Looks like lipstick stain on it. That's what it is. 
Another little thing on the floor mat here. Ah, gold bother tent. Yeah. Lipstick is kind of a light shade. Could have been a woman in this too, Jason. Hmm. Probably a blonde. Of course, that bobby pin in a tissue might have come from the owner's wife or his girl. Oh, I doubt that, sir. I'll come, Tommy. Well, owner of the car is a colored man, Jay. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. In a short while, Theater Guild on the Air brings to radio listeners a delightful adaptation of Ring Lardner's famous comedy of the baseball world, Elmer the Great. Starring in the title role will be Hollywood favorite Paul Douglas, as a pitcher whose skill on the baseball diamond is exceeded only by his good nature and ability to attract trouble. That's later today for Elmer the Great, starring Paul Douglas, presented by Theater Guild on the Air. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and tonight's case, Joyride, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. I put out a call for the lab crew to meet us at the stolen car when they finished checking the liquor store at Purdy. They joined us within two hours. Nothing had been found at the store that would help us, and it didn't take long to realize that we weren't going to get any evidence from the car or the bottles either. Doesn't look like they're going to find anything, Jason. Yeah, they don't. Won't be their fault. No point in our hanging around here. Want to drive back to Purdy now? I think we'd do better if we drove into Bartonville. Because the car? It was stolen from Bartonville, then brought back here to a spot only four miles away from where it was taken. Figures that whoever stole it must live nearby, or the car would have been left someplace else. Yeah, I'll go along with that. Let's try, Bartonville. Good. We're going to leave you, fellas. If you find anything, let us know by short wave. Right. Go along. Go along. Right. You going to try to run down that lipstick and bobby pin? Gave Tommy Manuel the tissue with a lipstick smear. It's been sent through to Austin. They've established the lipstick brand by chemical analysis. They'll also check on the manufacturer of the bobby pin. Think it'll take long to get a report? No, not long. Tommy may have it by the time we get into town. He'll be at the courthouse. You got a plan, Matt, down? Yeah, won't be too many places handling lipstick and bobby pins. We get the brand names, Tommy and I can check the stores and see if sales girls remember any women who use that shade of lipstick or the pins. <laughs> what I do, check into the hotel and get some sleep? <laughs> no. We got one more thing to look for. The gun that killed Barnes. Check with a constable and get a list of anybody he knows who might own a thirty-eight police special. Yeah, that might uncover something. May have some records of people who've had guns like that being picked up on minor charges in the past. It's worth checking. We match the bullet that killed Barnes, and we can make some work for a 12-man jury. Tommy Manuelo had the information on the lipstick and bobby pin examined by the Austin lab. We started the check of drugstores and general merchandise outlets that carried the items. We couldn't get any concrete information from sales girls or clerks. Well, another drugstore on the next corner, Jay. Oh. You know... Some of these sales clerks don't seem to have very long memories. You can't blame them. Things we're tracing are both cheap items. Girl on her feet all day gets so she can't remember much except bunions. <laughs> I guess you're right. Well, I sure hope the sheriff is doing better than we are. I hope so, too. Hey, Jay, Tommy, wait up. Hold it, Tommy. Here comes Frank now. Uh, I've been trapping you for 20 minutes. You finished checking already? Yeah. And I come across something I think we are looking to right away, Jace. There's a fellow named Jim Hammer filed a report with a constable last night, just before midnight. Said a gun had been stolen from his house, 38 police special. Hey, isn't that what Bonds was killed with, Jim? Yeah. Get any information on this, Jim Hammer? Yeah, sure did. He's night watchman around the cattle pens over to the auction barn. He told the constable he'd missed a gun when he was getting ready to go to work last night. Couldn't find it in the drawer. He keeps it in. You get Hammer's address? Yeah. 214 North Spruce. Tommy, you keep checking the stores. We'll meet you at the courthouse later. Right, Jay. All right, Frank, I left my car on Main Street. Let's go. Yeah? I'd like to talk to Jim Hammer. He ain't home. You know where we can find him? Over to the auction barn, maybe. I thought he was the night watchman over there. Yeah, he goes there during the day sometimes when he's a sale. 
There was auction this afternoon. You look kind of young. You're not his wife, though, eh? No, I'm his daughter. Scooby Hammond. It's after five o'clock, Jase. Auction probably be over by now. Yeah. You expect your father to come home to eat? No, he'll probably spend some time chinning around the barn. He'll maybe get himself some grub in town and go right to work. I see. I guess we might as well go over at the auction barn, Frank. What would you want to see my father about? Is it something about some stolen cattle or something like that? Yeah, something like that. Thanks, miss. Bye. Bye, Ruby. Bye. You missed my father. I'll tell him you were here. Thanks. Where's the auction barn? West end of town. Jim Hammer wasn't hard to find. He was pointed out to us talking to cattlemen who'd bought stock at the auction and were waiting for a chance to load their purchases on their trucks at the end of a chute. We called him off to the side. Well, Sheriff Ranger, what can I do for you? Constable says you had a gun stolen from your home last night. Oh, who's that? Gun wasn't stolen at all. Huh? Reckon I just didn't look sharp enough last night. Found it this afternoon, but in a different drawer from where I usually keep it. Is that the gun you're carrying right there in your holster? Yeah. You mean to say you just took a look in one drawer last night before coming to work and reported that gun stolen without being sure? Well, I was sure last night. I reckon I just overlooked it, that's all. It's pretty hard to overlook a thirty-eight police special. You couldn't have looked very hard. Well, I all but emptied the bureau out. I was in a hurry to get to work. I guess I just plain missed it, that's all. Ain't no reason for you to jump on a man. You reported to the constable when you thought the gun was missing. Now, how come you didn't let him know you'd found it? Well, I suppose I should have. I didn't think it was no rush. Sir, what's the harm? It's my gun, ain't it? Let's have it. Well, sure, I... Don't you pull it. Just turn around. I'll take it myself. Hey, what... He said turn around. Okay, okay. When'd you fire this gun last, Hammer? I can't even remember the last time. They had no call to fire it. Haven't, huh? Smell this, Frank. Yeah, it's been used all right not long ago. You're crazy, I tell you. I ain't fired that gun in months. Somebody has. You better come with us. Come where with you? To the courthouse, Hammer, until we check on a few things. Check on what? A liquor store owner named Barnes was killed last night in Purdy. Shot three times through the back by a thirty-eight police special. Are you trying to frame me for something? I was nowhere near Purdy last night. We know you filed a report with the constable around midnight, Hammer. But where were you between 9 and 11 o'clock last night? I was home, sleeping. My daughter can tell you that. I... My... Well, go ahead, Hammer. What are you stopping for? My, my daughter wasn't home. I just remember she, she went out about 7 o'clock. And nobody saw you during those hours, huh? No, nobody. But I was home, I tell you. You've you got to believe me. That gun ain't been fired. If we're wrong, you've got nothing to worry about. Come on. Yeah, let's get that gun to your lab, Jase. Regular flight to Austin goes out in about 45 minutes. Good. Boys in ballistics can test fire it and check the slug with the ones taken out of Barnes. If this is the murder weapon, they'll tell us. I tell you, it can't be. Our lab doesn't make any mistakes, Hammer. If you're telling the truth, there's a little test you can volunteer to take. We have a lab crew working nearby right now. I'll give you a diphenylman test. Well, what's that? Just a matter of pouring a chemically treated wax on your hand. And when they peel it off, it'll show traces of nitrate if you fired a gun recently. I haven't, I tell you. I heard you. Now I'd like to hear it from a lab man, just to be sure. We got the gun on the night plane to Austin. The stolen car had been brought into a garage in town. We waited for the lab crew to finish with it and then had one of the men go to work on Hammer's hands. By 10 p.m., we had the answers. Two answers that didn't fit each other. Well, what are you keeping me here for, Ranger? You heard what the lab man said. My hands are clean. Wasn't no nitrate on them. That doesn't settle everything, Hammer. While he had you in the next room going over your hands, I had a phone report from Austin on your gun. You'd better talk up, Hammer. Your gun's been identified as a murder weapon. That's a lie! You weren't in bed at 10 o'clock last night. You were in Purdy driving a stolen car, and there was a woman with you. That ain't so, I tell you. You run around with any blonde women? The only blonde woman I ever run around with was my wife. She died six years ago. That gun was missing from my house last night. Somebody must have taken it. Then put it back again. Oh, sure. My hands was clean, wasn't they? How did Jay? Yeah? Oh, Tommy, I almost forgot about you. you. Find anything, Tommy? I think so. This private dime store was closed when I got to it, but I got the address of the woman who works the cosmetic counter. Went out to see her. They handle the lipstick and pens we've been checking on. She gave me the names of a few women that she remembers who buy both. Here's Liz. 
Well, read off the name of Jace. Maybe if Hammer's girlfriend is listed, he'll admit he knows her. There's one name on here he'll admit to knowing, all right. That's what you think. That's what I know. It's your daughter, Ruby Hammer. The sheriff and I drove Hammer back to his house, but Ruby wasn't there. We waited around, looking through the house. First she tried to pin it on to me, and now it's my daughter. Are you crazy? She's only 18 years old. Was she with you last night? No. She was out on a date. With who? Well, how should I know? All I know is she wouldn't get into no trouble like this. I've heard that same speech in a hundred courtrooms, Hammer. Jase, come here a minute. Yeah? What is it? This girl's coat in this closet. Smell. Hmm. You keep any liquor in the house, Hammer? No, never. There's something else, Jase. Photograph. Yeah. Hammer's daughter and some boy. Well, let me see that again. I know this kid, the boy. I sent him to reform school three years ago. His name's Chuck Allenby. What was the charge against him? Something that fits this case like a glove. Automobile theft. And my daughter wouldn't go out with nobody like that. Of course not, Hammer. She just got a habit of posing for pictures with people she wouldn't go out with. I'm going to get my car out of sight, Frank, and we'll sit down and wait for Ruby's date to bring her home. <laughs> Somebody's coming down the street, Jase. Yeah, I hear him. It's after midnight. I think you're at work, Hammer. I may come in, so keep quiet. Hear me? You hear me? Yeah. Now I hear you. They're coming. Yeah, quiet. They have to come into the hall. They won't see us in the living room with the lights off. I can't see nothing. We'll switch on the light. I ain't staying long enough to need the light. All you now, what's the matter with you? What's the good of having money if you ain't going to spend any of it? Spend it? But wait a while. I ain't got a job. I stop spending money and people are going to wonder where I got it. All right. While you're waiting, don't expect me to wait. I can go out with somebody else, you know, somebody who's got a car every night or who ain't afraid to get me. Ruby! Ruby, shut up! <laughs> don't move, anybody. That means you, Charlie. Let go of that door. <laughs> what are they doing here, Pop? Stay after him. Well, he, you stay out of this, Hammer. Couldn't stay out of trouble, could you, Chuck? I didn't do nothing, Sheriff. I, let me go. Hold oh, still. Uh, that's quite a roll of bills you had in your pocket, boy. I, I found that money. Where? In the cash register over in Purdy, after you killed an old man? So that's why you wanted my father's gun. What? What are you... Kill him, Ruby. If he had my gun, you'd kill him. Last night, he won the bar just for fun, he said. Then he stole a car and made me go with him over to Purdy. He left me parked someplace and walked away. And then after a while, he come back with some whiskey. I didn't drink none of it, but he did. I said, why? You keep quiet. You say he didn't park near the store? No. He walked from where he left me. I don't even know what he done. You're lying, Ruby. When old man was killed, whoever gunned him ran out of the store with a dripping bottle and got into a car not more than ten feet from the entrance. I didn't shoot him. He's dead. He's lying. Ruby's only a little girl. You can prove he's lying. Give him the same test you give me on his hands. What kind of test? Well, they pour wax on your hands. You can tell if you fire the gun. Oh. Ruby, come back here. Oh. 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 Get away from that stove, Ruby. No, Ruby, go. <laughs> come away from there. <laughs> oh, Ruby. Ruby, why'd you do it, Ruby? What'd you do it for? Better save that hammer. <laughs> You got any butter, get it fast. Yeah. yeah it doesn't move, Chuck. I won't try nothing. What you do, Jason? Uh, ran into the kitchen here and pulled the lid off the cook stove and jammed her hand into the hot yeah. coals. Here's the butter, Ray. Here's the butter. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, Ruby. And I can fix that burn a little with this, Ruby. Doc can fix it for you better later on at the jail. <laughs> Chuck Allenby and Ruby Hammer were found guilty of the murder of storekeeper Barnes. Allenby, who turned state's witness, was sentenced to a 30-year term at Huntsville. Ruby Hammer pulled 50 years in the women's prison at Gory. And now, here again, is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Folks... Tonight marks the concluding performance, for a while at least, of Tales of the Texas Rangers. We've really enjoyed bringing these stories to you and hope that someday we'll be back with you again. To NBC and its affiliated stations, 
to Colonel Homer Garrison, Jr., Chief of the Texas Rangers, to Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez, our technical advisor, and to all the Texas Rangers and members of the Department of Public Safety, our grateful thanks. And we're particularly grateful to those of you who've taken the time to send us your cards and letters. After all, they are the only sure way of telling that you liked our show. Thanks, folks. Thanks a lot. Good night. You have just heard Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae will soon be seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Chapel Drive. Tonight's case included Tony Barrett, Sam Edwards, Peggy Weber, John Frank, Barney Phillips, and Bill Johnstone. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacey Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. From Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on facts. Names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Death Shaft. It is 9.30 a.m. November 18th, 1941, in the Big Bend country of West Texas. J.C. Wilford of the Bureau of Mines and Fred Blaisdell are winding up a narrow dirt road toward Blaisdell's abandoned mine in Black Hawk Canyon. How long did you say it's been since you operated your mine, Mr. Blaisdell? I never have operated it, Wilford. It was left me by my brother when he passed on. Oh, I see. I always understood there was ore here if you had the money to get it out, but I didn't. So I just let her sit here. Haven't even been near the place for, oh, two years anyway. But lately, I've been reading that the government's anxious to get some of these mines going again. Mm-hmm. So I got in touch with you at the Bureau of Mines to see if you think it's a worthwhile proposition. Well, if it looks promising at all, we can make a thorough survey, do a little diamond drilling, and see what we've got. And then if it looks good, you think the government will loan the money to operate it? Well, that's something I can't answer. All we at the Bureau do is make the recommendation. Hey, pretty desolate country around here, isn't it? Yeah, I see. Yeah, here we are. Oh, uh, is that the entrance to the mine ahead? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Mm, all boarded up. And padlocked. Guess my brother put that door on the entrance to the shaft when he quit working the mine. Yeah, I got my key. That's funny. You want some matter, please? Key doesn't seem to fit. Well, you sure it's the right one? Yeah, I... Hey, this isn't the same lock on here. What? Well, there was a master padlock on here before. Now it's just a cheap one from a dime store, looks like. That's strange. Who'd want to switch locks? Why? I don't know. Somebody must have been snooping around up here. Wait. Piece of iron bar line over here. See if I can try that lock on. It's a fairly new lock by the look of it. Yeah. There. Okay, let's open her up. Yeah, I got the flashlight. I better go first. Okay, Weapon. Sure 
little wet in here. Yeah. These drifts collect a lot of moisture when the mine's not in use. Please do. What's the matter with them? Look, they're on the ground in front of us. Holy smoke, a skeleton. Clothes just about all rotted away. In a, a different padlock on the entrance. Looks like somebody didn't want this skeleton found, Wilkins. Yeah, and if you take a look at the skull, you'll see why. Yeah, it's all bashed in. It sure is. The club or a rock by the look of it. Yeah. Whoever that was, looks like he was murdered. The two men notified Sheriff Benson, who requested help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case, joining the sheriff and two men at Blaisdell's mine. Hmm. Pretty damp, Sheriff. Sure is. You men touch anything in here? Uh, not a thing, Ranger. After I pried off the new lock, we come inside. But just as soon as we saw the skeleton, we got out in a hurry and called the sheriff. Isn't that right, Bill? Yeah, that's right, Ranger. Well, there it is, Jason. Yeah. Hmm. Y'all sure is bashed in. It's pretty hard to tell how long he's been dead, Jace. Yeah, remains would deteriorate pretty fast in this dampness. And as far as telling who it is... Clothes are all rotted away, so the same would go for any papers he might have been carrying. Just a minute, Sheriff. Hmm? Look. These loose rocks on the side here. All right. Looks like a leather wallet. It is. Pretty well preserved, too. Sure, sure. It was a little higher than the skeleton, up out of the wet. Yeah. Pretty lucky for us. Looks that way. Any money in it? No. Just some papers. Hmm. Might have been robbery. You ever took the money, then tossed the billfold away. Can you make out the writing on any of the papers? Gilbert W. Madden. Madden? Uh, name mean anything to you, Blythe? I was just trying to think. No, no I, don't, I don't remember ever hearing it before. How about you, Mr. Wilford? Being from the Bureau of Mines, you probably spend a lot of time around this part of the state. You ever hear the name before? Madden? It sounds a little familiar, but I... I can't seem to place it, Ranger. I'm sorry. Okay. I guess that'll be all for now. Let's get back outside. If you want signed statements from you, you can drop around the sheriff's office and make them. I'll be in this afternoon, if that's okay. Sure. See you then, Blazel. Come on, Wilfred. I'll give you a lift back to town. All right. You through here, Jase? Not quite. Take this broken padlock along. I want to look at this hasp on the door. Oh, I doubt if you can tell much from that. It's all scratched up where Blaisdell pried off that padlock. Yeah, I know. There's one thing sort of puzzles me a little, Sheriff. What is it? This new lock isn't rusty enough to have been out here in the open for very long. Well, what do you figure that means? I don't know until I can get some idea of the approximate time of death. Come on, let's get back to town and start checking on Gilbert Madden. See if we can find out how long ago he was murdered. Back at the sheriff's office, I checked through the missing persons reports and found one on Gilbert Madden filed by his wife eight months before. Mrs. Madden was promptly notified and requested to meet us at the sheriff's office for routine questioning. Have a seat, Ms. Madden. Thank you, Sheriff. I'm sorry to be asking questions at a time like this, ma'am. That's all right, Ranger. I don't suppose there's any doubt it was Gil. I'm afraid not, ma'am. We found his wallet, and the lab confirmed the identification by means of the teeth. Well, I've felt for some time that Gil must be dead. In a way, it's almost better knowing instead of wondering. I know. Mrs. Madden, our lab's trying to establish the time of your husband's murder. Now, according to our information, you filed this missing persons report on last March 23rd, a little less than eight months ago. That's right. What were the circumstances surrounding your husband's disappearance? Well, uh, Gilbert was a mine broker. He made trips in the mining country every now and then. He planned to be away for two or three weeks, so I decided to visit my relatives in Kansas while he was gone. I see. When was that? Right around the first of March, as I remember. And how long were you in Kansas? Three weeks. Did you hear from your husband during that time? Oh, yes, I did. I got a letter from him just a couple of days before I was to return home, saying he would meet my train. But he wasn't at the depot when I arrived. Called all over town trying to locate him, and then when I couldn't, I got worried. The next day, I filed a report with the police. Well, let's see. That would make it about the 20th of March when you got that last letter from your husband. That means he was alive up until the time he mailed it, anyway. 
which would be about the 18th of March. Come in. I left my statement with your deputy, Sheriff. Anything else? Oh, I reckon not. Mrs. Madden, this is Mr. Blaisdell. How did you? Ms. Madden, Mr. Blaisdell owns the mine where your husband's body was discovered. Oh. Uh, sorry to make your acquaintance under this sort of circumstance, Ms. Madden. Uh, Sheriff, I'm sure you told me where this mine was over the phone when you notified me, but what with the shock, I don't seem to remember. Oh, my mine is over in Black Hawk Canyon, Ms. Madden. Black Hawk Canyon? Does uh, that mean anything to you, Ms. Madden? Oh, Willie. Who? Uh, oh, Willie. He lives up in Black Hawk Canyon somewhere. Look, Mrs. Madden, who is this old Willie? Well, he has a mine up there. He's a strange old man. He's very eccentric. Well, what makes you think he had anything to do with this? Because in that last letter I got from Gil, but he mentioned something about old Willie pestering him again. I didn't pay much attention to it at the time. I still don't get the connection between your husband and this old Willie, Mrs. Madden. Well, you see, about two years ago, my husband made a business trip into that region. I went with him. This old Willie was hanging around a little store where we stopped for a cold drink. When he found out my husband was a mine broker, he became very excited. Said he had a valuable mine he wanted Gilbert to look at. Did your husband inspect Willie's mine? No, because the storekeeper broke in and told us Willie's mine was worthless. Willie became furious, and finally the storekeeper threw him out. I see. Did Willie threaten your husband, Mrs. Lamb? Well, he wrote a few crazy sort of letters to Gilbert, accusing him of being a spy at what he called the big companies. Hmm. Mr. Blaisdell, have you ever heard of this old Willie? No, I haven't, but that doesn't mean anything. I'm not acquainted with anybody in that area. Jace, I sure think this old Willie is worth questioning. So do I, Sheriff. We'll head back to Black Hawk Canyon and see if we can find him. Right now, he sounds like a first-class murder suspect. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Here's great news for all of you Western fans. Beginning next Friday on most NBC stations, Roy Rogers, the King of the Cowboys, and Dale Evans, the Queen of the West, will bring you the new Roy Rogers show. Yes, beginning next Friday, be sure to listen for Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, and Trigger in New Adventures in Paradise Valley. It's the Roy Rogers show Friday on most NBC stations. Be sure to listen. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers. And tonight's case, Death Shaft, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. As a matter of routine, I checked up on Mrs. Madden's story of her visit to relatives in Kansas and quickly confirmed the fact that she was there during the period she had stated. Next, Sheriff Benson and I drove to the small general store in Black Hawk Canyon and questioned the storekeeper. Oh, Willie? Sure, I know him, Ranger. Comes in here once a month regular for supplies. Crazy to coot him. Where does he live, Price? Oh, about 20 miles up the canyon. He's got a no-count mine up on East William. Of course, he thinks it's just chock full of ore. <laughs> Mr. Price, I want you to think back about two years ago. An incident involving old Willie and a mine broker named Madden is supposed to have taken place here in your store. You remember anything about it? Sure do. Willie started giving this mine broker the usual jaw wagon about his mine being valuable. <laughs> so I figured I'd better stick my oar in and tell the fellow Willie's mine wasn't worth a dad bone cent. Well, what happened then? Oh, Willie flew off the handle in his crazy way, started spouting a bunch of threats and other loony talk, so I finally had to kick him out of the store. Well, Jay said sure checks with what Miss Madden told us. Yeah. Mr. Price... Can you give us directions for finding Willie's place? We'd like to pay him a visit. Mm, well, pretty rough country up there. And we got horses in the trailer outside. Oh, well, in that case, you can make it all right. Hey, you'll find the trail leading north off the road up ahead about um, five miles. They stick to the trail until they cross a dry creek. And you'll see another trail taken off up the side of the canyon. And the second trail leads us to Willie's mine, huh? Yep. Of course, uh, may not find him there. Why not? He's pretty skitterish about visitors. That's just why I want to pay him a visit. See if he's got anything to be skitterish about. We 
should be just about there, Sheriff. Yeah. Lot of climb. Looks like we're directly across the canyon from Blaisdell's mine. Listen. Burl. I see Willie. They're close, all right. Once we get around this bend in the trail. Yeah. yeah it looks like some diggings up ahead there. And just take a look at that shack there. Some place. Galvanized iron, car paper, cardboard. I wonder what keeps it up. Probably that stovepipe sticking up through the center of the roof. Yeah, they're smoking, too. Well, he must be home, all right. Oh, oh, charcoal. Oh, oh, boy. <laughs> Would you look at the junk he's got hanging on the outside walls? Pieces of barbed wire, tin cans, keys, bottles. Like Willie's part pack wrap. Hmm. The door's open. Nobody inside. Inside looks like the outside. Only more so. Wonder where... Hold it. Hmm? Look, over there in the bushes. Yeah. Something moved, all right. Willie! Come out of there! Willie! Hey. Somebody's coming out, all right. Sure don't look very friendly with that rattle. What do you fellas want? You throw that rifle down and we'll tell you. You got no call to come poking around my property. You're wrong there, Willie. This is Sheriff Benson and I'm Ranger Pearson. We want to ask you a few questions. Now drop that rifle and come over here. You think I'm going to tell you about my mind, don't you? Yeah, and I'm not. Now just a minute, Willie. You want to get it away from me just like all the rest. You spies for him, that's what you are. You come poking around here. Trying what are you to... talking about, Willie? Spies for whom? For the big companies. They all want my mind because they know it's right smack dab on the biggest vein in the county. That's why they send spies snooping around here, like you two. I don't know, Jace. Willie, have you ever been near the Blaisdell mine across the canyon from here? It's as good as this it is. Answer my question. Have you ever been near there? Yeah, maybe. How long ago? Oh, a couple of days. What were you doing over there? Patrolling. What do you mean, patrolling? Oh, I patrol all over. Got to watch for the spies. Hmm. Ever hear the name Gilbert Madden? He ain't going to never get my mind. All I need is a little money to operate. I asked huh? you a question, Willie. Did you ever hear of Gilbert Madden? You heard him, Willie. Yeah, hey, maybe I have and maybe I ain't. You fellas come up here spying just like he... Just like who? Madden? <laughs> Think you're pretty smart, don't you? But you're not going to trap me. He had his chance to get me money for the mine, but he wouldn't. That why you killed him? <laughs> yeah, you think you're going to get me confused with your smart talk, don't you? Well, you ain't. I ain't got too much on my mind patrolling to worry about killing anybody. Yeah? I wonder. We got a witness that you had a fight with Madden. And furthermore... Just a minute, Sheriff. What is it? Just happened to notice something hanging on the outside wall here. Just a bunch of old rusty keys. Yeah. But this one isn't as rusty as the rest. Well, let me see. Jase, that key's the same make as the lock Blaisdell pried off the entrance to his mine. That's right, Sheriff. Come here, Willie. Hey, what you want? Where'd you get this key? Say, that's a good one. You want to trade some? Where'd you get it? I saved key. Quit stalling, Willie. Where'd you get it? Coming around here asking me all kinds of questions. You got no call to... Get that padlock back in my office, Chase. I'm sure interested to see whether this key fits it. So am I. Come on, Willie. Get your burrow. We're going to take a ride. <laughs> Making me come down here with you fellas. You think I'm not wise, do you? Padlock's in my desk here. Yeah. You get me down here while one of your other spies snoops around my mind, takes all samples. Here it is. Let's have it. Okay, now I'll try this key in it. Fits. Sure does. Well, I guess that does it, all right. Uh, uh, can I go now? No, Willie. I don't think you'll be going anywhere for quite a spell. The sheriff booked Willie, but we were unable to get any sort of coherent statement out of him. Finally, we locked him up and went back into the sheriff's office. Well, regardless of whether or not he gives us a confession, I suppose we could get a conviction, all right. Maybe. 
Unless they find him mentally incompetent. Even so, they'll put him away. Yeah, that's just what I was thinking. It'd be pretty rough on him if he happened to be innocent, wouldn't it? You'd be innocent? Now, Jay. Yeah, I know. We have two witnesses to the fact that Willie threatened Gilbert Madden. That's right. Mrs. Madden and the storekeeper. But what clinches it is a padlock on Blaisdell's mind, Jase. That key we found at Willie's shack fits it. That's about as solid evidence as there is, seems to me. I wonder. What do you mean? A couple of things about this don't feel quite right to me, Sheriff. Well, what, for instance? Well, near as the lab can figure, Madden was murdered about eight months ago. That's right, last March. But the lock Blaisdell broke off the mine entrance was hardly rusty at all. And neither was the key we found hanging out in the open at Willie's shack. What's wrong with that, Jase? Willie broke off the original lock when he hid Madden's body. But Madden died eight months ago, and that second lock couldn't have been on the hasp that long. Well, maybe Willie didn't put the lock on right away. Maybe later he got to worrying about somebody discovering the body, and, well, that's when he put it on. Sheriff, the time you're most worried about a body being discovered is right after you've killed a man, not several months later. Sure, that's the way a sensible person would react. But remember who we're dealing with, old Willie, who's not exactly what you call a sensible man. I know, Sheriff. But then there's the part about the key hanging right out in plain sight at Willie's shack. Now, Jase, you said yourself Willie was part pack rat. Remember all the other junk he had hanging around the shed? Sure I do, Sheriff. I also remember what Willie said when we showed him that key. Say, that's a good one. Just like he'd never noticed it before. What are you getting at, Jase? Maybe Willie did kill Madden, but it seems to me there's a bare chance he didn't. Then how'd he get that key? Oh, he could have found it. Or it could have been planted there. That'd be awful tough to prove either way, Jase. Sure it would. As long as it's a possibility, we're not closing the case. Come on, let's talk to Mrs. Madden and see if she can give us a line on anybody besides old Willie who might have a reason for killing her husband. We drove out to the Madden house, but Mrs. Madden was unable to give us any new information. She suggested we go through her husband's business records, which were in the spare room he'd used for an office. So the sheriff and I started in. And an hour later, the only things we found just made it look all the worse for Willie. Hmm. What do you got, Jase? A bunch of letters written on wrapping paper. Addressed to Madden. Crazy, threatening letters. Who wrote them? You guess. Willie? Yeah, Willie. Listen. You better watch out. I ain't going to let you steal my mind. Mm, that's really all right. For something like that? Yeah. All six of them. Well, yeah, Jase, it looks all the worse for Willie now. We've been through just about all Madden's records and papers. And he's threatened letters or all we come up with. Yeah, and from the looks of it, Madden kept records of just about everything. Well, we might as well put these papers back, I guess. Okay. What do you got there? A uh, pile of canceled checks. Hand them over, and I'll stick them here in the drawer. Okay, just thumb them through them. I guess there's nothing here. I... Hey. What is it? Sheriff, look at this check. It's dated two years ago. Hmm? Let's see. Well, what about it? It's just made out the case and signed by Madden. Yeah, but take a look at this pencil writing up in the corner. Pencil writing? Let. Well, I'll be. So will I. Come on. Want to make an arrest? Not yet. I need more proof, and I think I know a way to get it. Just go along with whatever I say. Sure, Jace. Did you find anything that can help in Gilbert's papers, Ranger Pearson? I think we did, Mrs. Madden. You said you accompanied your husband on his business trip into the Black Hawk Canyon area two years ago. That's right. Why'd he go there? Well, just to size up the situation, find out what mines were for sale. I see. He didn't actually transact any business, though. No. Of course, this Willie wanted him to come up and see his mine, but when the storekeeper told us the mine was no good... Yeah. And you stayed right with your husband the whole trip? Yes. Okay. Thanks, ma'am. You say you found something in Gilbert's papers? Oh, we don't know for sure, so I'd like to give you a receipt for these canceled checks. I want more time to examine them. Here you are. Canceled checks? Yeah. It looks like one of them's going to take the wrong man out of jail and put the right man in. Come on, Sheriff. I see. Well, I'm glad to hear it. If there's anything more I can do. We'll let you know, Mrs. Madden. Goodbye. She's lying, Jason. I got trooper. What now? 
We'll watch her. Have one of your deputies keep an eye on him. We don't want him to get away, but we don't want to pick him up yet either. Okay, I'll call my office from the drugstore. I'll wait in my car around the corner. Meet me there. The sheriff made his call and rejoined me. We sat in my car, waiting. A little after dark, Mrs. Madden's car pulled away from our house, heading out of town. We followed, keeping well back. Two miles out of town, she pulled off the highway, parked behind another car, got out and headed into the brush. The sheriff and I worked our way slowly and quietly in the direction she'd taken. Should be around here somewhere. Yeah. Keep it as quiet as possible, Sheriff. Reckon she can watch you to meet him? Looks like. Listen. Yeah. I hear him talking. Look, in that clearing ahead. Yeah, let these up a little. You little fool, you must have overlooked something when you went through those records. No, I'm sure I didn't, Fred. I found the entry you made where you paid him for appraising your mind two years ago. I tore it out. There's nothing in those records to show the two of you knew each other. You're wrong there, man. Right. Hold it real steady, Blaisdell. Chris. Yeah. So the two of you didn't know each other until I introduced you, huh? You've been in it together ever since you met two years ago. Clary, you little fool. You were tricked into coming out here so they could catch us together. They didn't have any proof of anything. I got proof right here in my pocket that you lied when you said you didn't know Madden, Blaisdell. Yeah, what kind of proof? Something you overlooked, Mrs. Madden. A check made out to cash. What? You didn't notice the pencil writing on it. Pencil writing? Your husband made a notation that the check was to cover expenses of a trip he'd made to appraise Blaisdell's mine two years ago. You told me you were with your husband the whole trip. So you lied about not knowing Blaisdell. Clara, you stupid Blaisdell. little... Right. You gotta listen to me. I, I didn't want any part of it, but Blaisdell forced me to. What's that? I'm in the clear. I was in Kansas when it happened. Blaisdell killed my husband. Oh, that's how you stick by me, is it? Why, you little... Hold it, Blaisdell. You're not going to get away free, Clara. I guarantee that. Sure, I killed Madden Ranger, but it was her idea. That's a lie. Uh, right from the start, it was her idea. How to go about it. Put the body in my own mind and change life. She's lying, Ranger. Plant the key at Willie's shack, pretend she and I didn't know each other, and produce the body so she could collect on the insurance. All of it was her idea. You shut up. You shut up. I'm not half finished yet. Got a weird shot on me, will you? Wait till I get through spit. Shut up, you little know, what? Shut up. You know, Sheriff, strikes me we've only got one problem left. What's that, Jace? Getting them to talk slow enough so a stenographer can get it all down. Come on, both of you. Fred Blaisdell and Clara Madden were indicted and placed on trial for the brutal murder of Gilbert Madden. For her part in the crime, Clara was sentenced to 50 years in the women's prison at Gorey. On the morning of May 3rd, 1942, Blaisdell was put to death in the electric chair. And now, here's the star of our show, Joel McRae. Hello, folks. First of all, we want to thank you kindly for the many wonderful letters and cards we received during the summer months. It's mighty heartwarming to know we have so many good friends. As a matter of fact, the Rangers themselves have received quite a few of your letters, too. And like us, they certainly appreciated hearing from you. I'm sure that most of you will recall reading about a great Texas Ranger captain who retired from active duty on July 31st of this year. Some of our stories have been based on his exploits. He's the famous Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez, whose favorite guns are engraved with a code he has always lived by in his colorful career. Never draw me without cause, nor shield me without dishonor. Tomorrow, it'll be exactly 31 years since Lone Wolf was sworn in as a Texas Ranger. And as in the past year, so in the years to come, we are proud to have him as our technical advisor. Congratulations, Cap. See you next week, folks. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Cattle Drive. The cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Lamont Johnson, Ken Christie, Betty Lou Gerson, and Brad Brown. 
technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Bob Wright, and the program is produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. From Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. The Texas Rangers come these stories based on facts. Names, dates, and places are fictitious for us to see. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight Play for Keeps. Five minutes past midnight on December 12th, several years ago, Sheriff Bob Smithers of Bradshaw County, Texas, staged a raid on a gambling establishment located on a country road. But there were no patrons in the house, and the sheriff's face grew dark red as he and the local constable failed to find any evidence. There's nothing in the upstairs room either, Sheriff. You're sure of that, huh, Jim? Not even a deck of cards. See, Sheriff, like I told you, I quit the racket. Yet this is the fourth time this year you rousted me out of bed. I know you're operating, Walton. And I'm going to get you for it. You're not going to milk the citizens of this county. Not while I'm sheriff. Look, sheriff, this happens to be my house. Warrant or no warrant, you finished your business here. How about getting out? I guess we might as well go, sheriff. No, Jim. We're going to stay a minute. I want to talk to Walton. And you. About what? I was sure of this raid tonight, Jim. Dead sure. Just like I've been sure the last three times, because only you and me ever knew about them. I didn't tell nobody but you, Jim. You, the constable. <laughs> Sounds like he's accusing you of tipping me off, Don. I know he tipped you, Orton. You better watch what you're saying, Bob. All that talk about law and order and wanting to uphold him. Let me see your wallet, Jim. <laughs> Take it out and let me see it. Now, wait a minute, Sheriff. You shut up. Come on, Jim. I want to see if you're carrying the kind of money an honest man gets for being a peace officer. What I carry on me is my own business. Why, you cheap two-bit snake. Nothing cheap about a few hundred once in a while. Be smart, Sheriff. Get a few for yourself. Why don't you listen to him, Sheriff? He's talking sense. Come on, both of you. I'm taking you in. You can't make anything stick. Maybe not. But I'm going to make this county too hot for both of you. I'm going to run you out of it. Keep your hands off me, Sheriff. You're under arrest. Grab him one I got him. Just hold him, fool, while I get his gun. I got him. Don, Don, you, you killed him. No, 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 you killed him. You grabbed his gun and killed him. He was after you, Walton. I got a gun of my own, and I'm the constable. Are you setting me up for a frame? Not necessarily, Walton. It's up to you. His body could be moved out of here. What's your play? What do you want? No more chicken mash. Fifty percent of your take. You can go right on operating. With him dead, you crazy fool? You're forgetting something, Walton. I'm top dog now. And investigating this murder will be my job until a new sheriff is appointed. <laughs> but I don't think I'm going to be able to solve it. <laughs> The body of Sheriff Smithers was found the next morning, dumped in a ditch by the side of an old wagon road. During the next few days, Constable Jim Dunn conducted a seemingly honest but fruitless investigation, even following the efficient peace officer's routine of making use of the state lab facilities at Austin. But citizens of Bradshaw were not satisfied, nor was the editor of the Bradshaw Times. Clippings of his editorials were on file with Captain Stinson of the Texas Rangers, and the captain sent for Ranger Jace Pearson. Want to see me, Captain? Yeah, Jay, sit down. There's no acting sheriff appointed by the court of Bradshaw County here, Jace. I think you better take over. 
About the killing of Sheriff Smithers? Mm Mm-hmm. I'd like to. I knew Smithers. See, that's right. You worked with him about five years ago. When he first took office. Cleaned that county up in three months and cleaned it good. Well, it doesn't look like it stayed clean, Jace. Not according to this editorial clipping from the Bradshaw Times. I've read it. It's going to be a tough one, Jace. No clue to the killer, and the trail has had a couple of days to cool off. Well, then I'd better get going before it gets any cooler. You'll hear from me. Uh, Jace. Yeah, Captain. I just want to remind you, whoever did it doesn't hesitate to kill a man wearing a badge. I reached Bradshaw in the early morning. The town was waking up and the Bradshaw Times was turning out its bi-weekly edition. I went in to see the editor, Frank Carlin. So you read my editorials, huh? Well, I'm glad no somebody's reading. Yeah, you got readers, all right. People been clipping them out and mailing them into our headquarters. Yeah, I guess there's always a handful of people to hold out. Wonder what the world would do without them. Everybody was so burned the day of the killing. Then in 48 hours, they want to forget it. Yeah, it's always that one. How about the constable, Jim Dunn? Oh, he's all right, I guess. But he's only been constable for a year. He just doesn't have the experience. It'll take the court a couple more days to decide on a new sheriff. I better knock out a story on you rangers coming in. Might wake the people up with you. I'd rather you didn't, Mr. Carlin. I'll, I'll be around and they'll know soon enough. Oh, uh, see what you mean. Want me to lay off the editorials for a while? If you don't mind. You know, the sheriff and I are on different sides of the fence politically, but he was an honest man and I liked him. I got a headline back there, all set and gathering dust. It says, Sheriff's Killer Caught. Ranger, give me a chance to use it. I found a place to park my horse trailer and put charcoal in a pasture. Then I headed for the constable's office and met Constable Jim Dunn. There are all the reports in my investigations, Ranger. You think I haven't done a good job, maybe those will change your mind. I even checked ballistics with the Austin lab. My being here isn't a criticism of you, Mr. Dunn. I'm here because I was sent until a new sheriff is appointed and to give you help. I've done everything possible. I've questioned almost a hundred people. I've checked alibis on more than a dozen possible suspects. It's all there. Yeah. Everything's here. Everything except the murderer. And that's the only thing I'm interested in seeing, Mr. Dunn. A little cooperation between us might clean it up. I'm... I'm sorry I blew, Ranger. It's been getting under my skin. This murder could have been committed by anybody. Some bum from a hobo jungle, some drunk anybody. We can't arrest anybody. We've got to arrest somebody. Somebody definite. Now, exactly where was the body found? Old Wagon Road bypasses town about two miles north. Is it fit for a car? Yeah, but you've got to go round about to get to it. Almost 11 miles. You won't find nothing there, though. I'd like to take a look anyhow. Can't we cut cross-country on horses? Yeah, shorter, if you want it. I want to. My horse is in a pasture. I'll meet you at the edge of town in five minutes. The body was found just a little further on. You can see the road now. Not much of a road left. No use for it anymore. Sheriff must have had some reason for using it if he came way out here. Hey, here we are. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, charcoal. Oh, boy. And Sheriff's car was found right over here by the side of the road. Where was he? Lying right beside it. Been dead about seven, eight hours when he was found. Who found him? Cowpoke looking for some strays. Mm, That's lucky. Otherwise, the body might have been here for a few days or even weeks before somebody came across it. Yeah. You get pictures of the position of the car and the body? Of course I did. Anything else? Yeah, any exhibits, cast of footprints, anything like that? No. When I got the call, I brought a bunch of men out with me. I was excited, and I didn't think to stop them from tramping around. I can see why you'd be upset. Well, if there was anything to find, it's a cinch it isn't here now. Whether it would have wiped it out if your men hadn't. You want to go back to town? Yeah. I want to look at the car. How about the exhibits from the sheriff's body? I sent the bullets and the gun in. Your lab checking. 
verified it was the sheriff's own gun. I'm talking about the clothes he was wearing. You got those, haven't you? Sure I got them. I got all the evidence there was. You should have sent it all in. I want to look at that stuff, too. Well, let's step it up. Come on, Charlie. Yeah. Get up. Yeah. There's everything, all tagged. Everything the sheriff was wearing when he was killed. I see. And this the shirt he was wearing? You see the blood and bullet holes, don't you? Yeah. How come your lab didn't find any prints on the gun when I signed it in? Didn't even have the sheriff's own prints. It was wiped clean. Hmm. Well, this is kind of odd. What? Well, the sheriff was shot twice, and they dug one slug out of him. The other one passed clean through. Yeah, according to the coroner's report, one slug hit his collarbone. That stopped it. Yeah, that's what I mean. The course of the bullets. Both shots fired into the left side, just above the kidney. But the one that came through came out the right side of his shirt collar here, right through his neck. Well, what about it? Well, it's a funny course for a bullet to take, unless the man who fired the gun was lying down and fired up at the sheriff. Yeah, 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 that's what I figured, too. They must have had a fight for the gun. He got it, but the sheriff knocked him down and... No, no, that isn't the way it happened. How do you know? Because the sheriff wouldn't half turn his back on a man who'd just taken his gun. Besides, these powder burns show the gun was being held right against the shirt when it was fired. What do you think happened then? Well, the sheriff must have been in some position where he was bent over forward, which he wouldn't be unless somebody was holding him in that position. Here, stand in front of me for a minute. Now, you're back toward me. What are you going to do? Uh, slip one hand under your arms and then up behind your head in a half Nelson and twist your other arm behind you in an arm lock. And bend you over forward like this. The sheriff was held like I'm holding you now. The bullets were pumped into him. See what I mean? Now that That's just a guess. It's a guess I'm going to back up. And if the sheriff was held in a half Nelson and an arm lock, it tells us something else. That there were two men in on the murder. Unless the killer had three hands and used the third one to fire the gun. That's pretty smart figuring, Ranger. Only because it's the kind of figuring I've been doing for a long time. Uh-huh. Are these the photos that were taken at the scene? Yeah. The sheriff's body in the car. Uh, the car, the body moved any before these were taken? Nope. The car was right there, with the sheriff flat on his face beside it. And less than two feet away from it. His right side toward the car. Yeah. The bullet that passed through the sheriff came out on his right side. That means it should have hit the car. But there's no mark. I don't see that. That helps us, any. It helps plenty, Dunn. It tells us the sheriff wasn't killed out there. He was killed someplace else and brought out there. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Tonight, enjoy 90 minutes of great entertainment on the big show featuring Jimmy Durante, Ethel Merman, Fred Allen, and your unpredictable hostess, Tallulah Bankhead. Then, Theater Guild on the Air brings you Joan Fontaine and Ray Milland in the delightful comedy, The Major and the Minor. Later, enjoy the sparkling premiere performance of the Eddie Cantor Show... Featuring recorded visits with such great show people as Al Jolson, Ted Lewis, Sophie Tucker, and Bill Robinson. Tonight, it's the big show, Theater Guild on the Air, and the Eddie Cantor Show. Here all three on NBC. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers. And tonight's case, Play for Keeps. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> I knew that Sheriff Smithers had been killed by two men, and that his body had been moved after the killing, but it wasn't nearly enough. It was evening before I figured out my next move, a move I didn't like to make. Evening, ma'am. Remember me? Why, it's Jace Pearson, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Been a long time, Mrs. Smithers. Oh, come in, Jace. Come in. I, I I suppose you know about Bob. Yes, ma'am. And that's why I'm down here. I came by to pay my respects. Funny thing. 
First time Bob brought you through that door. I never reckoned you might be back someday. Looking for a man who killed him. I wish it could have been for another reason, ma'am. But Bob kept things working so well here, there seldom was any reason for a ranger to come visiting in Bradshaw County. Ah, I know how you fellas keep working along. Can I offer you a bite to eat? Please, Jace. Well, that'd be real fine, Miss Smithers. I knew it might help her and me if she could keep a little busy with her hands doing woman things in the kitchen. And I tried to eat, but kept remembering the man who'd sat across this same table from me five years before. Big, honest, stubborn, and unafraid. It's mighty nice of you to stop by, Jace. Bob would have been happy to see you sitting here again. He always said a man with a good appetite was right with the world. Ma'am, I guess Jim Dunn has already asked you, but do you have any ideas about who might have killed Bob? Oh, no. Everything went so well for a few years. All I know is the last year or so, Bob was upset about gambling. He after anybody in particular? A man named Walton, Lou Walton, has a big house on the south road out of town. Bob always says it was a gambling house, but he could never catch Walton. You mean he raided the place? A couple of times. Last time was the night he was killed. Dunn didn't tell me about that. Bob was killed after he left there. Walton's, I mean. Dunn said they didn't find anything, so Bob started back to town. But he never got home. Mrs. Smithers, hmm? I have to ask a favor. A favor I don't like to ask. I want to help, Jace, every way I can. I want your permission to have Bob's body exhumed for further examination. Is it necessary? I'm not satisfied with the examination that was made here. Uh, all right, Chase. I'd like to have a more thorough examination made for headquarters. I'm sending them the clothes Bob was wearing for lab check, and I don't want anybody to know about it for now. All right. You're going to get him, aren't you, Chase? I'm going to try awful hard, ma'am. <laughs> Howdy, Ranger. Been waiting for you. Thought maybe you might have turned in for the night. I'm going to in a few minutes. I just came back to pick up the clothing exhibits. Well, I locked them away again. And dig them out. I want to send them on to Cam Mabry for lab tests. Well, all right. I'll give you a receipt for them. Okay. Done. Yeah? In those reports of yours, I didn't see any mention of a man named Lou Walton. Why should there be? I understand that Walton's a gambler and that you helped Smithers raid his place the night Smithers was killed. Now, here are the exhibits. You're thinking way out of line on Walton. His alibi's airtight. According to who? According to me. I was with him all night after Smithers left the place. You didn't come back to town with the sheriff? No. I stayed at Walton's. Why? Because the sheriff asked me to stay there. We didn't find anything, but the sheriff figured if I hung around, somebody might show up or call up looking for a game. And I'd be able to get him some evidence. Uh, anything else you want to know? No. I guess that lets Walt now. I'll take these things. Sure. Go ahead. See you tomorrow, Dunn. Number, please. Oak Hill, 243. Walton, done. Now get those people out and shut down. Why? What's wrong? That range is too smart. I try to make things look good for myself, and, well, I guess I made them look too good. Well, how much does he know? All he's going to know. And you just close down and stand pat until he wears himself out. The sheriff's body was dug up in the examiner's report sent on to Austin. Headquarters also had the exhibits I'd gotten from Dunn. By late afternoon of the next day, Captain Stinson telephoned me long distance. Got a complete report from the lab, Jace. Go ahead, Captain. You were right about the position of the body when the shots were fired. 
Autopsy reports show the organs were pierced in a manner that would be possible only if the sheriff were bent over forward. Good. Anything else? Yeah. That shirt you sent up. Lab thinks Smithers was killed indoors. Why? Some lint stuck to the blood and held when it dried. Analysis indicates it comes from a fabric used in expensive carpeting. Violet color. Thanks, Captain. That may be enough to wind this up. Then you're convinced that Walton was running a gambling joint, Mr. Collins. Was and is. I'd swear to it. But nobody's been able to prove it. You know how suckers are. They lose their shirts and keep their mouths shut. Think they're in on a smart thing and they help the racketeers to cover up. Then Walton must have been tipped off that he was being raided. Part of the racket. They pay off and get tipped off. You ever been in Walton's house? No. You know anybody who has been there? Well, it's no secret the newspaper man Gamble mourns good for him. My line of type man plays horses, I know. Uh, uh, Tate. I'll be there in a minute. Howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Uh, Pete, you ever been in Lou Walton's place? Oh, come on, I don't stall. Tell the Ranger. It's important. Well, oh, yeah, I've been there once or twice. I only want to know one thing. You notice any carpeting in the house? Carpeting? Oh, sure. The house is like a palace. Wall-to-wall carpet all over the place. What color? Well, it's a kind of a purple, I'd say. How about saying violet? Yeah, yeah, I guess that's what it's called. You got something, Ranger? Yeah. I'm going to wake up the nearest judge and get a search warrant for Walton. You better brush the dust off that headline you told me about. I think you're going to get a chance to use it. I was wondering when you get around to me, Ranger. Seems like everybody who wears a badge just loves to poke his nose into my life. I wouldn't worry about your nose, Walton. If you want to be smart, watch out for your mouth. <laughs> I didn't mean anything, Ranger. Just that a man ought to, well, ought to have a little privacy. And you love the death cells at Huntsville. They're real private. Well, I, I always cooperated. The constable, Jim Dunn, he'll tell you that. I'll bet he would. Mm, nice carpeting you got here. I like the color. Yeah. Yeah, I... Hey, let me get you a drink or something, Ranger. All good stuff. I don't have anything but the best. <laughs> you know the old saying, the best is none too good. <laughs> well, there's been a strong cleaning fluid used on a piece of this rug. And one spot faded just a little. Well, I, I spilled some wine. I had a party one night. The night the Sheriff Smithers was here last? No. No, before that. Oh. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Nobody was here the night Smithers came. No. No, nobody. The, uh, the constable, he stayed. Stayed most of the night after the sheriff left. Yeah, so he told me. Uh, let me show you the rest of the house. Upstairs. No, thanks. I just want to look at the walls in this room. <laughs> sure pretty. You know, at Huntsville, they don't have pretty walls like these. Just cold concrete and steel bars. What do you keep talking about Huntsville? I'll tell you, since I stand up on this chair and... Rip off this new piece of wallpaper. No. They have no right to. Just looking for this small bullet hole papered over. Of course, you know that one bullet went right through the sheriff. The hole was repapered because a heavy picture fell. The nail made the hole. 38 caliber nail? I'm going to have this rug ripped up and sent to my lab, Walton. No cleaning fluid made will wipe out all of a blood trace. Even a drop is enough to hang you. I didn't do it, I tell you. Dunn shot him. Huh? It was done. Dunn shot him. Hold your wrists out. You'll never get those on me. You bet wrong this time, gambler. Now get up. I'm taking you in. I took him through town to the county jail. And I walked over to the constable's office, but Dunn wasn't there. I had to find him quick before he knew I had Walton. I headed back for the jail, and as I turned into the street, I saw something move in the shadows. There was another car, not far from mine, the constable's car. And Dunn was getting into it. Dunn, wait a minute! Get out of the way, people! Get back, please! Uh, 
punctured my tires. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA to Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 10. Unit 10 convinced Constable Jim Dunn is subject sought in killing of Sheriff Smithers, Bradshaw County. Attempting getaway headed north on State Highway 19 from Bradshaw. Alert Highway Patrol and all units for complete roadblock of area. Order no further radio communication. Subject in Constable's marked car, equipped with shortwave receiver. We'll do, Unit 10. Unit 10's car out of commission. We'll attempt to commandeer another car for pursuit. Unit 10, 10 4. KDXA, Austin. <laughs> Come on, Charcoal. Let's hope Dunn heard that call. Come on, get up. Get up! Get up, Charcoal! Come on! Yeah! I had to gamble. The last part of my call had been a plan. A plan I wanted Dunn to hear. He'd know he couldn't get more than 15 or 20 miles before he was blocked unless he took some back road. And I'd seen him take a north turn out of town toward the wagon road he'd dumped the sheriff's body on. It was 11 miles for him by car, two miles cross country for me. I raked charcoal all the way, reached the road, and rope dragged a couple of dead logs across it. We finished just in time. I heard the whine of a car coming over the rise in the rough road as the first glimmer of the headlights stabbed the darkness. I tied charcoal back in the trees and dropped in the brush to wait. It's the end of the road, son. Don't back enough. Now you haven't got any tires. I'm giving you a chance to surrender, Don. You get your chances, Ray. You missed, Don. Now I'm coming around the car to get you. You want to shoot it out? Let's go. Yeah. Wait a minute. Go, Ranger. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! I'll, look, I'll, I'll drop my gun! And see? I ain't armed! Come here! I ain't armed! Neither was Smithers when you lifted his gun and killed him with it. Good thing for Texas all constables aren't like you. Come on. <laughs> Walton's waiting for you at the jail. Looks like you'll be partners again at Huntsville. following week, the headlines of the Bradshaw Times read, Sheriff Killers Caught. Though Jim Dunn protested his innocence, Lou Walton's confession and evidence submitted by the Rangers convinced the court of Dunn's guilt. Both were sentenced to life imprisonment at Huntsville. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Cattle Drive. The cast included Tony Barrett, Tom Holland, Byron Kane, Peter Leeds, and Gene Bates. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacey Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. From Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record.
case for tonight, Fugitive's Trail. It is approximately 11.30 on the night of January 21st, 1948. Mr. and Mrs. Ben Purvis are driving back to their ranch on the outskirts of Newby, Texas. The car, a small black sedan, finally swings off the main highway, turns into a long, narrow dirt road leading to the ranch buildings. Hmm, looks like we got company, Ben. There's a car parked in front of the house. Yeah. Probably one of Arlene's boyfriends. Mm-hmm. Look, I thought you told her we didn't like your fellas hanging around. Oh, now, Ben, he probably just stopped by to pick her up and take her home. We told her we'd be back about this time. Well, just the same. Now, don't crap about Arlene. You know, babysitters are hard enough to get out here without... Well, I still think you could find somebody else. I was never sold on that girl. She's kind of wild, not predictable. Oh. Never know what she's going to do. It's all right, Ben. Just stop worrying. Looks like Dave Fenton's car. Yeah, that is his car. Hey, you sit still, Ben. I'll open the garage doors. Thought he and Arlene split up. So did I. Must have patched things up again. You got the plants Mrs. Sutton gave you? Uh huh, right here. What sort of flowers are they gonna be? Yellow. Miss Sutton told me the name, but I forgot. They can look real nice alongside the house, eh, don't you? <sighs> Yeah, I guess so. Hmm. You know, Ben, I, I'm kind of glad we went over to see Miss Sutton tonight. Yeah, she's a real nice old lady. Mm-hmm. Sure held up fine at the funeral this afternoon. It's going to be hard on her for a while, though, poor thing. After all, she and Mr. Sutton were married almost 40 years. Now it's gone. Yeah. Well, Doc warned him to slow down after that last attack he had. But no, he wouldn't hear of it. Oh, it sounds like our young one's acting up. We well, shouldn't be crying now if Arlene gave him his 10 o'clock bottle. He'd just like her to forget. Arlene, what? Ben, she's not here. That's funny. Arlene! Probably in with the baby, Les. Hey, what's this? What's the matter? Look, chairs turned over and. What? Look, my good table lamp on the floor. Oh, Ben, look, it's broken. Hey, what the heck's been going on around here? Arlene? Here, honey, you take the lamp. I'm going in to see the baby. Arlene! Where is that fool girl anyway? Baby all right, Helen? All right, his blanket was on the floor. He's just cold, that's all. See if Arlene's in the kitchen, will you, Ben? All right. Uh, I'll be darned. Honey... Come here, Matt, will you? Is Arlene in here, Ben? No. Look at this. What? Baby's bottle, full. And here's a warming pan. She didn't give Miss feeding. Oh, I wonder where she is. I'm going to have a look out back. Don't go on, kid. Careful on the porch. You better turn on the light. Okay. <gasps> Good Lord. Ben? Ben? Ben, what's the matter? What... Who is it? Young Dave Fenton. He's dead. On discovering the body of Dave Fenton, Ben Purvis immediately called the sheriff's office. The sheriff put out an all-points bulletin for the Rankin girl and requested aid from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned, arriving at the Purvis Ranch shortly after 4 a.m., there's the body, Jace. Blast caught him right behind the ear. Not very pretty, is it? Shotgun wounds never are. When this happened? Doc figures sometime between 9 and 10 o'clock last night. Uh-huh. Just a kid. 19. Worked at his pa's gas station in town. Seemed like a real nice boy, Jace. Real nice. Anybody touch this shotgun? No. Who's it belong to? Ben Purvis. Says he generally keeps it behind the kitchen door. It's babysitter Arlene, uh... Arlene Rankin. Here's a description of her. I sent a man over to her house right after Purvis called me. Her pa said she hadn't come home. The man's still out there keeping an eye on the place in case she does show up. I don't think she will. Which one's Purvis? Over there by the fence, talking to the justice of the peace. Ben! Oh, Ben! 
Okay, Jeff, be right with you. If you want to talk to Mrs. Purvis, Jay, she's inside. Later, maybe. You want me, Sheriff? Yeah. Uh, ben, this here is Ranger Pearson. Jace, Ben Purvis. Howdy, Ranger. Howdy, Mr. Purvis. Sheriff tells me that you and your wife were out visiting when this happened. That's right. We were over at the Sutton place. What time did you leave the house here last night? Well, now, let me see. I drove over to Arlene's house around 6.30. I picked her up and brought her back here. Then the wife and I left. I guess that was around 7. You know if she was expecting this Fenton boy to drop in on her? Uh, no, no, I don't. Had he ever come around here before? Oh, sure, lots of times. He dropped by to take her home. Only he stopped coming around a couple of months ago. Why was that? Well, near as I can figure, she and Fenton must have had a falling out of some sort. Maybe she got tired of them. She had a lot of boyfriends, new ones, every time you turn around. I see. Who's the latest, do you know? No, it's pretty hard to keep up with her. A couple of weeks or so ago, it was Lenny Hayes. Well, was he supposed to come by last night? I wouldn't know there, Ranger. Well, you usually take her home? That's right, whenever there's no fella here to pick her up. You know, Jason... I figure that Fenton here got sore because she threw him over. They had a fight. She killed him and beat him. Yeah, it could have happened that way. And it could have been the reason why she didn't take Fenton's car. She'd been spotted too easy. That girl. Ain't surprised she'd pull a stunt like this at all. Not this gun of yours, Mr. Purvis. You always keep it loaded? Uh, yes, sir. And it's usually sitting behind the kitchen door. Hmm. Did Arlene know it was there? I don't see how she could have missed noticing it, Ranger. I want to take this gun with me, Mr. Purvis. Have the lab men check the fingerprints. Oh, sure, sure. Go ahead. All right, Sheriff. I guess the J.P. can take charge of the body now. Let's get moving. Anybody in mind you want to see? Yeah. Some of Arlene's friends. We'll start with the boy she's been going with lately. This Lenny Hayes. He lives over the drugstore. Oh, but let's see. It's, it's after five now, Jace. He's probably on his way to work. Oh, where's that? Auction barn. He's sort of a general handyman there. Tagging cattle, herding them around the place. All right, let's look him up. The gray of dawn was creeping over the horizon as we reached the auction barn. The sheriff and I mounted the stairs to the platform overlooking the pens below. See Lenny Hayes anywhere, Sheriff? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there he is down there, coming along the runway. Lenny? Oh, Lenny? Yeah? Want to talk to you. Come on, Jake. Morning, Sheriff. Morning, Lenny. I figured you'd be coming around. Oh, you heard what's happened. Yeah. This is Ranger Jace Pearson, Lenny. He wants to ask you some questions. Sure. When did you see Arlene Rankin last, Lenny? Yesterday afternoon at the Sutton funeral. Everybody in town was there, I guess. You talked to her? For a few minutes. I asked her to go to the basketball game at the school gym, but she couldn't. She'd already promised to sit for the Purvis folks. I see. What happened between Arlene and Dave Fenton, do you know? They just busted up, that's all. How'd he take it? Well, he could be pretty nasty when things didn't go the way he wanted. He called her up a lot after that, wanted to patch things up, but Arlene wouldn't have any of it. He got good and sore a couple of times. Do you think Arlene was frightened by him? Well, sure, the guy was crazy jealous and never knew what he might do. I see. Uh, do you have any idea where Arlene could be right now? Nope. Uh, no idea at all. All right, thanks. Uh, could I ask you something, Ranger? Yeah? Look, uh... If Arlene did kill Fenn, it, it could have been self-defense, couldn't it? Maybe. Suppose he'd come out there looking for trouble. Couldn't she have picked up the gun to scare him away, not meaning to pull the trigger? And the gun went off accidentally. Is that what you're driving at, Lenny? Sure, why not? Well, in that case, she shouldn't have run away. Well, yeah, that was a crazy thing to do, I guess. But look, uh, if she was to give herself up now, and if she could prove it was self-defense, an accident... Go on. Well, I mean, uh, things would go easier on her, wouldn't they? Has Arlene been in touch with you, Lenny? Has she? Listen, Ranger, I, I, I don't want to get in any trouble, but... You won't if you tell the truth. Well, this thing is getting me down. I, I want to get it off my mind. If I told you where she is, would you give her a break? I'm not a judge. Where is she? She phoned me last night from Covington, from the bus depot. Covington, huh? Yeah, she said she was in trouble. Wouldn't tell me what it was. She said she needed money, and, well, I didn't have any. Not even enough to buy gas to drive over there. What'd you tell her? 
I told her I'd see if I could raise some, but, well, she hung up on me. What time did she make this phone call? Around midnight, a few minutes before. I remember because I was listening to the radio and the station signed off while I was talking to her. There's a bus comes through here around 10.30 and it pulls into Covington a little before midnight, Jace. That's the one she probably took. Come on, Sheriff. Let's head for Covington. <laughs> We spent the major part of the day combing the town of Covington, but there wasn't a single trace of Arlene Rankin. Late that afternoon, the sheriff and I wound up at the bus depot. Got to talking to the woman behind the lunch counter. Well, let me see now. Girl about so high and blonde hair. Coming on the late bus, you say? Uh-huh. Mm, let me see. Youngster, was she? Seventeen. Say, that wouldn't be the Rankin girl, Ranger. That's right. Heard about her on the radio this morning... Say, you mean she's here in Covington? We believe she was here last night. Land sakes, imagine that. Well, have you seen a girl answering her description, ma'am? Well, no, what? Hey, wait a minute. Say, there was a girl, just like your description. You sure, ma'am? Mm-hmm, last night, by closing time. I was throwing out the coffee when she come up and asked me for a glass of water. Good about so I real attractive. She act nervous or upset? She sure did. Oh, and say, she asked me where the Lowry place was at. That Ned Lowry owns a hardware store. Ned Lowry. Mm, that's right. Him and his wife live down the street, three blocks. Big White House on the corner. Want me to show you? No, thanks. We'll find it, ma'am. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be anybody at home, Jay. I'm pretty sure there is, Sheriff. I heard someone moving inside. Hey, you're right, Jay. There is somebody in there. I just saw the window curtains move. Reckon I ought to slip around back. Hold it. Yeah? Oh, Ranger. What is it? Afternoon, miss. We begin to think there wasn't anyone at home. Well, sorry if I kept you. I was taking a nap. I wasn't sure if I heard someone at the door or not. We're looking for a girl named Arlene Rankin. Arlene Rankin? Mm. Well, there's no one here by that name. Is that so? Uh, this is a Lowry resident. We know that, miss. Oh, well, there are only three of us living here. My sister, her husband, and myself. You don't know Arlene Rankin? No. Should I? Here's her picture, miss. Ever see her before? See. No. No, I never saw her before. Your sister and her husband at home? No, I'm alone. Mind if we come in? Well, no, but... We just want to look around. Sounds like it's in this room, Jace. There's no one in there. It's just... We'll have a look anyway, miss. Huh. Wind is shutter, Jace. Wind's banging it against the house. It's broken. Kept me awake half the night. Look, if you tell me what this is all about... That suitcase over there on the chair, miss. Who does it belong to? That's mine. Yours, then. Eh? Baggage tag gear says Continental Trailways, Jace. That's all I got here by bus. What's that, miss? I arrived last night, just here visiting my sister. What time did your bus get in last night? Oh, it was around midnight. You talked to anyone at the depot? No, I don't think I did. Are you sure? Oh, wait, I did ask the woman at the lunch counter how to get here. I see. That lady back at the lunch counter sure has an imagination, Jace. Tell me, miss, did any other girl get off the bus when you did last night? No other girl. You positive? Yes, I think so. What do you make of that, Jace? Take a look at this photograph again, miss. You recall seeing this girl among the passengers? Well? No, I don't remember seeing her. Of course, the bus was crowded, and I really didn't pay much attention to the others on board. I see. Look, would you mind telling me what this is all about? No cause for you to worry, miss. Sorry we bothered you. Come on, Sheriff. <laughs> There was no reason to doubt the word of the girl at the Lowry house. Arlene Rankin hadn't gotten off the bus at Covington the night before. The sheriff and I drove back to his office in Newby, and we had another talk with Lenny Hayes. But it's the truth, I tell you. Arlene did call me. She's not in Covington, Lenny. We're pretty sure of that. Well, maybe she went on. Don't see how she could have done that. All roads been blocked. You've been lying, haven't you, Lenny? No, no. You could have made up that story about the phone call from Covington just to throw us off the trail. No, I didn't. you got to believe me. We're willing to lay out you never received a phone call, Lenny, that Arlene wasn't even on that bus last night. She must have been. I'll get it, Jake. Sheriff's office. Yep, just a minute. Company B in Dallas calling you, Jake. Thanks, Sheriff. Hello. 
Yeah? You know, Lenny, you can save us a lot of trouble with that. What do you mean? Stop trying to cover up yeah. for Arlene. I'm not... You're yeah, trying thanks. to protect her by sending us on a wild goose well, chase. That's not true. Now, listen, Lenny, there's no sense Hold in... Hold it, Sheriff. Hmm? It's like maybe we owe Lenny here an apology. Oh? That bus we figured Arlene wasn't on was being vacuumed in Dallas this afternoon, and a purse was found behind one of the seat cushions. A purse? What about it? Belonged to Arlene Rankin. <laughs> You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Now, we continue with tonight's case, Fugitive's Trail, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. Finding Arlene Rankin's purse on that bus indicated we'd been wrong about Lenny Hayes. Yet the girl we'd talked to in Covington had been positive that Arlene hadn't gotten off the bus there the night before. I put in a call to the Continental Trailways Company and found out that the driver of the bus was due back in Newby in an hour. We were waiting at the bus station when he came in. Nope, I don't think I can help you, Ranger. You know what the Rankin girl looks like? Yeah, so picture of in a Dallas paper this afternoon. And you don't remember seeing her get off the bus anywhere along the line? Nope. Do you remember seeing her get on the bus here in Newby? <laughs> Look... I picked up quite a load here last night. A lot of high school kids, Ranger. Maybe this ranking guy was one of them. Maybe she wasn't. Didn't pay much attention. I just wanted to get rolling. You're in a hurry, were you? I was running behind schedule. See, ordinarily there's a five-minute wait here. One cup of coffee. Well, I had two. Oh? Basketball game. The high school gym went over time, and, well, I didn't want to shove off. I knew most of the kids were counting on getting a bus. Wait a minute. You were late taking off? Oh, sure. Almost ten minutes. What time did you arrive at Covington? Well, with all those stops along the way, I, I lost another five minutes. Didn't pull into Covington until 12.15. 12.15? Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, Sheriff, yeah. All right, driver, thanks. Sure enough. Sorry I wasn't much help, Ranger. See you, Sheriff. Yeah. Kind of interesting, isn't it, Jace? If the bus didn't get to Covington until 12.15... How could Arlene have called Lenny from the bus depot there a few minutes before 12? Doesn't seem to add up, does it, Sheriff? Of course, Lenny might have got the time mixed up. I don't think so. He seemed pretty sure of it, you'd call. Yeah, that's right. He must have lied. We'll know about that for sure once we talk to the telephone company over at Covington. the sheriff's office, I called the Covington phone company and asked them to check a call from the Covington bus station to Lenny's number in Newby. There was no record of any such call. The sheriff sent one of his deputies out to bring Lenny in and we waited. Well, and it's just like we figured, Jace. The girl wasn't on the bus at all. Only how do you account for the purse? It was found on the bus. A plan, Sheriff. Lenny could have slipped aboard the bus last night, put it in there while the driver was in the cafe having coffee. Yeah. Yeah, he could have done that. Be mighty careless of a girl to forget her purse when she's trying to make a getaway, don't you think? A little too careless. I won't say that thought hasn't crossed my mind, Jace. And you know, Sheriff, something else bothers me. It seems like Lenny went to an awful lot of trouble trying to cover up for the girl. Well, any kid who's as crazy about a girl as he is by I know, him. but if he was really trying to shield her, he'd have done a lot better by keeping his mouth shut. He's been real cooperative. He's been working at it a little too hard. What are you driving at, Jason? Just a hunch, Sheriff. But if I can force Lenny into making a move, it might be in the wrong direction for him, but in the right direction for us. I... Yeah, hold it, Jason. Hello? Well, come on in, Lenny. Thanks, Charlie. Any news of Arlene? Not a sign of her yet. Well, Dallas is a pretty big place. The fact that her purse was found on the bus in Dallas doesn't necessarily mean she's there. She could have gotten off the bus anywhere along the line. Yeah, I guess so. Lenny, about this phone call you said you got. Still don't believe me, huh? Maybe you were mistaken. Maybe Arlene just told you she was calling from Covington. No, no, I heard the operator. She said it was Covington. I see. Well, we'll check with the phone company anyway just to make sure. Check but with the phone company? But Arlene called me from a pay phone. How can you check? Well, it doesn't make any difference. The phone company keeps a record of all long-distance calls. Didn't you know that? No, no, I didn't. Well, anyway, that isn't why I asked you to drop in, Lenny. We think you can help us. 
Mm-hmm. So what? We'd like you to talk to some of Arlene's friends. Maybe you can find out more than we have. Me? If you want to help us, don't you? You'd be helping Arlene. Well, sure, sure I want to help. Well, then get to her friends. Tell them if they know something, they better talk up. You can get in a lot of trouble by withholding information. Yeah, I guess I can. Okay, that's all, Lenny. Let us know if you hear anything. Yeah. Yeah, I'll let you know, Ranger. <laughs> The sheriff and I waited a few moments after Lenny had left the office, and then we eased out into the street. We saw him get into his car halfway down the block and take off. In the darkness, we watched the taillight disappear toward the edge of town. We followed him. What's he up to, Jace? I don't know. That's the second time he's driven around the cemetery. Arlene wouldn't be hiding in there, would she? Look, he's turning onto the other highway now, heading south. Good. Maybe we can get a little closer, Jace. Lots more traffic on that road. He's speeding up. Suits me fine. At least we'll get to wherever we're going that much sooner. A quarter of an hour later, Lenny Hayes turned off the main highway into a narrow dirt road. I switched off my headlights and followed. We spent another 15 minutes trailing him as he cruised up and down the back roads like he was searching for something. And we wound up on the highway once more. When we reached the outskirts of Newby, he turned again. Drove right into the cemetery and stopped. Any sign of him, Jace? There's his car parked up ahead. Easy, easy now. Better stay here in the shadows. He might spot us in this moonlight. I'd sure like to know what the Samuel that kid's up to. Hold it. Yeah. There he is. Where, Jace? Over there, near the fence. What's he doing? It's digging. Say, wait a minute. Look at the flowers over there, Jace. Pushed over to one side. That's Harry Sutton's grave. What's he doing digging around there? Freshly turned ground, Sheriff. He's trying to hide something. He can do it quickly. Let's move up a little closer. Yeah. Here. This way around the hedge. Yeah. Move up behind his car. Stay down, Sheriff. What's he doing? Stop digging. He's coming this way, to the car. Now what? Just open the trunk compartment. Let me take a look. Yeah. Now he's pulling something out of the trunk. It looks like... Even at this distance, there's no mistake in what he's dragging out of there. A body. I guess we can get him now, Sheriff. All right, Lenny. Stop where you are. Don't move. Huh? He's making a break for it, Jace. Let's go. This way, Jace. He's heading around back of the chapel. Hold it. Hold it, Sheriff. Where the blazes did he go? I don't know. Listen. Listen, do you hear anything? Nope. Hey, wait a minute. I thought I saw something move over there behind that tombstone. Let's take a look. Wait. You circle around that way. He is there. Let's see if we can maneuver him in position so he'll make a break for his car. I'll be waiting for him. All right. Careful, though. He may have a gun. All right. There he goes, Ted! Hold it, Lenny. I go, hold it. Go! Simmer down now, boy. This is as far as you go. Let go of me. I said simmer down. Uh, uh, okay, Ranger. Hey, you all right, Jace? Yeah. Uh, Come on, let's go on back to the car and have a look at that body. Uh, yeah. It's Arlene Rankin, all right, Jace. How about it, Lenny? You feel like talking? Uh, sure. Why not? Arlene... She was just playing me for a sucker. She was really crazy about Fenton all the time, just using me to make him jealous. When did you find that out? <laughs> Last night when I, I sneaked over to the Purvis place, I saw them together. I went out of my head, I guess. So you went inside, got the gun, and shot Fenton. Well, I didn't mean to do it. I just wanted to scare him. I didn't mean to. I suppose you didn't mean to kill Arlene, either. No, but I had to. I had to kill Kill her to keep her from talking. You had the body in the trunk compartment here all this time? 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. I waited too long last night trying to make up my mind what to do with it. Sheriff's men were all over the place looking for it. You thought you'd get away with making it look like Arlene had killed Fenton and run off. Hmm? I almost did get away with it. Yeah, almost. Penitentiary's full of people who almost got away with it, too. Come on, let's go. For the brutal murders of Dave Fenton and Arlene Rankin, Lenny Hayes was sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for the rest of his life. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. One day last year, we received a card from a little girl who wanted to be a Texas Ranger. She said she didn't have a horse, but she did have a mule and could ride. We learned last week that this same little girl was stricken with a serious illness and has been in bed all summer. When she heard our first show a few weeks ago, she asked her father to help her write a poem and send it to us. We'd like to read it. R is for ranger, stalwart and strong. A for his aim that never goes wrong. N for his nerve, calm, steady, and sharp. G for his gun, never misses the mark. E is for effort, endurance, and fight. And R for respect for the things that are right. Fanalu, that's a fine poem, and it's deeply appreciated. Honey, you're going to get well, because in spirit... You're a Texas Ranger. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Cattle Drive. The cast included Tony Barrett, Lillian Bio. Whitfield Connor, Parley Bear, Sam Edwards, and Marion Richmond. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Adrian Gendo, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Hal Gibney speaking. <laughs> Read about your favorite NBC entertainers. Yes, in the November NBC Silver Jubilee issue of Radio TV Mirror Magazine, you can enjoy reading about such NBC stars as Fibber McGee and Molly, Bob Hope, and Groucho Marx. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. From Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, The White Elephant. It is January 16th, 1950. The time, 6.28 p.m., A freight train just outside of a West Texas town gains speed and rolls through the gathering dusk. Inside a gondola car, a hobo crouches in a corner as the brakeman comes toward him. All right, 
right, Paul. This is where you get off. Now, listen, pal. Just let me get to the next town. I just, just... I said this is where you get off. <laughs> but we're moving. Yeah, I... you get on when we was moving. You can get off. Now, come on around just the top of your head. Now, listen. Don't, don't, don't do it. I just... Get don't... out of your Please. face. Like this. Here, no, let me go. No, you want to get off. No, huh? you. Get out of me. Oh. <laughs> Uh, uh, don't leave me alone, Ralph. Uh, slug me, will you? Oh, you ain't getting me. I'm coming. I'm coming. At 2.55 a.m. of the morning following the freight train incident, a rancher named Banker noticed a small coupe parked on the shoulder of the road. It bore Oklahoma license plates. Banker turned his spotlight on the car, saw a man slump down on the driver's seat. A half hour later, Sheriff Caldwell, notified by Banker, began investigation of the murder and called in the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. And a few hours later, Pearson, Banker, and Sheriff Caldwell stood at the scene. Pearson listened to Banker. It was just about three this morning when I saw it, Ranger. How come you were driving along this road that late? I've been to a rancher's meeting in Almira's. I was going to spend the night there and change my mind. Mm-hmm. Did you take this road when you left for Almeras? Yes, sir. What time? Uh, yesterday morning, about uh, 7, 7.30. And then this car came here sometime between 7.30 yesterday morning and 3 this morning. I guess so. You never saw the dead man before, huh? It was the first time I laid eyes on him. All right, Mr. Banker. You can go. Hey, you need me, I'll be home. <laughs> No identification on the body at all, huh, Sheriff? Nothing in the pockets. Pick clean as a whistle. Anybody else been around the car? Nope. Deputy kept his eyes on it. Car's facing west. Going west when it was stopped. Tire tracks on the shoulder tell that. Mm Mm-hmm. Blood on the seat. Yep. 38 bullet on it. 38? Might be a police special. Banker got one? Banker, but... Yeah, just asking. For now. You see, I... You see something? Look here, Sheriff. Huh? Set of tracks leading up to the car. Ordinary shoes, not boots. Heel marks are too broad for boots. Yeah, looks like it. Look at this one. Sole print with a hole in it. Now look. The prints lead from that way, north, up to the car. A little scuffle. And the prints turn back north. Mm -hmm. In other words, Sheriff, somebody walked up to the car, stood there, then turned and went back north. Oh, and here's something else. Grease. Looks like grease. Smeared on the car door. Same side footprints are on. Grease might be from the car. No, it looks too stiff and heavy for that. Yeah. What about it coming from a freight train, Jace? Why? Well, there's tracks about a mile north of here. Freight's used a side and a pull-on when passengers got to pass. Hmm. Maybe it all ties in, Sheriff. A shoe with a hole in it, grease, freight siding. Yeah, it might be worth going after. Where do we start? Here at the car first. I'm going to check it over inch by inch. Meantime, you get hold of a freight schedule. I'll meet you at your office. When I checked the car inside and out, I found a few things that were interesting and a little puzzling. I sent a sample of grease to the laboratory for analysis and took plastic casts of the footprints. Then went on to Sheriff Caldwell's office. He had the information I'd requested. Here it is, Jace. Schedule of freights went through yesterday. How many? Three of them. You can check those, all right. Of course, we might be sending the dogs up the wrong tree. Looks like a hobo to me. Yeah. Let me see the dead man's fingerprints. Sure, here you are. Oh, these match with some of the prints in the car, see? Closed Delta. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how about those others you got? Pick these up on the door that had the grease on it. Smeared all over. A couple clear enough to use, only... Uh, only what, Jace? You know, there wasn't a single print on the steering wheel. Seems like the dead man's prints ought to be on it. Gloves? I didn't find any gloves on him, nor in the car. Yeah. Yeah, By the way, I got a call out if any hobo picked up or seen on those trains. Good. Now, I found these tucked under the sun visor in front of the driver's seat. Gasoline receipts made out to Carl Thompson. Oh, that'll save a lot of checking. Move forward the dead man's prints anyway. That steering wheel bothers me. Excuse me, Jason. Sheriff Caldwell. Oh, yeah. Good. Hold him. We'll be there as soon as we can make it. Something else, Jace. Brakeman in one of those freights we've been checking has a story. Some hobo slugged him and jumped. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> Brakeman took 
office to the approximate spot the hobo jumped off the freight. Sheriff Caldwell and I picked up the trail and followed it by horse. We hoped to apprehend the suspect before he could reach a town and lose himself and us. After six hours, we stopped. What's the matter, Jace? Tracks are different. Come here and take a look. Different? Yeah, look. The right print's a little deeper, favoring his left a little. Hurt himself, huh? Must have twisted his leg when he took the jump off the freight. Kept getting worse. Sat down here, smoked a cigarette. Here's the butt. He ain't going to make such a good time with a bum leg. We've been traveling at a steady trot. Uh huh. Okay. Let's get going. <laughs> Suspect's trail showed increased favoring of his left leg. His progress became slower. More and more often he stopped to rest and the trail became fresher and fresher. Evidence in a deserted shack showed suspect had rested there for quite a while. We picked up the trail again. We're getting close, Sheriff. How do you know? Notice something just now. Take a look at these prints. Hmm? Same as the ones we've been following. Not quite. Hole in the right shoe. Not that. I'm talking about this anthill he crushed. Well, what about it? Quite a few of the prints had anthills in them, crushed and rebuilt. So? Ants start working on a new hill when the old one's been tramped down. This one's so fresh, they haven't had time to rebuild. Hey, that's right. He can't be far off. So we better leave the horses tied up here, Sheriff, and start moving on foot. trouble and he denied anything and everything about the crime. We took him back and I kept questioning him, but he stuck to his story. I never was there. I didn't do it. Ever own a gun? 38 police special? I told you a hundred times. I never owned no kind of gun. How'd you take all that skin off your arm? I don't know. Fell, maybe. You got that while you were running away. When you jumped off the freight, after you slugged the brakeman. No, no. Grease on your jacket. How'd it get there? Yeah, maybe. Maybe off in the freight. Sure. That car we showed you, the one you said you'd never seen before. That's the truth. Is it? Hold up your right foot. What? Hold it up. <clears throat> Hold in the right shoe. <clears throat> what else? Here's a plaster cast. Cast at the print of the scene of the murder. Take a good look. Yeah, but I wasn't there, I tell you. Ever hear of fingerprints? Oh, sure. Here are yours. And here's a set found at the crime. They match. You still say you weren't there? I didn't kill nobody. Let me see your hand. <clears throat> When did you wash them last? I don't know. Maybe a couple of days ago. You know, we can tell if you fired a gun. I never had no gun. Did you rob the man in the car? No, no. Look at me. You were there, weren't you? We can prove it. Well, all right. All right, I was there. But I didn't kill him. Why'd you lie? Well, I was scared. If you're innocent, you don't have to be scared. Look, Ranger, I, I got a couple of wraps, bag wraps. That all? Hey, sure, sure. We can check that, too. All right. Oh, later. Got a couple of wraps for... Pinching stuff. Nothing big. Now, look. Tell me exactly what you did. Well, I uh, come in off afraid. I was walking across when I seen the car. I figured it was funny. Something funny. Why? Well, a car parked like that. Then I walked over, seen the fella in there. He was dead. I beat it. Hopped the freight. That all? Uh, you know what else? Up to now. Did you get in the car? Uh, no, sir. No, sir. Did you touch the body or take anything from uh, it? I swear, Range, I didn't. Did you touch the steering wheel and then wipe it off? Well, why did no, no. What's for? Look, I tell you, I... Jace? Yeah, Sheriff. Come here, will you? Sure. You stay put. I got no place to go. Here's all the dope on the murdered man, Thompson. Come in just now. Carl Thompson. Resident Tulsa, Oklahoma. Traveling salesman for Prince Extract Company. This check? Double. Tallies with the gasoline receipts. Mm -hmm. What about him? The hobo? Yeah. I think the only crime he committed was failure to report what he saw. His fingerprints were all over the outside of the one door of that car, and none inside. Seems to me if he thought of cleaning up the inside, he'd have done the same outside. Yeah, looks like it. We'll give him the paraffin test anyway and see if he's fired a gun lately. And if he didn't? Start all over. And start with that clean steering wheel. In 
just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. This evening, be sure to hear Douglas Fairbanks in The Silent Men, based on the authentic adventures of your government security agents. Monday, Herbert Marshall assumes the mysterious identity of the man called X. Tuesday night here at Big Town with another hard-hitting adventure by Steve Wilson of the Illustrated Press. Yes, there's always pulse-quickening action on Big Town. Tonight, hear the silent men. Monday, it's the man we called X. We continue ex- now with Tales of the Texas Rangers. And tonight's case, The White Elephant. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> The result of the paraffin test was negative, but we held the hobo pending further investigation. I reported back to my captain, Stinson, at company headquarters. I told him I was pretty sure that the hobo story checked out. Yeah, it looks like it. But somebody killed Thompson. Killed him and then drove him in his own car to where that rancher spotted it. There wasn't anything on Thompson, huh? No money, no papers, only these. Gasoline charge account receipts. Somebody went to an awful lot of trouble to clean him, but they overlooked these. Mm Mm-hmm. On top, this looks like a plain case of murder with robbery as the motive, but if that was it, why go to all the risk of being spotted in a car with Oklahoma plates? Why not just kill him and leave him? I don't know, Jace. What you're thinking? Well, Thompson was a traveling salesman, traveled a lot in a few days. Now, suppose the killer realized that with Thompson far enough away from the scene of the crime, we'd have a pretty tough time finding out just where the murder was committed. Yeah, that could be. But why? Well... Maybe the killer couldn't leave the spot. So he did the next best thing. Took Thompson's body away. And maybe it wasn't just robbery. Or what else? I don't know yet, but... I got some more checking to do. It'll take maybe a couple of hours, and then I might have some answers. Well, a couple hours on the nose, Jace. You get anything new? More dope on Thompson, Captain. He never carried much money. Never was known to have picked up a hitchhiker. And I got a pretty good idea of where he was killed. These gasoline receipts tell a fair story. Yeah? How? Well, this one, for example, dated the 15th day before he was killed. Made out in Bannon. He got 16 gallons of gas there. Oh, did you ever think somebody else might have been using his credit card? Yeah, but Thompson traveled that route pretty often. Chances are he was well-known at the service stations. Yeah, that's right. Okay, go on. I ran a mileage test on his car. He got about 17 miles a gallon. Now, his tank holds 16. I did a little figuring. Just about enough gas was used to get him from Bannon to where his body was found. But he could have been killed anywhere between Bannon and where he was found dead. Sure, I know that. But it still looks like my next stop is Bannon. Howdy. Uh, how many? Whatever she'll take. Ah, uh, sure thing. You the owner here? Ah, uh, yes, sir. How long? Oh, a couple of years. You work alone? Well, nights, yeah. Take a look at this, will you? No, one of my receipts. Credit card stuff. You know this Carl Thompson? Yeah, I see him ever, oh, four or five months. When did you see Thompson last? Well, the evening he bought that gas. Why, anything wrong, Ranger? Was Thompson alone that evening? I, uh, yeah. I never remember him ever having anybody along. What else do you remember about that evening? Oh, one of the worst sleet storms we ever had. Hit like oh, a... it'd be tough for him to drive then, huh? Oh, sure. Hey, um, he was asking about some place to stay. You never stayed in Bannon before? I don't know. Leastways, he didn't know much about the places. I told him to try the hotel. He said it was full up. He said the motels were jam-packed. The lousy weather. You know where he went? Well, said he was going to try and find a place along the highway. Why, anything wrong? Plenty. Here's for the gas. I might come back and ask you some more questions. Thanks. I began a check of every possible place Thompson might have stayed that night, but I drew one blank after another. Then I got a lead at a motel on the outskirts of Bannon. 
Sure, Ranger. I remember that night. Sleep was an inch thick. We was full up here, but I sent him to a place down the highway, the Star Motel. Been closed and up for sale for quite a spell, but I heard it was opened up again. <laughs> went to the Star Motel. It was closed tight. Every cabin was locked, the windows boarded. There wasn't a soul around. I was just about to leave when I noticed something. The electricity must have been on somewhere in the place because the little wheel under the dial of the meter was spinning. That was enough to send me back into town to ask a few more questions. Now, uh, let me see you, Ranger. Star Motels. Uh, yes, sir. Here's what we want right here. Uh-huh. Are these all the electricity bills? Yes, sir. Let me see. Up to three months ago, the bills were just for meter installation, minimum service charge. That's right, Ranger. But for the last three months, four seventy-five, three eighty-nine, five sixty. Hmm. Kind of funny, isn't it? The place is closed, but for the last three months, the bills have averaged over four dollars a month. Didn't that seem peculiar to you? Well, Ranger, we, we just sure. Sure, I know. Now, can you give me the name of the person to whom these bills were sent? Get it for you right away. Why, yes, Ranger, Mr. Carlson's here. I believe he's on the phone right now, but if you come in... Thank you, ma'am. You Mrs. Carlson? Yes. I hope I'm not bothering you any, Miss Calvin. Not at all, Ranger. My husband's here. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I see. Well, I think that could be arranged. Yeah, sure. Tell you what, I'll come out a little later. I'll bring the client with me. Sure. Thanks for calling. Goodbye. Andy, this is Ranger Pearson. Oh, hello. Sorry to barge in like this, Mr. Calvin, but I got a few questions. Questions? Sure, what about it? You own the Star Motel, don't you? Yes, I do. Star Motel? Oh, that white elephant. White elephant? <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to get rid of it for two years. Why? Well, like Betsy said, it ain't been worth a hoot since the new highway went in two years ago. We have the traffic that used to pass it. It hasn't been used for two years? Well, I guess I didn't mean exactly that. What did you mean? I tried to keep it going for a year after the highway went through, but... Couldn't rent enough rooms. Wasn't worth trying to save. You got the keys to it? Keys? Oh, sure. Is something wrong, Ranger? Might be, ma'am. Can you take me through the motel, Mr. Calvin? Anytime. Right now, suit you? Couldn't be better. Let's go. been out here for close on three or four weeks. Did you go through the cabins then? Oh, just take a look. See, kids sometimes fool around. That's why I boarded up the windows. Want to take a look in the office? Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Calvin. Sure. Nothing in here, Ranger? Nope, there's not. Anything in particular you're looking for? Yeah. You have this floor washed lately? Oh, heck no. Ain't no use paying for something like that. It's been washed recently. Huh? But why? How do you know? Scrubbing wood with hot water always raises the grain. And hot water isn't as good as cold to wash out blood stains. Blood? Blood? Breach! All right, well, what's the matter with you? Where's the guns, Ranger? Hold it. Sit down. Go on. Ah! Ah! Come on! What the devil is this? Who are you fellas? My guess is a couple of men I want for murder, Mr. Calson. Murder? Just a telephone wire. Everything okay? Yeah, push that guy. Me? Why, I never carry a gun. Well, we'll just make sure. Yeah, he's clean. All right, now strip the ranger's gun belt. Wait a minute. You got the drop on me. Maybe I'd have to be a fool to draw. But if you don't want me to be a fool, don't touch these guns. You try and take them off me and I'll go down using them. And I might get lucky. All right, Locke. Let him alone. He's too smart to start anything. Go get the panel truck out and start loading our stuff fast. Well, what about them? We can lock them in. Fix their car so they can't get out of here for a while after we leave. If they try to come out while we're still here, we'll blast whatever door or window they try to come through. Get that, Ranger? 
I get it. Okay. I'll be outside, Chuck. So your name's Chuck, huh? Good as any. What are you and that other fellow doing in my place? Go ahead, Chuck. Tell him. Some other time, friend. Now you two listen. Because I ain't going to say this twice. Try to bust out before you hear us drive off and you'll get it good. I'll stay put. Oof. They got us locked in. Yeah. Oh, don't go near that window. You heard what he said. A little crack in the boarding. I'm just taking a look. What are they doing? Come here and take a look for yourself. Oh, I should have watched the place more. I never knew anyone was using it. They used plenty. Look what they're taking out. Furs. All kinds of stuff. It's beginning to make sense. Closed down motel made a nice storage bin for stolen and smuggled goods till they could run it to the market. Oh, they'll get away. You you said there was a murder. Take it easy, Mr. Calton. We'll get them. Oh, they'll be across the border in a half an hour before we could even reach the phone. Maybe you better take a chance and get shot down in cold blood. No, but we'll get them all right. Know why, Mr. Calson? Why? <laughs> because you help. I pinned Calson with a quick headlock and then got one arm up behind him and applied pressure so I could keep him still while I had a free hand. I reached into his jacket and found what I was looking for under his shoulder. Then I pushed him. Are you crazy? He almost broke my arm. Shut up, Calton. Don't you think I saw this gun bulging under your coat? And they deliberately missed it when they frisked you? You played it real smart, almost. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. This gun and the electric bills. You paid them. Paid bills that were being run up in a place that was supposed to be shut down. Seemed kind of funny you never complained to the power company. So what? what you so you got a phone call from your friends out there. They tipped you because they saw me nosing around here earlier, right? No. Okay. Okay, take a look out there. They're almost finished. In a couple of minutes, they'll be gone. In half an hour, they'll be over the border. How about you? You want to stick back here and face a murder charge? There's nothing you can prove. There's plenty we can prove, Calton. And you're holding the bag. You'll have a tough time explaining those electric bills and them missing your gun. I didn't kill that man. Did this Chuck do it? Yeah, yeah, that salesman come in. It's always going on. Chuck killed him, then drove him away. All right. Now listen real careful to me. I'm going to fire this gun of yours. Then you hammer on the door and holler for him. Get it? What do you want to Just do Just listen. When they come up, tell them you had to kill me. Tell them to open the door. Then Mr. Kelson, step back and out of the way fast. They'll be gone in a minute. Make up your mind. All right. Go ahead. I'll do it. Any funny tricks and you get it first. Now. Ready? Open that door and holler. Chuck! Run! Give me a pass! Open the door! Now, when it's open, get back. What's the matter? Carlson, open the door. I had to kill him. He was making a break for it. Get your chuck and him out. Reach. Off him. Hey, what's the big idea? Why, you... Oh. 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 We'll come back for him later, Carlson. Meantime, let you and me get back to town. I got you a deal for this white elephant motel. You can trade it for a jail cell. Andrew Kelson was convicted for his part in the murder. His sentence, life imprisonment. Now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Almost a year ago, a faithful listener wrote to us and said she'd heard of an official Texas Ranger prayer and inquired if such a prayer actually existed. We assured her it did. And in response to her letter, we read the Texas Ranger's prayer over the air. Folks, I wish you could have seen the hundreds of letters we received after that broadcast. Since that first reading of the Texas Ranger prayer... There's hardly a week goes by that we haven't had a request to repeat it. And we're mighty pleased to read it for you again tonight because we know now how many of you, like the men it was written for, realize the importance of a power outside ourselves to whom we may turn. The Texas Ranger Prayer by Captain Pierre Bernard Hill, chaplain of the Texas Rangers. God, whose end is justice, whose strength is all our stay, 
Be near and bless my mission as I go forth today. Let wisdom guide my actions. Let courage fill my heart. And help me, Lord, in every hour to do a ranger's part. Protect when danger threatens. Sustain when trails are rough. Help me to keep my standard high and smile at each rebuff. When night comes down upon me, I pray thee, Lord, be nigh. Whether on lonely scout or camped under the Texas sky, keep me, O God, in life. And when my days shall end, forgive my sins and take me in. For Jesus' sake, amen. Good night, folks. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Cattle Drive. The cast included Tony Barrett, Paul McVeigh, Lou Krugman, Jeff Corey, Byron Kane, Robert Bruce, and Janet Rowan. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Russell Hughes, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gipney speaking.